This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Number of programs this week. The Corn is Green by Emlyn Williams, with Gladys Young as Miss Moffat and Richard Burton as Morgan Evans. The play adapted for broadcasting by T. Roland Hughes and produced by P. H. Burton. The Corn is Green. The action of the play takes place in Glansarno, a small village in a remote Welsh countryside in the latter part of the last century. Mr. Jones has given me an agonizing headache. And if you must indulge in music, will you please not do it in Welsh? I wasn't indulging in music. I was singing a hymn. There, that's the last book to go on that shelf. And if a hymn gives you a headache, there is nothing wrong with a hymn. There is something wrong with your head, Miss Ronbury. I still don't see the necessity for it. I sing to cheer myself up. What do the words mean? The wicked shall burn in hell. Mr. Jones, translation. Mr. Jones, He says he cut the sweet peas and the rubbish heap is smelling terrible. <laughs> Dear, his father must put something on it. That's the English all over. The devil is there, is he? Don't take him away. Put a bit of scent on him. Go in the daddy, I hope better not have you. Dear, sir. I hope he'll have the sense to give the message. It is terrible, isn't it? The people on these green fields and flowery hillsides being turned out of heaven because they cannot answer St. Peter when he asks them who they are in English. It is wicked, isn't it? The Welsh children not being born knowing English, isn't it? Good heavens, God bless my soul, by Jove, this, that, and the other. I can't think why a colonel should elect to come and live in this place. Ah, there. I hope he likes flowers. Oh, I've never seen so many books. Hmm. I do hope the castles will not be too feminine. I chose them with such care. Why are you taking so much trouble getting somebody else's house ready for them, Miss Ronbury? Oh, you need not have helped me if you did not wish. Oh, I'm frightened of the spinning wheel, too, and the china. His own furniture so distinctive. The desk. And the waste paper basket says so virile. Now you'll have two on a string. Him and the squire. <laughs> Mr. Jones. And if I was a bit more of a masher, there would be three. Worldly things, that is your trouble. Please, Mr. Jones, my life is as empty as a rotten nutshell, so get me a husband before it's too late, double quick. Oh, you insulting man. Ah, here's the squire now. Why? Delicious lady, delicious surprise. And the very afternoon tea is our four bed putty day. <laughs> oh. How are you, Jones, making the most of your half day? Good afternoon, sir. Why, dear lady, were you not at the Trevor's Ellis wedding? Naughty. I sat next to you at the breakfast. <coughs> oh, my dingo, so you did. <coughs> uh, do you see fine breakfast? Uh, no sign of a new inhabitant? Any moment now, I think. The pony in the trap met the London train at a quarter to twelve. Hasn't the fellow got his own private conveyance? Oh, I think not. Uh, I hope he's all right. He wrote very civilly to Mr. Jones about the house. Oh, yes. Not club notepaper, I remember, but not bad texture. Funny sort of chap, though, eh? Why? All these books. Who was? Oh, that must be something. Please, sir. You must mean the colonel. How gratifying. Capital. But 
Who on earth is this woman and this girl? You speak English. I do. Be a dear and hold the temper and I'll go and get the rest. Crikey, a colonel with an Abigail. Well, why don't you say something, girl? I never speak till I'm spoken to. <coughs> oh. Uh, well, um, uh, who was that? My mummy. I never had no daddy. My God, these parcels are heavy. What are they? Books. They are all at the now. Here you are. Is your employer with you, my good woman? No, followed behind most of the way. What a dear be now. I'll let us see. Here we are. Tell you. Thought we lost you. I was hoping to pass you, but that last hill was too much for me. There's a smallish crowd already. I don't think they've seen a woman on a bicycle before, so I thought I'd better bring Priscilla inside. Those children out there would wear a bell out. Watty, can you find someone for her? Oh, I don't know, I'm sure. Oh, that must be in the kitchen in there. We'll have to hang her with the bike. Come on, Bessie, give us a hand. Don't stand there getting into mischief. Uh, good afternoon, then. So, this is my house. No, it isn't. Oh, oh? Isn't this Pengarth, the name of the building, I mean? Uh, yes, it is. That's right. It was left me by my uncle, Dr. Moffat. I'm Miss Moffat. But surely those letters were written by a man. Well, if they were, I've been grossly deceiving myself for over 40 years. Now this is jolly interesting. Why did it never occur to you that I might be a woman? Uh, well, uh, the paper wasn't sent in. In such a bold hand. And that long piece about the lease being 99 years, don't you know? Was there anything wrong with it? No, there wasn't. That's the point. Oh, I see. And surely you signed your name very oddly. My initials, L.C. Moffat. <laughs> You see, I've never felt that Lily Christabel really suited me. And I thought he meant Lieutenant Colonel. But there was a military title after it. M.A. Master of Arts. A female M.A.? And how long is that going to last? Quite a long time, I hope, considering we've been waiting for it for 2,000 years. And now you know all about me. What do you do? I'm afraid I don't do anything. Mr. Trevor, he owns the hall. Really? I've never had much to do with the landed gentry. Interesting. <sighs> Au revoir, dear Miss Ronbury. Uh, Day, Jones. Well, nobody could say that I've made a conquest there. What's the matter with him? I found the team, um. Looks all right. Good. And the big luggage is coming after. Where's his lordship? Took a fence and left. I'll just have a look at the upstairs. Took a fence? It is. Mm, I'm afraid so. Oh, well, I'm jiggered. What do you think of her, eh? Ain't she a clinker? She is unusual, is she not? She's a clinker, that's what. Terrible strong will, of course. Terrible. Get her into mischief, I keep telling her. Would bring me here. I said no, I said not with my past, I said. Your past? Uh, before she took me up. But what with her, and now I've joined the corpse, it's all blotted out. The corpse? The militant righteous corpse. Ran into him in the street, I did, singing and prying and collecting full blast. And I've been a different woman since. Are you, sir? Yes, I am. So am I. Aren't it lovely? But what was uh, your past? Light fingers. Light fingers? You, you mean stealing? And everywhere I went. Terrible. Pennies, stockings, brooches, spoons, tiddly, anything. And I always looked so pie. Every time there was a do, everything went. And I always knew it was me. Uh, I was just telling them about my troubles. And... Well, don't tell them anymore. Is your kitchen all right? Oh, I ain't seed no mice yet. You've arranged my things quite splendidly, Miss Rombry. I do thank you, both of you. I like this house. What's that singing? Boys coming home from the mine. They burst into song on the slightest provocation. You mustn't take any notice. I like it. And those mountains, that grand wild countryside, foreign looking people. But business. I've heard about that mine. How far is it? It's the Glass of Glow coal mine, six miles over the hill. Mm. We're hoping it'll stay the only one. All our scenery will be ruined. Such a pretty landscape. What's that large empty building next door? Next door? Oh, the old barn belonging to the Gwalia farm before the farm was burnt down. So it's free? Free? Yes. yes. Well, I'm overstaying my welcome. So did it, Charlie. Uh, I also. All the volumes are dusty. I want you two people. Very specially. First you, Miss Ronbury. I used to meet friends of yours at lectures in London. You live alone, you've just enough money, you're not badly educated, 
and time lies heavy on your hands. The wind grows. Oh, how mean. I should never have thought... Isn't that so? Not at all. When the right gentleman appears... If you're a spinster well on in our thirties, he's lost his way and he isn't coming. Why don't you face the fact and enjoy yourself the same as I do? But a woman's only future is to marry and, uh, and uh, fulfill the duties of... Kettles. Uh, <laughs> I'd have made a shocking wife anyway. But haven't you ever been in love? No. Oh, very odd. I've never talked to a man for more than five minutes without wanting to box his ears. <coughs> but how have you passed your time since... Since I had no hope. Very busily. In the East End for years. I've read a lot, too. I'm afraid I'm what is known as an educated woman. Which brings me to Mr. Jones. Mingrove's told me all about you, too. My conscience is as clear as the snow. I'm sure it is, but you're a disappointed man, aren't you? How can I be disappointed when I am saved? Your father was a grocer with just enough money to send you to a grammar school. But the result that you're educated beyond your sphere and yet fail to qualify for the upper classes. You feel frustrated and fall back on being saved. Am I right? It, it is such a terrible thing you have said that I will have to think it over. Do? But in the meantime, would you too like to stop moping and be very useful to me? Useful? Tell me, within a radius of five miles... How many families are there around here? Families? Oh, there's the squire, of course, and Mrs. Gwent Price in the little class lodge. Quite a dear yes, thing. I mean ordinary people. The villagers? Yes, yes. How many families? Oh, really? Haven't they? There are about 20 families in the village and 15 in the farms around. Many children? What age? Oh, up to 16 or 17. Mm. Around here, they're only children until they're 12. Then they're sent away over the hills to the mine. And in one week, they're old men. I see. How many can read or write? Next to none. Why do you ask? Because I am going to start a school for them. What? Start a school for them? What for? What for? You cheerfully contribute funds to send missionaries to African heathens who are as happy as the day is long, and you ask me what for? See those books? Hundreds of them and something wonderful to read in every single one. These nippers are to be cut off from all that forever, are they? That's right. The printed page, what is it? One of the miracles of all time, that's what. And yet when these poor babies set eyes on it, they might just as well have been struck by the miracle of sudden blindness. And that, to my mind, is plain infamous. My goodness, miss. That's right. I'm going to start a school immediately next door in the barn, and you're going to help me. Ah, yes, you. You're going to fling away your parasol and your kid gloves, and you're going to stain those tapering fingers with a little honest oil. Oh, I couldn't teach those children. I couldn't. They, they smell. If we'd never been taught to us, so would we. We'll put them under the pump. Mr. Jones? Do you know what I'm going to do with that obstinate old head of yours? My head? I'm going to crack it open with a skewer. Hmm? And I'm going to excavate all those chunks of grammar school knowledge, give them a quick dust, and put him to some use at last. I'm a solicitor's clerk in Quina Gum, and I earn 33 shillings a week. I'll give you 34, and your lunch. Well, I have an enormous house to run and the flowers to do. Shut it up, except one room, and leave the flowers to die a natural death in their own beds. I've been left a little money. And I know exactly what I'm going to do with but it. those children are in the mine earning money. How can I I'll them? pay their parents the few miserable pennies they get out of it. And when I finish with you, you, Miss Ronbury, won't have time to think about snapping up, up a husband. And you, Mr. Jones, won't have time to be so pleased that you're saved. Well? I am with you. Good. I have all the details worked out. I'll explain roughly. Of course, we must go slowly at first. But if we put our backs into it... Here we are, three stolid, middle-aged folks settled in our little groove and crammed with benefits. And there are those babies, scarcely out of the shell, that have no idea they're even breathing the air. Only God can know how their life will end. But he will give us the chance to direct them a little of the way. Yes. Yes. We have the blessed opportunity to raise up the children from the bowels of the earth, where the devil hath imprisoned them in the powers of darkness. And bring them to the light of knowledge. Here's the tea. Now put those papers away and come and have it while it's nice and hot. A night in August, six weeks later. This is rum, Robert Roberts, the drink of the devil. It will take you down to hell. Get out of my school, you dirty toughy. I am on side, I am on this side. 
You here again? It's mine, right? I said you were here again. No, miss. What do you mean, no, miss? We isn't here again, miss. What are you, then? We isn't the same lot as this morning, miss. Aren't you? Miss Ronnie Berry, tell us to wait, miss. No. Yes? Five more nigger boys for you. Please, miss, can I have a kiss? You naughty boy. You wait till you see Miss Moffat. She'll give you what for. Can I ever kiss, Indy? That is the worst thing. Boys and girls, come out to play. Oh, 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 come to the roof and come to the phone. Mr. Jones. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. I see you and the lady teacher behind the door. Ooh. You wait until you see Miss Moffat. She will give you what for. You wait until you see Miss Moffat. She will give you what for. You wait until you see Miss Moffat. She will give you what for. You 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 what for. You... I told you the shape of the bedroom doesn't allow for a door into the barn. You'd... Oh, she isn't here. Um, sorry to keep you waiting, boys, but I have to go across to Mr. Reese, the carpenter, and then I'll be able to talk to you. In the meantime, will you go to the pump in the garden shade and wash your hands? Through there, you'll find a lantern. Did you uh, understand all that? Yes, miss. Thank you. you, miss. Good, I won't be long. Please, miss, can I have a kiss? What did you say? Please, miss, can I have a kiss? Of course you can. Come here. Can I oblige anybody else? No? Once again, I won't be long. Please, Miss, can I have a smart bottom? Oh, look at this, I'm going to be so loud, I can't. Well, suck your eyes, right? Well, Hama. No need to be a Morphy. Do. That's good. When West McGuire says, Hama. Do. Or go, huh? Should my friend all out, Hama. Good evening. Elf, man. Who has gone, Mr. Jones? Oh, the elf, my penny. No star. No star, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, it said in this book. Oh, what's that box? It will. It's just brought the school bell. Really? Oh, Miss Moss. Well, no good. Oh, oh dear. Mr. Reese says he's had a strict order not to discuss lining the roof till the lease of the barn is signed. Who gave the order? That's what I want to know. And when will the lease be signed? Never, it seems to me. Did you call up the solicitors? Yes. They've located Sir Herbert Vesey, but he's now doubtful about letting the barn and we'll give his decision by course. But why? He'd already said it was no use to him and my references were impeccable. Why? Oh, you look tired. It's been a bit of a day. A letter from the mine to say no child can be released above ground. That's all blethers, but still. A request from the public house not to start a school in case it interferes with beer swilling and games of chance. A message from the chapel people to the effect that I am a foreign adventuress with cloven feet. And Pastillo's had a puncture. A bit of a day. What's that? It's the bell for the school. Oh, is it? Do let us have a peek. It was on St. Talon Monastery before it burned down. Look, it's got the rope and everything. Well, it's good to see it anyway. The mason finished a little tower for it yesterday. Oh, do let us tell those boys to put it up. It'll bring us luck. Well, if it keeps them out of mischief till I'm ready, they can... Uh... Mr. Jones, do go and tell them. Very good. I'll, I'll take it out to them now. <laughs> Oh, Jonesy. He's terrified of them. So much. Oh, they're so big and so black. Oh, here's a letter from the gentleman who owns the barn. I had a good look at the sale. At last. What does it say? Sir Herbert still cannot give a definite decision until the 17th. Oh! Another week wasted, isn't it? Infuriating. Does it mean he may not let you have it? He must. It would ruin everything. Oh, can't we start afresh somewhere there? Oh, I've spent too much on preparations here. Besides, I've felt so right here from the start. I can't leave now. I'm a Christian woman, but I could smack Sir Herbert's face with my arm dropped off. Jolly good evening, teacher. Remember me? Would you mind going outside, knocking, and waiting quite a long time before I say come in? Oh, jolly good. Oh, Paul again, what? But it's Moffat, it's the squire. Oh, squire, you must forget you ever saw me in this dress. So ashamed, I shan't be alone. Rat-tat-tat. 
One, two, three, four, Johnny. One, two, three, four, forward, march. Oh, my dear madam, you're not in class now. I'm rather irritable this evening, so unless there's a reason for your visit, oh, I... Oh, but there is a very important message, word of mouth, from a gent that's just been dining with me, Sir Herbert Vesey. Yes? Oh, do be quick. He's definitely decided that he has no use for the bar. Oh, but he doesn't see it as a school, and under no circumstances will he let it as such, so he must regretfully decline, etc., etc. He implied in his first letter that he would be willing to sell. Then some bigwig must have made him change his mind, mustn't he? You? I have not called on you, madam, because I have been eyeing your activities very closely uh, uh, from afar. It is with dis disapproval and a dis dis It is unwise to embark on a speech with the vocabulary of a child of five. I'm not going to have any of this damned hanky-panky in my village. Your village? My village. I'm no braggart, but I'd have you know that everything you can see from that window, and you haven't got a bad view, I own. Now, my dear madam... And stop calling me your dear madam. I'm not married, I'm not French, and you haven't the slightest affection for me. Oh. First of all, I'm not one to hit a woman below the belt. <laughs> you know what I mean. Always be fair to the fair sex. All my life I've done my level best for the villagers. Though they call me squire, you know. Tom the Fiction. Jolly touchy. I mean a hamper every Christmas, a whole shoot, and a whopping tank of beer on my birthday. And on my 21st year, they all got a mug. Anyway... This buying them out of the mines a lot of gammon. I own a half share in it. Ah, that explains a good deal. Why don't you take up croaky and keep your pecker up? Uh, well, dear lady, anything I can do to make your stay here a happier one? Thank you. I must be getting back. If I know Sir Herbert, my best old port will be there. Wait more. a minute. Yes? I know I shall be sticking a pin into a whale, but here are just two words about yourself. You are the Squire Barnstable, are you? Adored by his contented subjects, intelligent and benignly understanding, are you? I should just like to point out that there is a considerable amount of dirt, ignorance, misery and discontent abroad in this world. And that a great deal of it is due to people like you. Because you are a stupid, conceited, greedy, good-for-nothing, addle-headed nincompoop and you can go to blue blazes. Good night. I perceive that you have been drinking. Phew. Oh. That was undignified, but I feel better for it. I'm glad because it was plain spoken, wasn't it? Has he been nasty? Oh, so unlike the squire. He was kindness itself. He advised me to go and live in a hole in the ground with my knitting. He's persuaded the owner not to sell. Oh, dear. Uh, well, of course, I always think men know best, don't you? Oh, yes. I'm wearing my muslin to swan. He never even noticed. Oh, what will you do? Sell the house. Take this brainchild of a ridiculous spinster and smother it. Have you got a handkerchief? Yes, Miss Moffat. Why? Want to blow my nose. <laughs> you? Oh, you ought to have had a cry. I love a cry when I'm depressed. Such an advantage over the gentleman, I always think. I must get some letters written to the tradespeople in the mine to let them know we're giving up the school. I suppose we'd better start putting some order into this chaos and get the business over. What are these filthy exercise books doing among my papers? Well, those hooligans brought them just now. They said Mr. Jones had picked them out because they could write English. I set them an essay on how I would spend my holiday. Must have been mad. Don't listen to this one. If I have ever holiday, I have breakfast and talks, then dinner and a rest. Tea, then nothing. Then supper, then I talk, and I go sleep. From exhaustion, I suppose. Holiday time. That carefree magic word. What shall it be this year, to bothering among the eternal snows or tasting the joys of Father Neptune? But that's beautiful. Extraordinary. Yes, I might think so, too, if I hadn't seen it in a book open on that desk. Oh... No, your squire was right. I've been a stupid and impractical ass, and I can't imagine how I... The mine is dark. If a light come in the mine, the rivers in the mine will run fast with the voice of many women. The walls will fall in, and it will be the end of the world. Please, miss, I help with the bell. Do go on. So the mine is dark. But when I walk through the...
pretend something soft in the dark. I can touch with my hand the leaves on the trees and underneath where the corn is green. Go on, read it. There is a wind in the shaft. Not carbon monoxide they talk about. It smells like the sea. Only like as if the sea had fresh flowers lying about. And that is my holiday. Are you uh, Morgan Evans? Yes, miss. Did you write this? No, miss. It's in your book? Yes, miss. Then who wrote it? I don't know, miss. Oh. Um, Miss Ronbury, will you see to those papers in the study? Oh, yes, of course I will. Now, did you write this? I don't know, miss. What is the matter with it? Sit down. And take your cap off. Spelling's deplorable, of course. Mine with two N's and leaves, L-E-F-S. What was it by rights? Well, a V to start with. I never heard of no V's, miss. Don't call me, miss. Are you not a miss? Yes, I am, but it's not polite. Oh. You say... Yes, Miss Moffat, or no, Miss Moffat. M O double F A T. No V's? No V's. Where do you live? Under the ground, Miss. I mean your home. Oh, Cinnamoin, Miss uh, Moffat. Four miles from here. How big is it? Four houses and a beer house. Any hobbies? Oh, yes. What? Rum. Rum? Oh. <laughs> do you live with your parents? No, by my own self. My mother is dead. And my father and my four big brothers was in the big shaft accident when I was ten. Killed? Oh, yes, everybody was. Mm. What sort of man was your father? He was a mongrel. A what? He had a dash of English. He learned it to me. You go to chapel? No, thank you. Who taught you to read and write? Taught? Taught. The verb, to teach. Oh, teach? Who taught you? I did. Why? I don't know. What books have you read? Books? A bit of the Bible and a book that a fellow from the past kitchen nabbed for me. What was it? The Lady's Companion. Can I go now, please? No. Do you want to learn any more? No, thank you. Why not? The other men would have a good laugh. I see. Have you ever written anything um, before this exercise? No. Why not? Nobody never asked me to. What is the matter with it? Nothing's the matter with it. Whether it means anything is too early for me to say, but it shows exceptional talent for a boy in your circumstances. Terrible long words, Miss Moffat. This shows that you are very clever. Oh. Have you ever been told that before? It is news to me. What effect does the news have on you? It is a bit sudden. It makes me that I... I want to get more clever still. I want to know what is behind of all them books. Miss Ronbury... Can you come tomorrow? Tomorrow, no. I'm working on the six till four shift. Then can you be here at five? Five, no. Not before seven, miss. Six miles to walk. Yes, yes, of course. Seven. Seven, then. In the meantime, I'll correct this for spelling and grammar. Yes, Miss Moffat. That'll be all. Good night. Uh, uh, good night, Miss Moffat. Miss Rondre? Yes? I've been a deuce of a fool. It doesn't matter about the barn. We're going to start the school in a small way at first, in this room. And I'm going to get those youngsters out of that mine if I have to black their face and go down and fetch them myself. We're going on with the school. Oh, Mr. Jones, we're going on with the school. We're going on with the school. And when I walk in the dark, I can touch with my hands where the corn is green. Two years later. Anybody seen a Greek book? 
Ah, here it is. Greek, Miss Moffat. Morgan Evans is starting Greek this month. No. I didn't know you knew Greek. I don't. I've just got to keep one day ahead of him and toss the luck. To think that two years ago he hardly knew English. Stuck up teacher's pet. You must not think that, Betty, dear. Miss Moffat says he's clever. He always looks right through me, so I don't know, I'm sure. Stuck up teacher's pet. Oh, she has some wonderful plans for him. I can tell by her manner. I think she's trying to send him to one of those church schools to be a curate. Would not that be exciting? Well, I think she's riding for a fall. Let's see. Why? All this ordering him about. I've got eyes in my head if she hasn't. And he's getting sick of it. I think a lady ought to be dainty. She's no idea. Well, I must get on with my work. Evans! Evans! Yes, Miss Moffat? Finished? Yes, Miss Moffat. How many pages? Nine. Three too many. Boil down to six. You got those lines of Voltaire? Yes, Miss Moffat. Here. It's just five. Have your walk now. Good and brisk. Here's your cap. Yes, Miss Moffat. But kill two birds and get the Voltaire by heart. If you can ever argue a point like that, you'll do. Back in 20 minutes. And take your pen from behind your ear. Now turn a somersault in bed. <coughs> can you smell scent? Yes. Nice, isn't it? I don't know. I never come across scent before. I... I did never come across scent before. Mm, bright, aren't you? Don't you ever get tired of lessons? Eh? No, quite made me jump. My mummy ought to be back soon, and then we'll know something. What's the matter? Where's she gone? One of our prayer meetings. Twenty miles to shout the tambourine in the open air. I think it's wicked. She ought to be just in time, and then we'll know. Know what? About that horrid Morgan Evans. It's been lessons every night with teacher, hasn't it, since we left the mine. And long walks in between to blow the cobwebs away. But the last week or two, we've been breaking our journey, so we've heard. How do you mean? A glass of rum next door at the Westmore Arms, and then another, and then another. Oh, whoever told you that? A little bird. And if my mummy sciatica's better, she's going to jump up and look over the frosty part, and then we'll know. Guess what's happened to me? What? I'm a sergeant major. Did you jump to see into the bar? Just caught him. Evan, a good swig, miss. Don't you dare tell her, you little dolly mop, or I'll rattle your bones. Was it a nice service, was it? Beautiful, mum. They said they hoped the late sergeant major was gone where we all want to go. <sighs> but with her having deserted, they couldn't be sure. Then we saved three sinners. Please, Miss Moffat, can I have the money for my ticket? What ticket? For to go on a fair tomorrow. You said I could go. On the contrary, I said you couldn't. Not in school hours. Are you feeling better, dear? No, Miss Runbury. It's all this sitting down. It's been going on for two years now. My hotel, it ends in everything rotting away. What's rotting away? This is so she's been sitting down for two years. This is lucky. My feet feel as if I've been standing for the same length of time. Um, what are these papers, Ron? Two more accounts, I fear. Oh, yes. Yes, the Little and Scott and Evans' new suit. Oh. <laughs> I shall have to sell out a couple more shares, I expect. Oh, dear. Not at all. It's easy to squander money and it's easy to hoard it. The most difficult thing in the world is to use it. And if I've learnt to use it, I've done something. My plans are laid, Ron, my dear. My plans are laid. But don't ask me what I'm hatching, because I can't tell you till tomorrow. Oh, you are wonderful. Oh, to Halifax, I'm enjoying myself. And now, Bessie Wattie, what is all this dying duck business? Yes, Miss Moffat. Don't yes, Miss Moffat, me. Explain yourself. My mummy said all these lessons is bad for my inside. She told me they stopped you eating sweets, but perhaps uh, I'm telling the lies. Yes, Miss Moffat. What's the matter with your inside? It goes round and round through sitting down. That's what I want is a change. Aren't you wants castor oil. Adelphus, Adelphus, Adelphus. Adelphus, a brother. There's nothing to prevent you going for walks between lessons. You can you can go for one now as far as Sarah Pugh Postman, see if my new chalks have arrived. Quick march. I'm not going. What did you say? I'm not going. Everybody's against me. I'm going to throw myself off a cliff and kill myself. It'll make a nice coat in the papers, me and Peter, at the bottom of the cliff. I'm going to mad as mad. I'm going to kill myself. Nothing's going to stop me. Stop me. Oh, dear. She's at it again. See if that won't stop you.
your nonsense. <coughs> there. Nothing like cold water, Mum. I learnt that with her father. He was foreign, you know. She'll catch her death. Oh, I made a mess of your rug, Mum, but I think it's worth it. She's got bad blood, this girl. Mark my word. <laughs> and how do you feel after that? I can't remember anything. I'm in a coma. Come on. Upstairs, will you? <laughs> we'll sit on our bed for an hour with the door locked, shall we? And try to remember. And next week, you'll go away to service and see how we like that. Come on. Look sharp about it. I must count her as one of my failures. Fish out of water, of course. Got a snipe species. <laughs> there is such a fish. She'll be bored at home instead. Now, where was I? Dendron. Dendron, a tree. Oh, Miss Moffat, I'm bursting with curiosity. Your plans for Morgan Evans. Is it a curative? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it isn't a curative. <laughs> I'll go and have something to eat. Oh, it's you, Morgan. Miss Moffat is having something to eat. And I've been having something to drink, so we are quit. Oh, uh, I will tell her that you're back. I don't want to see no Miss Moffat. You mean I don't want to see Miss Moffat, the double negative? Oh, don't you start. I like the double negative. It says what I want the way I like, and I'm not going to stand no interferences from nobody. Voltaire, indeed. Oh, I've never seen you like this before. You haven't, have you? Well, now I come to think of it, I have neither not for two years, and I'm surprised by myself and shocked by myself. Going inside one of them public houses and putting my nice clean boots on that dirty rail and my dainty lady fingers on that detestable mucky counter, pouring poison rum down my nice clean teeth and spitting it in a spittoon. What's come over you, Morgan Evans? You come back to your little cage. And if you comb hair and wash hands and get your grammar right and forget you was once the middleweight champion of the glass of glow miners, we might give you a nice bit of sewing to do. Where's that bestie Watty sending a mother to spy on me? I'll knock her bloody block. Organism, language. Don't you dare use an expression like that to me again. I got plenty of others, thank you, and they're all coming out. I'm going to surprise quite a few. No, I'll, um, I'll drink the milk in here, Watty. Have a good walk, Evans? Yes, Miss Moffat. Can you repeat the Voltaire? Not yet. Well, it's very short. Paper blowed away. Oh. Well, copy it again, will you, and bring it to me? Yes, Miss Moffat. I'll, I'll go and do it now. Hope he's not going to be slow at French. It'll make the Greek so much more difficult. You don't think perhaps all this uh, in his situation is rather sudden for him, I mean... Not for him, my dear. He has the most brilliantly receptive brain I've ever come across. Don't tell him so, but he has. Oh, I know his brain is all right. I'm very pleased with his progress on the whole. Wait a minute. Yes, it is. Ooh. Royalty, the conservatives, and all the grand llamas rolled into one. The squire. The squire. Oh, oh, my. It is indeed, oh, my. I'll run upstairs a moment. You open the door to him, Ron. Come in. Uh, good afternoon. Your hat, squire. Oh, no, thank you. I'm not staying. Oh, dear, I do look at steps. Oh, this is the seat of learning. Oh, we are always on the point of a good spring team. How dreadful that we have no refreshment to offer you. Has she given it up, then? Tell her from me that I'm not here to be insulted again. Oh, I'm sure you aren't. I mean... Last time I was here, she called me uh, an arrow-headed nincompoop. Uh, Miss Romberry, dear, my roses are dying. Would you pour out a little water for them? I have such a headache, I don't think I can... Oh. Squire. You wrote to me. Perhaps you've forgotten. Oh, how could I forget? I only thought that after the overwrought fashion of my behavior at our last meeting, you must ignore my very nervous invitation. Uh, Miss Rombry, a chair, dear, for the Squire. Well, I've not a great deal of time to spare, I fear. Oh, of course you haven't. I was just saying to Miss Rombry, he's so busy he'll never be able to fit it in. Uh, Miss Rombry, dear, would you get some water for those flowers? Of course. Excuse me, Squire. Tell me, Squire, how did your prize-giving fare this afternoon? Oh, rather a bore, you know. I had so hoped to see you judge. I love flowers. It wasn't flowers, it was cow. Oh. Uh, it, it, it was your speech I wanted to hear, of course. I heard you made such an amusing one at the croquet. Oh, oh did they tell you about yes. that? Uh, rather a good pun, eh? <laughs> uh, may I sit down? Oh, do, yes. I thought Griffith the butcher was going to laugh his napper off. Indeed. 
Well, you know, Squire, that makes me rather proud. Proud? Why? Because he wouldn't have understood a word if his little girls hadn't learned English at my school. Oh, I've never thought of it like that. Oh. <laughs> Headache? <laughs> Squire, you see before you a tired woman. We live and learn. And I've learned how right you were that night. I've worked my fingers to the bone, battering my head against a stone wall. But... I heard you were a spilling to say. Oh, no, no. Oh, fair of you to admit it, I must say. You see, in one's womanly enthusiasm, one forgets that the qualities vital to success in this sort of venture are completely lacking in one. Intelligence, uh, courage, uh, and authority. Uh, well, the qualities, in short, of, of a man. Oh, come, come. You mustn't be too hard on yourself, you know. After all, you meant well. It's kind of you to say that. Well, what about this Jones chap? Oh, he's a dear creature, but... I have no wish to be fulsome. I, I mean a man uh, like yourself. Uh, I see. One gets into such muddles. You can never believe. Well, I've never been on your side, but I'm sorry to hear you've come a cropper. Uh, will you give me it up? Oh, uh, well, that again is difficult. I, I have all my widow's might, as it were, in the uh, venture. Please excuse me. It's all right, Evans. Have you copied it uh, on my desk, will you? Yes, Miss Moffat. Excuse me, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon, my boy. Nice, well-spoken lad. Relative? No. No, a pupil. He used to be one of your minors. No. I'm glad you thought he was a nice, well-spoken boy. Yes, sir. What are my minors? Because... He is the problem. I should like your advice. Oh, about. what's he been up to? Poaching? No. A bit of mud? No, no, no. Whether or none, anyway. What about that little cockney filly? Bessie Watty? Oh, no, I assure you. <laughs> She's a schoolgirl. No, no, no. All these young people growing up together, you know, eh? I think it's good for them. No, no, there's nothing of that sort. But he's a problem just the same, and like a true woman, I have to scream for help to a man. <laughs> to you. Scream away, dear lady, scream away. Well, he's clever. Oh, is he? Good at figures and all that? Because if he is, there's no reason why I shouldn't put him in my mine office as junior office boy. Oh, now, what do you think of that? Uh, no, figures aren't his strong point. Well, you said he was clever. But to begin with, he can write. Oh. Oh. Well? Very well. Oh, then he could make fair copies, eh? No. Uh, this boy is... Quite out of the ordinary. Sure? As sure as one of your miners would be cutting through coal and striking a diamond without a flaw. He was born with very exceptional gifts. They must be... Well, they... They ought to be given every chance. You mean he might turn into a, a literary bloke? He might, yes. I'm blowed. How do you know? By his work, it's very good. How do you know it's good? What? How does one know Shakespeare's good? Shakespeare? Well, what's he got to do with it? He was a literary bloke. Yes, uh, he was good, of course. But how do you know he was? Uh, I heard he was. This little tenant of yours, Squire, has it in him to bring great credit to you? Yes, he is a tenant of mine, isn't he? Imagine if you could say that you had known, well, uh, say Lord Tennyson as a boy on your estate. Rather a lark, was he? <laughs> well, it's a bit different, you know. Tennyson was at Cambridge, my old colleague. Oh, poor Evans. What a pity he wasn't born at the beginning of the 18th century. Beginning of the 18th century? Oh, now, when was that? He would have had a protector. What again? A patron. A uh, pope, you recall, uh, dedicated the famous essay on man to his protector. Uh, here it is. Look. Oh. To H. St. John Lord Bolingbroke. Yes, yes, I have heard of it. Now I remember. Isn't it wonderful to think that that inscription is handed down to posterity? And here's another hmm? To the Right Honourable Earl of Southampton, to your honours in all duty, William Shakespeare. Oh. oh, I often think of the pride that surged from the Earl's bosom when his encouragement gave birth to the masterpiece of a poor, humble writer. Down here, I never thought of Shakespeare being poor somehow. Oh, some say his father was a butcher. The Earl realised he had genius and, uh, and fostered it. Hmm. Uh, if this boy really is clever, it seems a pity for me not to do something about it, doesn't it? A great pity. And I can tell you exactly how you can do something about how? it. How? There's a scholarship going. Scholarship? Where? To Oxford. Oxford? A scholarship to Trinity College, Oxford, open to boys of secondary education in the British Isles. My school hardly comes under the heading of secondary education, and I wrote your brother at Maudlin. What? Yes, and he pulled some strings for me, and they have agreed to make a special case of this boy on one condition, that you vouch for him. Will you? 
My dear lady, you, you take the cake. Uh, can't he be just as clever at home? No, he can't. For the sort of future he ought to have, he must have polish. He has everything else. The background of the university would be invaluable to him. Will you? Well, the, the varsity, you know, hang it all. Uh, mind you, we'll never get it. Oh, no, I know, but he must have the chance. Still, you know, even the mere prospect of one of my oh, minors. Think of Shakespeare. Oh, Serene, I'll drop a line to Henry next week. Oh, rather a lark, what? I'm still... uh, I, I should be most obliged if the letter could be posted tomorrow. Uh, w- would you like me to draft out a recommendation and send it over to the hall? You must be so busy with the estate. I or... am, rather. Polka supper tomorrow night. Yes, do do that. Uh, goodbye, dear lady. Thank you so very much, Squire. Happier conditions and all that. Uh, glad you've come to the <laughs> Thank you so very much, Squire. Not at all. I'm all for giving a writer fellow a helping hand. Oh, tell my brother that, if you like. <laughs> you know... I can never get over Henry being a don, though I always said he'd end up as something funny. <laughs> well, <laughs> that man is so stupid, it sits on him like a halo. What happened? In ten minutes, I've given the squire the impression that he spends his whole time fostering genius in the illiterate. Oh, but how? Soft soap and curtsying with my brain, my heart, and my soul. I've beaten you at your own game, my dear. At my age and with my looks, I've flirted with him. And he's going to write to Oxford. At least I'm going to write to Oxford for him. Hooray! Hip! 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 Hooray! I'm entering my little pit pony for a scholarship to Oxford, child. Oxford University. But they don't have minors at Oxford University. Well, they're going to. The lad is on this earth for 80 years at the most out of a few millions. Let the proud, silly ones grovel and be useful for a change so he can step up and on their backs to something better. I was thirsty to say that to the Lord of the Manor, so I must spend it on you. Now you've served your purpose, you can go home. But you'd better watch out. I may race into the altar yet. <laughs> Evans! Yes? Come and sit down. Is this your essay on the wealth of nations? Yes. Say so and underline it. Nothing irritates examiners more than this sort of vagueness. I couldn't work this sentence out. What does it say? The 18th century was a cauldron. Vice and elegance boiled to a simmer until the kitchen of society reeked fulminously and the smell percolated to the marble halls above. Do you know what that means? Yes, Miss Moffat. Because I don't. Clarify, my boy, clarify and leave the rest to Mrs. Henry Wood. <gasps> Water with two teas? Oh, that's a bad lapse. The Adam Smith sentence is good, original and clear as well. Seven out of ten. Not bad, but not good. You must avoid long words until you know exactly what they mean, otherwise domino. There you are. Now then, you're reading? Burke's cause of the present discontent. Style? Uh, his style appears to me as if there was too much of it. His style struck me as florid. His style struck me as florid. Again? His style struck me as florid. Subject matter? A sound argument falsified by, uh, by the high color of the sentiments. Hmm. The high color of the sentiments. Uh, odd. No, not too odd. Good, stylish. Now for next time. Walpole and Sheridan as representatives of their age. And no smelly cauldrons. By the way, next Tuesday I'm starting you on Greek. Oh, uh, yes? I'm going to put you in for a scholarship to Oxford. Oxford? Where all the lords go? Mm-hmm. The same. I made a simplified alphabet to begin with. Jolly interesting, Arthur Latin. Where have I put it? Have a look at it by Tuesday so that we can make a good start. Oh, and uh, before we go on to the lesson, I found the nail file I mentioned. I'll uh, I'll show you how to use it. Had them both here somewhere. I shall not need a nail file in the coal mine. The what? I'm going back to the coal mine. I don't understand you. Explain yourself. I do not want to learn Greek, not to pronounce any long English words, not to keep my hands clean. What's the matter with you? Why not? Because... Because I was born in a Welsh hayfield when my mother was helping with a harvest. And I always lived in a little house with no stairs, only a ladder and no water. And until my brothers was killed, I never sleep except three in a bed. I know that is terrible grammar, but it is true. What on earth has three in a bed got to do with learning Greek? It has a lot. The last two years, I've not had no proper talk with English chaps in the mine because I was so busy keeping this old grammar in its place. Trying to better myself. Trying to better myself the day and the night. You cannot take a nail file into the Westmore Arms public bar. My dear boy, file your nails at home. I never heard anything so ridiculous. Besides, you don't go to the Westmore Arms. Yes, I do. 
I've been there every afternoon for a week, spending your pocket money. And I've been there now. And that is why I can speak my mind. I had no idea that you felt like this. It's because you are not interested in not, me. Not interested in you. How can you be interested in a machine that you put a penny in and if nothing comes out, you give it a good shake? Evans, write me an essay. Evans, get up and bow. Evans, what is the subjunctive? My name is Morgan Evans. And all my friends call me Morgan. And if there is anything gets on the wrong side of me, it's calling me Evans. Do you know what they call me in the village? Key Bachar The schoolmistress's little dog. What has he got to do with you if my nails are dirty? Mind your own business. I never meant you to know this. I've spent money on you. No, I don't mind that. Your money ought to be spent. But time is different. Your life has not yet begun. Mine's half over. When you're a middle-aged spinster, some folks say it's pretty near finished. <laughs> two years is valuable currency. I have spent two years on you. Ever since that first day, the mainspring of this school has been your career. Sometimes in the middle of the night when I've been desperately tired, I've lain awake making plans. Large and small. Sensible and silly. Plans. For you. And you tell me I have no interest in you. If I say any more, she'll start to cry. And I haven't cried since I was younger than you are, and I'd never forgive you for that. I'm going for a walk. I don't like this sort of conversation. Please never mention it again. If you want to go on, be at school tomorrow. If not, don't. I don't want your money, and I don't want your time. I don't want to be thankful to no strange woman for anything. I don't understand you. I don't understand you at all. Ah. <coughs> well, some nations. <laughs> Hello. Caught me knee climbing down the rain pipe. Oh. Hmm. Perhaps I'm invisible. Mum's gone out. Been spying. People lock me in and take the key out the key out. They can't blame me for listening at it. No, I think she's wicked. Mind your own business. I won't. I like to know about everything. I like doing all the things I like. I like sweets. I don't care if it does make me fat. And I love earrings. I like to shake my head like a lady. Funny, we've never been by ourselves before. Tita Boiti, the spirit in all I do, Gwen, frost in our heart. Tadi, your gurain, verhagarain. Now I knew Welsh, did you? You like that song, don't you? That's why I learnt it. You are different when you sing. Am I? You know, you was quite right to put her in her place. Clever chap like you learning lessons off a woman. That's right. You don't have to go to Oxford. Clever chap like you. That's right. What a man wants is a bit of sympathy. Yes. He's fine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're hurting me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Ten months later, Morgan Evans has passed the written examination for the scholarship and has been called to Oxford for the oral tests. Any news? Not yet. I thought not. 
Where's the squire? Gone to see if there's any sign. Thank the Lord. That man is really becoming a nuisance. He gave up Henley to be here this week, did you know? You do not appear nervous. Fast being nervous. If Morgan Evans has won this scholarship, I shan't believe it, flatly. And if he's lost? If he has lost, we must proceed as if nothing had happened. The sun rises and sets every day, and while it does, we've jolly well got to revolve round it. The time to sit up and take notice will be the day it decides not to appear. In the meantime, Mr. Jones, your report is on your desk, Miss Ronbury. Form two are waiting for your music like a jungle of hungry parakeets. Yes, yes Miss Ronbury. This response is very terrible, isn't it, Mr. Jones? Oh, I haven't. I caught the early train. I knew they would all be watching for me, so I got out of San Morbid and got a lift to Gwine again. Oh, does that mean... Oh, no news, except that I am not hopeful. Why not? They talked to me for one hour at the Viva. That doesn't mean anything. Go on. They jumped down hard on the New Testament question, as you said they would. You are very pale. Better than a raging fever. Go on. I spent five minutes explaining why St. Paul sailed from a town 300 miles inland. Oh, dear. <laughs> Parnell? Parnell. Oh, yes, I was going to stick up for the old chap, but when they started off with that fellow Parnell, I told the tale against him for half an hour. I wasn't born a Welshman for nothing. <laughs> and the French? Not good. I said natural mung to everything, but it didn't fit every time. And the Greek verbs? They were sarcastic. Did the president send for you? I had half an hour with him. You did? Yes, but so did the other nine candidates. He was a very kind and grand old gentleman. Sitting in a drawing room the size of Penland Town Hall. I talked about religion the same as you said. Just as you advised? Just as you advised. Mm. Oh, he asked me if I'd ever had strong drink. And I looked him straight in the eye and said, no. Oh. When shall we know? The day after tomorrow. They are writing to you. The villagers are all in their best and talking about a holiday tomorrow. It's very stupid of them because if you failed, it'll make you still more sick at heart. If I have failed, don't speak about it. But we must. You faced the idea the day you left for Oxford. I know, but I've been to Oxford and come back since then. I have come back from the world. Since the day I was born, I've been a prisoner behind a stone wall. And now somebody has given me a leg up to have a look at the other side. They cannot drag me back again. They cannot. They must give me a push and send me over. I've never heard you talk so much since I've known you. That's just it. I can talk now. The three days I've been there, I've been talking my head off. Oh, if three days at Oxford can do that to you, what would you be like at the end of three years? That's just it again. It would be everything I need. Everything. Starling and I spent three hours one night discussing the law. He's one of the other candidates. Brilliant. The words came pouring out of me. All the words that I'd learnt and written down and, and never spoken. I suppose I was talking nonsense, but I was at least holding a conversation. I suddenly realised that I'd never done it before. I'd never been able to do it. How are you, Morgan? Nice day, Mr. Jones. Not bad for the harvest. A vocabulary of twenty words. All the thoughts that you had given to me were being stored away as if they were always going to be useless. Locked up and rotting away. A lot of questions with nobody to answer them. A lot of statements with nobody to contradict them. And there I was with Starling, 19 to the dozen. It's all together. Everybody seemed to be walking very fast with their gowns on in the moonlight. The bells were ringing and I was walking faster than anybody and I felt... Uh, same as on the rum in the old days. Go on. All of a sudden, with one big rush, against that moon and against that high street, I saw this room... You and me sitting here studying and all those books. And everything I've ever learnt from those books and from you was lighted up like a magic lantern. Ancient Rome, Greece, Shakespeare, Carlyle, Milton, everything had a meaning because I was in a new world. My world. And so it came to me why you worked like a slave to make me ready for this scholarship. I finished. I didn't want you to stop. I have not been drinking. I know. I can talk to you, too, now. Yes. I'm glad. No sign of the fellow in there, Daddy. Evans, there you are. Well, good day, sir. They're sending the result through the post. Oh, the devil they are. Do you know I'm finding this waiting a definite strain? Somebody said they've seen Morgan. Day after tomorrow. Oh. Examiner's all right, my boy? Rather sticky, sir. Uh, a lot of old fogies, I expect. Miss Moffat, I told you you ought to have made inquiries at the other place, however. Somebody said they've seen The, the day, day after, after tomorrow. tomorrow. Well, how are you, Morgan, dear? The suspense is terrible. I know. Even the little children out here are worrying about... Oh. Uh, Morgan, my boy, are you not exhausted after your journey? Uh, wouldn't you like something to eat? 
Oh, I am rather hungry, yes. Oh, how stupid of me. What do you boil you an egg? Come along. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, did they spot the driving holler? No. You seem very anxious to get him out of the room, Jones. What's the matter? Hello. Well, how do you do? I'm very well indeed, thanks. And how are you, Bloomy? Very well, thanks. What is this? <laughs> I really couldn't say. Good gracious, it's Bessie. Right, right first time. Hello, Miss Rondry. How's geography? The world's still going round in circles. Hello, Mr. Jones. Flirty as ever. And to what do we owe this honour? Well, it's like Miss this. Rondry, will you please return to your class? They're quite safe. I left Mary Davis in charge. Right. No, you don't, Mr. Jones. We've had too many secrets as it is. Three days ago, she sent money to you. Did you not receive the letter? Yes, I did. And all the others, till I was sick of them. What is all this? Last week, I was glancing through the Midway's Gazette. And I'm here to uh, congratulate a certain young gent in case he has won that scholarship. Oh. But what has that got to do with you? You see, Mrs. it's likely. Don't say it. Don't say it. Four weeks yesterday, I had a baby. Oh. You had a what? A baby. Seven pounds, thirteen ounces. Good God, how God. It's, it's a disgusting subject. It isn't disgusting at all. If I had a wedding ring, you'd think it was sweet. Morgan Evans' luggage. Excuse me, sir. Any news? Well, yes. Bessie! Ma, you do look a dolly mo... Uh, excuse me, sir. You say anything you like. Where'd you get them bracelets? Present. Oh, that's all right. Where have you been, you madam? Turning you into a granny. A granny? Well, fancy. And uh, I should try and have a sleep if I were you. Hello, Miss Moffat. I've just been telling them... You know what? Uh, now I think it's time you tell us who the fellow is. I'm going to take plastic proceedings. That's right. Dear, who is it? Well, as a matter of fact... No, I'll pay you anything. Anything. It's no goodness. It's Morgan Evans. Oh, oh what? I don't believe it. Oh, Mum. I've been dreading this for months in a terrible way. It's a relief. Bamboos in me every week. He was in the gutter. Lies, all lies, and I was glad to be telling them. I, I can't stop on listening. This horrible, unnatural happened. Don't talk nonsense. It isn't horrible and it isn't unnatural. But I should have tried to understand and forestall instead of riding roughshod like a mare with blinkers. The schoolmistress has learned a lesson, but it's a little late now. Where is he? Over my dead body, my girl. She's right, Mum. It's too late. I got a four-weeks-old baby, kicking healthy and hungry. And I haven't got a husband to keep him, so his father's got to turn into my husband. That's only fair, isn't it? I'm sorry, Miss Moffat, but I'm inclined to agree. I'll call him. Uh, there, is, there is no need to call him. What's the matter with you? I, I am sorry to say that I have a strong feeling of affection for this young woman... And I am willing to do my duty by rehabilitating her in wedlock and bestowing on the infant every advantage by bringing it up a Baptist. Are you serious? I am always serious. I know it sounds cold-blooded, but will you agree? No, I won't. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I do draw the line. Oh, please, think well, again. I'd like to oblige. <laughs> but really, I couldn't. Besides, my friend would be furious. Your friend? Ever such a nice gentleman, sporting, quite a swell. Owns a race Oh, course. I, I've never heard such a conversation outside a police court. I'm seeking the safety of my own quarters. Anything I can do, Miss Moffat. I suppose you wouldn't care to uh, state a claim? Oh, Doesn't this man of yours want to marry you? He won't talk of anything else. But he won't have the baby. No, he worships me. Ever since I left, he keeps on sending me telegrams. I just got two at the station. I expect I'll get some more tonight, isn't it, Rich? <laughs> Mr. Jones wouldn't consider the baby without me. The baby without you? Your child? But what about your, your mother, love? When I'm your age, I love the idea of a baby. But life hasn't begun yet for me. I'm just getting a taste for it. What do I want with a baby? I could have left it on a doorstep, couldn't I? But I must see it's in good hands, and that's why I've come to Morgan Evans. You want to make him marry you on the chance he will become fond enough of the child to ensure its future. Your conscience will be clear, and later you can go off on your own. I shouldn't be surprised. In the meantime, it's worthwhile to ruin a boy on... on the threshold of... I don't know anything about that, I'm sure. More... Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait. There may be a way out. There must be the... Oh, bless us, Mama, I got it. What? Why can't you adopt it? Don't be ridiculous. Would that do you, Bessie? Well, I never would thought it, though. Mm, yes, it would. It would. But, but what 
would I do with a baby? I, 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 I don't even know what they look oh, like. Oh, they're lovely little things. Now, it's all arranged. It would be fantastic. Oh, I do, please. It'll put everything to right. I would know the baby was safe. Morgan Evans need never know a thing about it. I can marry my friend, and we'll all be beautiful. Oh, come on, Mom. You've been pushing us about for three years. Now I'll give you a shot. But it's mad, I tell you. Not I as can't... mad as taking me in was with my trouble. You're the one, dear. Really, you are. Bessie Watty, do you mean that if I do not adopt this child, you... I will have to tell Morgan Evans, and he will have to marry me. I swear that. And do you swear... That you would never let Morgan Evans know the truth. I swear. If there are any questions, I'll say it was my friends. Then I give in. That's lovely. My friend will be pleased. I pop back to the public house for his telegram and send him a nice one back. Goodbye, all. We'll arrange details later, shall we? Are you going to take up a life of sin? I shouldn't be surprised. That cold water didn't really do the trick, Mum, did it? Goodbye. Then let's get hold. I've been waiting for her to go. Why? The squire just came in to see me. The fool, the idiotic fool. Then it's true. He thought I knew. And he said it was for the best. And I ought to be told. God, what should this happen to me? Steady, steady. There's no need for you to upset yourself, my boy. Miss Moffat is going to take care of... of what? Of... I'm going to adopt it. What in hell do you take me for? Morgan, swearing? Miss Yarnut, I will swear some more too if people talk to me like that. I'm going to marry her. I knew this would happen. I knew it. Oh, yo. Now you've got it. A telegram. You won the scholarship. First Evans, second Favor Isles, third Starling. Congratulations. <laughs> Lock the school door, Watty, will you? Count the kitchen, Mr. Jones, sir. I'll make you a cup of tea. Thank you, Mr. Watty. Look at me, Morgan. For the first time, we're together. Our hearts are face to face, naked and unashamed, because there's no time to lose, my boy. The clock is ticking and there's no time to lose. If ever anybody has been at the crossroads, you are now... It is no good. I'm going to marry her. And I am going to speak to you very simply. I want you to change suddenly from a boy to a man. If you marry her, you know what will happen, don't you? You will go back to the mine. In a year, she will have left you, both. You will be drinking again, and this time you will not stop. And you will enjoy being this besotted and uncouth village genius who once showed such promise. But it will not be worth it, you know. There is a child living and breathing on this earth. And living and breathing because of me. I don't care if there are 50 children on this earth because of you. You mentioned the word duty, did you? Yes. You have a duty. But it's not to this loose little lady or to her offspring either. You mean a duty to you? No, Morgan Evans, you have no duty to me. Your only duty is to the world. To the world? Now you're going away. There's no harm in telling you something. Going away? Yes. If you're not to marry her, it would be madness for you to come into contact with the child. So if I am adopting the child, you can never come to see me. It's common sense. But you will be staying here. How can I never come back after everything you've done for me? Watching your career will give me complete happiness. I said there's no harm in telling you something. Now, you have brains, shrewdness, eloquence, imagination, and enough personality. And Oxford will give you enough of the graces. For what? Enough to become a great statesman of our country. Oh, it needn't be just politics. It could be more. Much, much more. It could be oh, for a future nation to be proud of it. Perhaps I'm mad, I don't know. We'll see. I know you're absurdly young for such an idea and that so far you've only got the groundwork. I know all that. But I've got the measure of your intellect better than you have yourself up to you. And now doesn't Bessie Watty and her baby seem a little unimportant? Yes. Uh, is it all right to, to ring the bell to say holiday tomorrow? Yes. Fine. Fine. Champion. I'll go and ring it. I think that's all. But I, I don't know what to say. Don't say it. I've been 
so much time in this room. And the lessons are over. I shall always remember. Will you? Well, I'm glad you think you will. Please, Miss Moffat, all the village is out, and they say Morgan would come down to the Penland town wall for Wales to see a real talk. No, nah, him, Dioch. Tid, man, Tid. He'll never forgive you. And please, Miss Moffat, Mr. Jones say, is he to say school day after tomorrow, nine o'clock, same as usual? Nine o'clock, same as usual. Yes, Miss Moffat. Come on, it well. Goodbye, Morgan. I had my heart set on coming up to London and having tea on the terrace. Russia, Morgan, lunch! Russia! I... I... Is he gone? Yes. It's all over. Oh, uh, no, it isn't all over, Mum. Because you're wanted in the kitchen. Bessie sent a gentleman over to see you from the public house. Tell him I can't see anybody. <laughs> you wouldn't understand, Mum. You see... He's only four weeks old. I had forgotten all about that. Poor little fella. Nobody wants him. I only hope nobody will put two and two together, Mum. He's the spit of his father. Oh, this is his birth certificate she sent over. I've got everything else in there and I'll see to the bottle. Come on, Mum. You, you've got to start sometime. Just coming. That's right, Mum. <laughs> Muffet, my girl. You mustn't be clumsy this time. You mustn't be clumsy. The Corn is Green by Emlyn Williams was adapted for radio by T. Roland Hughes. Miss Moffat was played by Gladys Young and Morgan Evans by Richard Burton with Jesse Evans, Philip Phillips, Arthur Phillips, Maisie Amos, Vera Maisie, Llewellyn Edwards, David John Morgan, John Evan Jones, Yorwith Williams and David Richard Owens. The folk songs were sung by the boys of the Aberdare County School under the direction of G.P. Ambrose. It was directed by P. H. Burton back in 1945. Here's Act One of The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill. It begins with a stethoscope, a blood pressure reading, an electrocardiogram, and an altogether satisfying report on the health of Mrs. Ada Canby. Hmm. Well, can't see a thing to complain about, Ada. That little congestion you had last time is all cleared up. All in all, I'd say you're doing fine. For a woman my age, you mean. <laughs> the older the chicken, the tougher it is to kill. <laughs> That's what my grandmother used to tell me, and she lived to be 98. <laughs> Speaking of relatives, you uh, see much of Walter. My grandson? Oh, the usual once-a-year visit, and he always comes up with the same complaint. What's that? That I shouldn't be living all alone. Oh, that big house of yours must get pretty lonely sometimes. Well, the truth is, Dr. George, I'm not alone there. Mm -hmm. You're not? I decided to take in the border last month. Really? I haven't written Walter about it. Uh, I'm sure he'd object to my taking in a stranger, but there's really nothing wrong with Mr. Paulson, except his health, maybe. His uh, health? What's wrong with him? Oh, the poor man's had a terrible cold for the past two weeks. 
Let me do things for him, though. Well, now, where did you meet this Mr. Paulson? He answered the ad I ran. He's just back from South America. Been living in Brazil for years. He's a very nice gentleman, really. He keeps himself and tends his birds. He has the loveliest blue parakeets. You can hear them chirping all over the house. <laughs> it's the friendliest song. Well, I, uh, I don't see anything wrong with what you're doing, Ada. Just make sure you don't go and catch the man's cold. Well, there's not much chance of that. The poor man hardly ever leaves his room. Well, how much do I owe you? I'll send you the bill. I'm sure you'll forget all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Promise me you'll send it. <laughs> oh, dear. Thanks very much. I'm going to try to get some sleep. Well, all right, if you say so. I guess it's time I was in bed myself. <laughs> oh, my, listen to that poor man. I wonder if he keeps his birds awake, too. Mrs. Candy, please. Well, why not? Let's see. Richardson, Richardson. 
it all right. You get a chair on it. Yeah, that's very cute. Oh, no, it just doesn't go some. Well, I'll try Lindell. That wouldn't be as common, I don't suppose. Yes, yes, here it is. There's only about half a dozen, then. Oh, oh my heaven. Lindell and Richardson. Both names together. Lindell and Richardson Investments. Nine Concourse, 4153132. I wonder if... Well, maybe... Maybe it's the only way to be sure. Don't you want to clear his name? 
Have you any proof? Any living witness? Just myself. Forget it, Mrs. Candy. That's my advice to you. The old wound is healed. Don't reopen it. Oh, well, it troubles me so. I haven't thought of anything else since it happened. Perhaps if I saw a minister, if I had some advice from a man of God... Mrs. Candy, now you said something. Now you've shown me the way. That's where our answer lies, dear woman, in prayer. Mm -hmm. In the forgiveness of our dear Lord. Will you pray with me, Mrs. Kenby? Pray? Here? Why not? God is everywhere. Please, join me. (sighs) Dear Lord, tell us what to do. Give us your divine guidance. Show us the path to righteousness. Mr. Stelton, Help us, O Lord. Help us to understand... Teach us to forgive the sins of others and to forget them. To forget. I feel much better now, Mrs. Canby. Do you? I'm not sure. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. Canby. Not to the police, but to the Lord. It's in his hands now. Don't you agree? Well, in a way, that's true. Since they're dead now... All of them. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Candy? Yes? My name's Stuart Winfield, Mrs. Candy. Mm-hmm. I understand you have a room for rent? Yes, 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 I do. Well, I'm new in town. I just arrived from Philadelphia. I've been staying at a hotel, but I'd like something homier. Well, the room I have is $35 a week. I can't offer you any meals, but you can use the kitchen all you want. Well, that sounds good to me. Would uh, Would you like to see the room? Yes, ma'am, I sure would. Well, uh, come on in, ma'am. Thank you. By the way, how did you know I had a room for rent? Hmm? I was going to place an ad this weekend. Oh, I, uh, I, I guess someone at the hotel mentioned it. Uh, I forget just who... Say, this is a real fine old house, Mrs. Candy. Mm -hmm. I can see that I'm going to like this place. Just fine. And so Mrs. Candy has a new boarder. He's a very personable young man. With a great deal more charm than old Mr. Paulson had. Perhaps in a little while, Mrs. Canby will be able to forget her former boarder and the shocking confession he made on his deathbed. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I want to... Stu Winfield took no time at all to make himself at home in Ada Canby's big old house. He loved everything about his room. The fine old four-poster bed. The crazy quilt that Ada herself had sewn up 40 years ago. The lace curtains on the window. He even loved Mr. Paulson's blue parakeet. But what he really seemed to like best was Mrs. Canby herself. Just take me two minutes to get these clean sheets on the bed. Here, let me give you a hand. No, 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 I can manage. I've been making this bed for almost 50 years. 50? You've lived in this house that long? Moved in here when I got married back in 1919. My husband David bought it for us. Our only son, Ralph, was born in it. And you've lost them both? Yes, they're both dead, but I haven't lost them. Oh, yes, yes, I understand, Mrs. Candy. I guess I feel that way about my mom. Your mother's dead? Yes, she died when I was two. Oh. Listen, Mr. Winfield, are you sure you want these birds in your room? Hmm? I could take them to the parlor if you want. No, no, I think they're great. I, I think everything's great about this house. Uh, but there is something you can do for me. What's that? Would you mind not calling me Mr. Winfield? Oh? Uh, that's what they call my father. My name's Stuart. Well, well, all right. Stuart? Dear Walter, I think it's about time I told you that I have a boarder in the house. Mr. Winfield is the nicest young man you could want to meet. He 
is a great deal friendlier than my first gentleman, Mr. Paulson. And he seems to like nothing better than to sit around the evenings and talk. We talk about his home and his parents and his plans for the future. I think the poor boy misses his home and family, and I'm sort of a substitute for all that. Hmm. You know, it isn't really fair, Mrs. Candy. You said I had kitchen privileges, but that doesn't mean you have to cook for me. Well, it's a pleasure, Stuart. I haven't had anyone to cook for in years. You're kidding. You mean to say you cook this good without practice? Oh, you're just being nice. I'm sure that stew is just plain ordinary. It's terrific. No kidding. It, it tastes like, well, it it tastes like home, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it depends on whose home you mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mom cooks stews like this. That's what I meant. Your mom? Mm. Well, but she died when you were only two. Oh, well, I, I guess I, I didn't mean my mom exactly. I, I was thinking of my Aunt Martha. Uh, I mean, she's the one who sort of took over the cooking and stuff after my mother died. And my father's sister, you know? I see. Well, that was lucky that you had someone to take her place. Yeah, that's right. It's... Excuse me. My Stuart, yeah. you're not coming down with anything, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. Just a little case of the sniffle. Listen, if your room isn't warm enough, I have an extra one. No, there. no, the room's just fine. Don't worry about it. Well, you'll be sure now. I know I felt a little guilty about poor Mr. Paulson when he got sick. Well, maybe I didn't take good enough care of him. Uh, Paulson? Mm-hmm. Was that your former boarder, the, uh, the bird lover? Yes, yes, that was his name, the poor man. Well, tell me about him. Well, I don't really know that much about him. He lived here less than two months. Well, what sort of a guy was he? Well, very quiet. He kept to himself. Did you say he was from South America? I don't remember if I did or not. Well, you must have said it. Yeah, yes, of course. He was American, but he'd been living in Brazil. I don't know why exactly. Although, come to think of it, maybe I do. What do you mean? Well, it it just occurred to me that Brazil might be just a place for someone who came into a lot of money and and wanted to leave the country. I don't understand. Oh, uh, uh, I really think you are getting a cold, Stuart. I'm getting that blanket out this minute. Now, wait, Mrs. Candy. I'd rather hear well, about... Never mind. I don't want to take any chances. I'll be right back. Yes, Mrs. Candy. Don't take any chance. Stuart? Yes? Come in. I brought your tray, Stuart. Oh. No, you shouldn't have. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Mrs. Candy. It wasn't a least bit of trouble. Besides, you've got to have some supper. Feed a cold and start the feeling this I mean, I, I was going to come out to the kitchen and, and get myself a sandwich or something. You didn't have to bring it to me. Oh, look at that. Is that roast chicken? Well, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> mm. I hope it tastes all right. The noodle soup with dumplings. Mrs. Candy, you're spoiling me rotten. Do you know that? Yeah, I just thought it would be a good idea if you stayed in bed and took it easy. You weren't planning to go out tonight, were you? No, no, I was just going to stay in and read for a while. Maybe watch television. Oh, that's good. Here, I'll just set this tray down. <laughs> oh, the service here is just too good. Oh, we <laughs> we never uh, never finished our talk the other day about that border of yours, uh, Mr. Paulson. Well, there's not much to say about him, really. Well, you said something about his living in South America. <laughs> you said you thought you understood why he was living there. Sounded real interesting. Well, the truth is, Stuart, there is something to tell about Mr. Paulson. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can help me feel better about it all. About what? Now, I'm not going to tell you if you don't eat. <laughs> all right, Mrs. Candy, I'll, I'll eat. Well... It happened just about three weeks ago. <laughs> you know something, Mrs. Candy? That's about the best roast chicken I've had in years. I'm sure I spoiled your appetite with all my chat. <laughs> no, no, that was a really interesting story. But what do you think of it all, Stuart? Hmm? 
Um, no, the killer is the man who hired Mr. Paulson. Don't you see? Is it right that he should get away with it? No, wait a minute. <laughs> You're jumping to conclusions. No, I'm not. Mr. Paulson told me that he was hired to do this thing. Well, maybe he was hired by Lindell. Maybe Lindell hired him and then Paulson got cold feet and... Lindell did the shooting himself. No, I'm sure that isn't true. You see, I read the newspaper article all about it. Well, you you really were thorough about this, weren't you, Mrs. Candy? <laughs> you poor man. That cold's gone to your chest now, hasn't it? No, I'm all, I'm all right. Stop, stop worrying about me. Let's talk about this. This other problem of yours. Well, maybe I'm making it more of a problem than it should be. Maybe if I just told the police everything, I could forget it once and for all. No, I, uh, I, I really couldn't advise that, Mrs. Candy. Well, it said in the newspaper story that the two men were partners in that investment firm. And Mr. Lindell thought that his partner, Richardson, was cheating, taking money out of the firm... And that's why he's supposed to have shot him. Wasn't there a witness to the shooting? Why, yes, I think there was. Come to think of it, it was Mr. Shelton. That's right, that's right. Well, doesn't that, doesn't that wrap it up for you? Well, it would if it wasn't for Mr. Paulson. Listen, Mrs. Candy, you know how much I like you. Well, in just a few days, you're more like family to me than my Aunt Martha ever was. Now, it's nice of you to say, Stuart. And that's why I want you to listen to me about this. That's why I want you to forget about this whole foolish thing. And then... Listen to you. You sound awful, Stuart. This terrible. Yes, you're not. I'm all right. No, you're not all right. I'm going to get you some cough medicine right this minute. for a few more days, Mr. Chelton. The old lady's beginning to get fidgety, if, if you know what I mean. Well, something tells me that Stuart Winfield isn't such a nice young man after all. Could it be that he wasn't telling Mrs. Canby the truth about his dear mother and his Aunt Martha? Could he have not told her the truth about his plans for the future? Of course, the real issue is, what sort of plan does he have for Ada Canby's future? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. If you want one. Poor Mrs. Canby. She isn't sleeping well tonight. But of course, Mrs. Canby has good reasons for insomnia. Her thoughts are whirling. Her border steward was right. She doesn't want the bother of going to the police. And she firmly believes in the old adage, if you don't trouble trouble, trouble won't trouble you. But still... Oh, my... I'm just never going to get to sleep tonight. <laughs> Poor Stuart. He's still coughing. I'm sure that room is just too dry. I never should have let any borders in until I got the windows fixed. Oh, dear. That poor boy. I'll never forget the terrible night Mr. Paulson was coughing so badly. Huh? And the way he looked. All gray and shrunken. If only I knew he was so sick. No. If only he'd never even come to this house. Mrs. Canby, I'm Jerry Richardson. I'm... Do I ever forget the sound of that man's voice? Lindell is innocent. Lindell is innocent. That poor man. In jail for something he didn't do. Let sleeping dogs lie, Mrs. Candy. My Aunt Martha always said, Let sleeping dogs lie. Oh, if only I could get some sleep. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. Candy, not to the police, not to the 
he talked about God. Praying at his desk. Of course, God is everywhere, but his desk. Paulson wasn't the only guilty one. Someone else was, too. Forgive. 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 Oh, dear Lord. Mr. Shelton. Shelton. What did that newspaper article say? The chief witness against Mr. Lindell was Arnold Shelton. But how could he be a witness? There's something that never happened. How could he be? I'll have to tell someone. I'll have to talk to someone. Yes, I'll tell Stuart about it. In the morning. Stuart, are you awake? Yes, I'm up, Mrs. Candy. Come in. I'm getting breakfast in bed, too. Well, I know you had a terrible night last night, Stuart. You were coughing much worse than ever. I guess that medicine wasn't very good. Sorry I kept you awake, Mrs. Candy. Oh, that wasn't your fault. No. Something else kept me up. What was that? Oh, my mind, I guess. Maybe I should say my conscience. Oh, that sounds serious. <laughs> but it is something serious, Stuart. Well, I might have let a man get away with murder. No, it's even worse than that. He did something worse than murder. You're talking about Paulson again? <laughs> no, I'm talking about the man who hired Mr. Paulson. He didn't just have that man Richardson shot. He let an innocent person go to jail and die there. Now, that's like committing two murders, if you ask me. I have to tell you something that occurred to me last night. Sure, go ahead. Well, it's about Mr. Chelton. Mr. Arnold Chelton. Yeah? Go on. I, I'm listening. Stuart, I wonder if maybe the reason Mr. Chelton was so upset with me, the reason he didn't want me to go to the police, was because he was afraid. Explain what you mean. Well, what I mean is maybe Mr. Shelton had good reason, besides the one he told me. He was working for both Mr. Richardson and Mr. Lundell at the time of the murder. Well, so what? Well, he was also the chief witness at the trial, a witness for the prosecution. But he saw the shooting, didn't he? But that's just the point. He saw Mr. Lundell shoot Mr. Richardson. Well, that's not what you told me last time. I mean, that he was an eyewitness. No, that's right. He didn't actually see the shooting. He was miles away when it happened. I don't quite remember the details. There was something about a phone call, maybe? Yes. Yes, that's what it was. He claimed that Mr. Richardson was talking to him on the phone when Mr. Lindell showed up at his apartment. He said that Richardson cried out something about Lindell having a gun. And then he heard the shot. But how could that have happened if the gun was fired by Mr. Paulson? If, Mrs. Candy, that's the big little word, isn't it? If. <laughs> but don't you see what I'm saying, Stuart? Arnold Chelton had the most to gain. Gain? From what? From both these men leaving the firm. That'll leave the whole thing to him. All those customers, all the investments he handled, all the commissions, or whatever they call it. Are you accusing this guy Shelton of being the killer? Yes. It's, it's the only answer, Stuart. Look, if that was the case, the, <laughs> the police would have figured it out. But they didn't. There was nothing in the stories I read that pointed any suspicion at Mr. Chelton. I don't suppose it even occurred to them. And now, the company is all his. You don't, you don't call that evidence, do you? Well, then why didn't he let me go to the police? 
Why did he try so hard to talk me out? That man was praying to it. He was taking the name of the Lord. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Stuart. I'm so sorry. I won't bother you anymore. I know what I have to do anyway. Candy. I won't wait. be gone long, Stuart. No, no, wait. But the minute I get back, I'm going to call Dr. George and ask him to come over. You're sick. Never mind the doctor. You're calling the police. No, no, I won't call them. You're right. I don't put them tracking mud in my parlor. I'm going down to the station house and talk to them. I'll get dressed now and go straight there. Please, please think about what you're doing. I'll tell them what I know and they can do the rest. Now you try to eat something, Stuart. Please. Mrs. Candy. <coughs> What is this, Winfield? I told you not to call me at the office. It's an emergency. <laughs> you sound terrible. What's the matter with you? I'm sick. Only you're going to be a lot sicker. What are you talking about? The old lady. I can't stop her. She's decided to talk. What? She figured it out. Figured out exactly what you did, Sheldon, and how you did it. You fool. You've got to stop her. Do you hear me? That wasn't part of the deal, Sheldon. It's all of the deal now. The price didn't include anything like that. The price just mm. doubled. Mm. Old ladies mm. are always having accidents. Mm. Make her have one. Make her have one now, Winfield. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. She's going to... She's going to have a fall down there in the cellar steps. Right now. <laughs> I gotta get my robe on and my slippers. I, I've gotta hurry. <laughs> Is that you? Open up, Mrs. Candy. Stuart <laughs> Wimsey, what are you doing out of bed? Now, you go right back there this second. I got I to gotta talk to you, Mrs. Candy, before you go to the police. Just listen to you. You're all winded. You can hardly talk, Stuart. Now, go back to bed before you catch pneumonia, too. Now, don't go, Mrs. Candy. It would be better if you never went to the police. Better for you. Better for me. For you? I don't understand. Well, then I... I wouldn't have to hurt you, Mrs. Candy. <laughs> That's what I mean. I wouldn't have to do anything bad to you. Stuart, what in the world are you talking about? Come on, old lady. You're, not... You're smart, all right. You really think things through. So now, think a little harder. You knew? <laughs> Stuart, you knew about Mr. Paul. That's right. That's how you knew my room was so wrecked, because uh, Mr. Shelton told you. Now you're getting there, Mrs. Candy. And that's why you rented it. That's why you were sent here. Just to watch you, Mrs. Candy. Just to see oh, that you yes. stayed sensible. Mr. Shelton. <laughs> Mr. Shelton did. I was hoping you'd never change your mind about calling the police. No, I didn't want this part of it. This isn't the part I like. Oh, let me go. Just relax, oh, Mrs. Candy. Just take it easy. Right in the better, Mrs. Candy. Just like my Aunt Martha would have been if I if I had an Aunt Martha. Please, please. We've got a date now, Mrs. Candy. But I've got to fight, Mrs. Candy. I'm sick, remember? Just shut your eyes. Please. Shut your eyes and don't look down. Oh, Stuart, don't stare. Shut your eyes, old lady. Hey, 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 old lady. Wasn't you at the bottom of those stairs? Well, will he be all right, Doctor George? Now, what do you want to worry about that man for? Uh, Truth is, his injuries don't amount to very much. 
couple of broken ribs seem to be the worst of it. But he'll be a patient for some time before they can put him in prison where he belongs. Him and his, uh, friend. What was that man's name again? You mean Mr. Chatham? Have they arrested him? Yeah, yeah. That's what the police detective said. I don't understand. Stuart's injuries aren't safe. It's not the fall that made Winfield so sick. His case was diagnosed as simple pneumonia at first. And then I remembered about your first border. Nelson, was it? No, of course. Yes, Nelson. But he had pneumonia, too. He died of it. Oh, is, is pneumonia contagious? Yes, yes, it is, but... This disease was even more contagious. It's a pneumonia caused by a disease called psittacosis, better known as parrot fever. Uh, you get it from sick birds, like the parakeets in your spare room. Oh, no. Mr. Parsons, bird? Sorry, Ada, but it had to be taken out and destroyed. Oh, what a shame. There's one reason I... Uh, I feel sorry for him. They saved your life. Made Mr. Winfield too weak even to throw a little old lady down a flight of steps. Uh, those poor little creatures. Yeah, but you can be grateful they didn't make you sick, too. Mm. Carrot fever is so contagious that no more than one person in a thousand could be exposed to it and escape infection. It was pretty darn close to a miracle, they do. Yeah. We're hard to kill, Doctor. Remember? The old ones are hard to kill. They say that people are living longer than ever before. And when we look at Ada Canby, we can understand why. She's a tough old lady. So tough she could withstand the threats of man, beast, and birds. So let that be a warning to all those who think that our senior citizens are easy prey for crime. Watch out. They may turn the tables on you. Or the stairs. I'll be back shortly. final comment for you on behalf of Ada Canby and old people everywhere. There's a saying, there's no fool like an old fool. But it's also true that there's no wisdom and strength like old wisdom and strength. There. Does that make you feel better about your next birthday? Our cast included Agnes Moorhead, Leon Janney, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Where are we? Nowhere. Perhaps you are nowhere, Mr. Peterson. Okay, tell me where you are. I have faith. I believe Tom will be found, or he will find himself, and he will have an absolutely reasonable and rational explanation. I hope so. Tom, darling, Tom, what happened to you? I was so scared. Oh, darling, you're all right. Teddy, are you all right? Yes. I don't understand. I happened to tune in the news, and there it was. Tom Parsons' accountant with offices in the Barstow building had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Tom, I was so worried. Mr. Parsons was driving with his wife. He stepped out of the car to clean off the rear window, and... Teddy, what did you tell them? I wasn't in the car with you. I was at home. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Tonight, Canada Dry, the campaign of ginger ales, presents a series of programs to advertise the new made-to-order Canada Dry, which you can now buy by the glass at drug stores and soda fountains. This series will feature George Olson and his music, Miss Ethel Chute, the star of many Broadway successes, and that suave comedian, dry humorist, and famous master of ceremonies, Jack Benny. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thorgerson. That's pretty good from a man who doesn't even know me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Benny talking and making my first appearance on the air professionally. By that, I mean I'm finally getting paid, which, of course, will be a great relief to my creditors. I, uh, I really don't know why I'm here. I'm supposed to be a sort of a master of ceremonies and tell you all the things that will happen, which would happen anyway. I must introduce the different artists who could easily introduce themselves and also talk about the Canada Dry made to order by the glass, which is a waste of time, as you know all about it. You drink it, like it, and don't want to hear about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, a master of ceremonies is really a fellow who is unemployed and gets paid for it. I think you will like the entertainment arranged for tonight, I hope. Of course, I haven't seen any of the program myself, but I've spoken to the artists individually. They seem to think it's awfully good. The uh, first number will be a selection by George Olson and his orchestra. I think this uh, being our first program together, it is no more than fair that I have you meet Mr. Olson personally. He's really a very charming fellow and one of the few directors who comes to and from his work on roller skates. That's perhaps the silliest thing that I'll say all night, I think. I, um, I might add that Mr. Olson is very, very handsome. I told you, George, I'd get that in. I, but as long as we are both on the air, of course, I won't have to worry about that. Oh, George, uh, come here. I want you to say hello to the folks. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, that was George Olson, ladies and gentlemen. He uh, rehearsed that speech all week. You know, uh, this is really all play with George. He doesn't have to work at all. I might say that uh, Mr. Olson is one of the wealthiest conductors in America. You know what I mean. He owns his own car. Of course, the other boys are in debt, too. Uh, George, uh, what kind of a car have you? A Saxon. A what? A Saxon. A Saxon, huh? Well, that was my fault for bringing it up at all. I... Uh, is it a new one, is it? Oh, yes, a very late model. I see. Well, you must have been in this country a long time now, haven't you, Georgia? <laughs> yes. Yeah, say, by the way, Jack, what kind of a car have you? Me? I have a bicycle built for two. I mean, now, you can't go back any further than that, I think. Well, George, I think we ought to get started. What's the first number? I beg your pardon, mademoiselle. It's a French number, Jack. Do you like French numbers? Do I? Mon duck, mon duck. <laughs> important directing that orchestra, you know, with the baton in your hand. I don't know, there's something about all you fellas when you stand there waving that stick in the air. 
It's thrilling, you know. One thing I'd like to know, George, if the band didn't show up, what would you do with that stick? Why, I'd throw it away and do what you're doing. <laughs> Always kidding. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I present a young lady who is a star of many New York productions, Miss Ethel Chute. Uh, you will remember Miss Chute best in Whoopi playing opposite Eddie Cantor. Is it all right for me to mention Cantor's name here? Everybody else does. Uh, Ethel, come over and say hello. Oh, hello. Wasn't that clever? <laughs> oh, she does a lot of things like that. You'd be surprised. And Miss Chute is going to sing for her. She has a beautiful voice, too. She has a sort of a nervous soprano. You know what I mean? She, in fact, last week she had her nose lifted so she could be heard in Philadelphia. <laughs> and, uh, oh, by the way, here's a little news for you. It might interest you. Miss Chute is really Mrs. George Olson. Although I wouldn't go as far as to say that that's the reason she happens to be on this program. Nevertheless, she's Mrs. George Olson. Such a nice girl, too. I'm surprised that she's married to Olson. And now, uh, Mr. Tay will sing, uh, I Found a Million Dollar Baby. I still feel a little Frenchy tonight, Ethel, so it's Mon Ducks to you, too. <laughs> forgot to mention that Miss Chute was assisted by Fran Fry. Of course, I'm lucky that I remember anything tonight. Uh, but you know, folks, all the time Miss Chute was singing, I kept thinking of my girl. You know, I get so sentimental. I really have a girl. She lives in Newark, New Jersey. You know, the girl I go with when I'm in Newark? 
She's not what you call good looking exactly. In fact, she's quite homely, but then she can't stay in the house all the time. I, I, I imagine you folks have seen her pictures in different magazines. You know, she poses for the beauty ads entitled Before Taking. And she um, comes from a very fine family, although her father very often partakes of the forbidden beverage. It's all right for me to mention that as they have no radio. In fact, her father drank everything in the United States and then went up north to drink Canada Dry. <whistles> Boy, I'm glad I thought of that, Joe. You know, the one about Canada Dry? I'm really supposed to mention it occasionally. After all, I, I owe it to my sponsors and they might be listening in. Uh, seriously, though, do you realize, folks, that if you want a drink of Canada Dry, we'll say just a glass. You don't have to buy it in the bottle. You can walk into any drugstore or soda fountain that has that big sign, Canada Dry, made to order, ask for a glass and get it. I know you always have it in your home in bottles, but isn't it nice to know that you don't have to wait until you get home to drink it? Gee, I thought I did that pretty well for a new salesman, eh? I suppose nobody will drink it now. And now, folks, a very stirring number called I Love a Parade with a vocal refrain by the Messrs. Fran Fry, Bobby Borger, and Bob Wright. That was I Love a Parade, ladies and gentlemen. The kind of a number that grips and thrills you, gives you that great feeling of patriotism, and makes you glad that you're an American. Personally, it didn't bother me very much because I took a nap while the boys were playing it. Uh, now, folks, in case you've forgotten, this is Jack Benny again. You know, the Canada Dry Humorist. Say, I thought that was good. The Canada Dry Humorist. I made that up myself, huh? It sounds like it. Uh, that witty retort was by George Olson, ladies and gentlemen, proving again that he is still an orchestra leader. At that, uh, George has a great sense of humor. Say, he told me a, st a story the other day. Do you mind if I tell it, George? I'll give you credit for it, you know. It's really supposed to be true, too. It's about George's uncle, who had been ill for a long time. He had what you call labor poisoning. You know what I mean? He just would couldn't stand working. So his doctor finally told him that he would have to get a lot of fresh air, do outside work, but not lift anything heavy. He told him that at no time was he to lift anything heavy. So his uncle got a job as a garbage man in Scotland. 
Funny, I... Funny, you know, I never heard that one before, but the thing that kills me is Olsen telling a Scott story. I mean, because George, you know, is no senseless himself. He, in fact, he invited me to dinner the other night, much to his own surprise, and he paid the check with a $5 bill that was in his pocket so long that Lincoln's eyes were bloodshot. <laughs> That's a fact. Uh, however, he will now favor us with that very popular song hit called Paradise. After all, why should his orchestra be an, an exception? <laughs> George Olson speaking. Uh, by this time, I know you're thoroughly bored listening to Jack Den, uh, Den Ber, Bru, uh, well, our master ceremonies and his alleged Canada Dry humor and telling you all about made to order Canada Dry. We also have a product to sell. It's music. And may we show you now just how we make music. Listen, everyone, we're going to show you how we all make music. Now, first there's Wally, he sure plays some with two little sticks and beats on his drum. And that's how we make music. Now we have the boys with their violin. Their bows go back and forth when they beat in. And the drums. Now the trumpets play loud and shrill, but when they get going, they'll give you a thrill. And the violin and the drums. The old trombone slides up and down. When he gets hot, he goes to town. And the trumpet, and the violin, and the drum. When we want to shiver, a quiver, or a groan, we call upon the boys with the saxophone. And the trombone, and the trumpet, and the violin, and the drum. Please, please, now, when we want some rhythm, where do we go? Why, it's old Bob Rice with his old banjo. And the saxophone and the trombone, the trumpet, the violin, and the drum. Oh, the cow is now a little birdie. All right. Now, the next old fella can't be beat. You know him well. It's Piccolo Pete. And the banjo and the saxophone, the trombone, the trumpet, the violin, and the drum. Okay, Ben Bernie, if you like it. That's it. Now we have the piano for cadences and such. All he needs is a very light touch. 
and the piccolo, and the banjo, and the saxophone, and the trombone, and the trumpet, and the violin, and the drum. So are you, so are you. Now the old bass fiddle plays way down low. He has to get a Derrick to move his bow. And the piano, and the piccolo, and the banjo, and the saxophone, and the trombone, the trumpet, the violin, and the drum. Hey, please. Bass, piano, piccolo, banjo, saxophone, trombone, trumpet, violin. Now that's how we make you. That was cute, George. I mean, babies will like it anyway. I think. And, um, uh... That, ladies and gentlemen, is the way these boys make music. Now, if they could only play it. Uh, Mr. Olson will now play Come West, Little Girl, Come West. And I'm supposed to sing a chorus of this number. And do you know, folks, that six months ago, I couldn't sing a note. Really, I could not sing a note. But after taking three glasses every day of Canada Dry made to order ginger ale, I still am unable to sing and can't even sign a note. So the moral of this is drink that champagne of ginger ale, Canada Dry, and don't worry about signing notes. So for want of a better soloist, Miss Chute will sing, Come West, little girl, come west. I'm going east. I love to hear a cowboy sing like a cowboy sings when he's blue. Round the campfire on the range when his daily work is through. If I could hear a certain love song, what memories it would bring. I can't forget that love song the cowboys used to sing. The sun will set, the moon will rise. But I want to look in my baby's eyes. Come west, little girl. Come west. The breeze will blow, the stars will be. But I'm too lonesome to go to sleep. Come west, little girl. Come west. So oh, don't be pining. Way, way down here. You know my love here for you will increase. I love the west, it's full of charm, but I rest best in my baby down. Come west, little girl, come west. The sun will set, the moon will rise, but I'm in my baby's eyes Come west, little girl Come west The breeze will blow The stars will be But I'm too lonesome To go to sleep Come west, little girl Come west So don't be pining Away, away down here my love here for you will increase. Along the way, it's full of sun, but I rest best in my baby's arms. Come west, little Hello, everybody. This is Kate Smith, or uh, Jack Benny talking. I mean, you see how nervous I am? I mean, not so much because I'm broadcasting, but I think all my relatives are listening in, and I don't want them to know that I'm working. Uh, although I have, uh, I have an older brother that I'm quite fond of. I mean, we get along great. We sort of share everything together. I mean, what's mine is his, and what's his is his, you know. I, uh, although I, this has absolutely nothing to do with Canada Dry Made to Order. I keep getting entirely off the subject. But don't forget, folks, that you can walk into your neighborhood drugstore, or any drugstore. I mean, after all, I don't care what drugstore you walk into. I'm just the master of ceremonies here, that's all. I mean, if I'm going to have to worry about things like that, you know, I'll have my hands full. But go into any drugstore and order a glass, mind you. Not a bottle, but a glass of made-to-order Canada Dry ginger ale and stagger out. 
Isn't it funny the things you can buy today in a drugstore? I went in for an aspirin the other day and came out with a new hat. I, I, I imagine the uh, next number will be by George Olson. He's about to make his first appearance on this program. In fact, I'm lucky to get in here at all. Uh, this is called Drums in My Heart. And boys, try and finish this all together if you can. Please. Drums in my heart, Ladies and gentlemen, was the last number on our first program on the 2nd of May. Are you sleeping? Huh? I hope you'll be with us again Wednesday. In fact, I hope I'll be here Wednesday. George, so we all hope that we'll be here Wednesday. Well, good night then. All aboard, the way we go. Get that little lady on the train, boy. All aboard. concluding the first program in a new series sponsored by Canada Dry. The ginger ale now available made to order at drug stores and soda fountains as well as in bottles. Canada Dry has presented Jack Benny, Ethel Coupe, and George Olson and his music. The same group of artists will be with you at this time Wednesday evening. Drums in My Heart from Through the Years was played tonight with the special permission of the copyright owner. This is the National Broadcasting Company. WJZ New York.
gentlemen, a half hour of sparkling entertainment by Canada Drive, the champagne of ginger ale. It's holiday time, time for gaiety and good cheer. And whether you are celebrating at home or at one of the many fine hotels, clubs, or restaurants, Canada Dry adds joy and sparkle to your festivities. Canada Dry is a real ambassador of holiday spirit. This program stars Jack Benny, the Canada Dry humorist, and Ted Weems' orchestra. And Ted Weems opens the program with Rise and Shine from Take a Chance. <laughs> done by the other programs on the air tonight, I want to wish you all a very happy new year. And before going any further, I'd like to present to you our first guest star of the evening, who must rush away as he is a day late now. He has graciously consented to say his last few words on the Canada Dry program, and I might now take the honor and pleasure in introducing to you that genial old gentleman, Father Time of Times Square. Father Time. Ladies and gentlemen of the Canada Dry audience, I am Father Time. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's laughing, folks, but he's worried. <laughs> of course, you know, friends, that yesterday was to have been my last day on this earth. Mm -hmm. But owing to a very special request made by our good friend, Mr. Benny, I postponed the occasion until tonight. Uh, darn sweet of you, Dad. Don't darn mention sweetie. it. Don't mention it, Jack. I just want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that I did the best that I could these past 365 days mm -hmm. to bring cheer and happiness into your lives. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've missed the spots. I'll say you did, Pop. Mm -hmm. But at least I made the effort. And now all I can say is that I wish you all a very happy and prosperous... Oh, I'm getting weaker. You better take the microphone, Jack. Brace up, old man. Brace up. Oh. Paul, Paul, quick. Give him some ginger ale right away. Here you are, Father Time. Take a sip of this Canada Dry ginger ale. Made to order by the glass. Quiet, Paul. Here you are, Dad. Now, now, how do you feel? Hello, everybody. It's 1933 and ready to go. Another victory for Canada Dry. Hooray. Ah, uh, so you're 1933, eh? Yes. Say, will you do me one favor, 1933? What's that? Please, in this coming year, we don't want to hear any more about Gandhi going on diet. Okay, Jack. Hooray! Well, well, anyway, folks, this is a new year, and we're all happy. But personally, I'm glad that the excitement is over. I really am. Well, Jack, you talk as though the holidays were a big strain on you. What did Christmas really cost you? Well, to tell you the truth, Paul, I spent a lot of money. I mean, like a big fool, I bought handkerchiefs for Durante, earmuffs for Gable, and a pair of shoes for Garbo, you know? I mean, that would break anybody. And by the way, Paul, that was a nice combination greeting card you sent me. Well, it was just a single card, Jack. Well, I mean the combination of thoughts. You know, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Easter greetings. You forgot to mention the Fourth of July and Columbus Day. Jack, well, anyway. Jack, hmm? did you make any resolutions this year? I made one, Mary, and here it is. Resolve that I, Jack Benny, shall during the coming year refrain from smoking, drinking, swearing, and staying up late at night. 
You really mean that? I certainly do. Then you might as well take this crocheting outfit. You'll need it more than I will. <laughs> you know, Jack, I made some New Year's resolutions, too. Yeah, what were they, Mary? Well, I hereby resolve to stop going out with other fellows to make you jealous. Mm -hmm. Except... Elmo, Red, and Parker. I see. Because I think they're swell. That's nice. Uh, you'll be the lone wolfess. <laughs> I'm not going to be narrow-minded, Jack. During the coming year, you can buy all my dinners. I can. You resolve that, Mary. Uh-huh. Well, dissolve it. See, a girl can't even make a resolution. No. Say, hey, Jack, I made a resolution, too. What is that, Ted? I hereby resolve during the coming year to stop lending people money. <laughs> not because you owe me $5, Jack. Don't get me wrong. No, 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 sure not. Go right ahead. I hope I haven't offended you. No, Ted, but if I don't speak to you for the rest of the year, don't think it's on account of this. You know? And, Jack, what? I made a resolution, too. Why, Andrea, I don't remember borrowing any money from you. Oh, I wasn't going to mention that, Jack. Oh. But I resolved to sing more and better songs during the coming year. I thank you. You're welcome, and she will. That was good, Andrea. Say, Paul, what did you resolve? That Canada, Canada Dry is the champagne of ginger, ginger ale, and you'll get a better nickel back on each large bottle. Ted, I resolve that you play something before Paul makes any further resolutions. <laughs> Outstanding achievements and personalities of the past year. We are very fortunate tonight in having up here some of the unusual guest stars who have appeared on our Canada Dry program during the year 1932. Of course, you all remember the marvelous tribute paid to Miss Amelia Earhart last summer, following her history making solo flight to Ireland. Thousands of people lined the street and showered her with ticker tape. And when she picked up the ticker tape and saw how her securities had dropped, she wanted to fly back to Ireland. Well, anyway, with all due credit to our courageous heroine, Miss Earhart, we have with us this evening a young lady who also deserves honorable mention. A lady who not only flew to Ireland, but upon reaching Ireland, immediately swam across the English Channel and got to France just in time to win the Ladies' Open Golf Championship. What a flight, what a swim, and what a game. Now, in the golf match, she uh, went around the Paddy de Fogra course, uh, making the, uh, yeah, I could hardly pronounce that, making the round of 18 holes in 21, 17 holes in one, and one birdie. Now top that, all of you golfers who talk a good game. And now we will have a few words from the champion of champions, Miss Violet Ray. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss Ray is wearing a beautiful low-cut evening gown and is appearing almost in the flesh. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I present Violet Ray, which is certainly a treatment. <laughs> Miss Ray, if you please. I am very happy to be here tonight. And all I can say is that I owe all my success to Slippery Elm Bath Soap. Miss Ray, please. please. Oh, I owe all my success to Canada Dry Ginger Ale sold in large five-glass bottles. There you are, folks, and we didn't even ask her. But you promised me that if I said now, Canada Ray, Dry... Now, Miss Ray, Miss uh, Ray, tell the folks... Tell the folks how you accomplished that wonderful flight across the Atlantic. Well, 
I took a pound of ordinary flour, added some water, and stirred it. Then I simply added the yolks of three eggs and some sugar. That's very interesting. When Andrea Marr singing Remember Me. And now let me refresh your memory once more. Uh, some of you may remember during the week of August 1st, we had on our program two of the world's greatest trained dogs who were awarded... California, Monday, March 29th. The Lux Radio Theater presents George Burns and Gracie Allen in Dulcie, featuring Elliot Nugent, Howard Lindsay, Norma Lee, and Wallace Clark. <laughs> Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars... George Burns and Gracie Allen, Elliot Nugent, Howard Lindsay, Norma Lee, and Wallace Clark. Our guests, 
Elsa Maxwell, entertainer of International Society, and Hedda Hopper, famous actress and Hollywood personality. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. This program comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, those gentle, marvelously effective soap flakes in whose behalf we welcome you all to Hollywood and to the 126th production of the Lux Radio Theater. Our play tonight, Dulcie. Our stars, George Burns and Gracie Allen. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes. If you haven't tried the Lux way of cutting down stocking runs, the recent experience of Mrs. John Powers of Long Island may persuade you to. Here is what Mrs. Powers said. A group of us decided to make a simple test. See if we actually could cut down stocking runs by Lux washing. We each took a pair of stockings, washed one regularly with Lux Flakes, the other we rubbed with cake soap. Then we kept careful records of runs. We found Lux cut down on runs amazingly. The average was 72%. Lux flakes do cut down runs because they save the elasticity of silk. Why not try this easy Lux way of getting longer wear from your hosiery? Start using Lux flakes tonight. And now, our producer, a man who for 25 years has been famous the world over for several of the greatest films in motion picture history. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. With their own romance, George Burns and Gracie Allen changed the movie formula of boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl, to girl meets boy, girl gets boy, girl loses her mind. Employed in the New Jersey office, Gracie's quota of silly answers was no higher than that of the average secretary when George Burns came along and convinced her that they should go into vaudeville together. Four years later, George said, why don't we get married? Gracie, in characteristic fashion, replied, who'd have us? <laughs> but in spite of that, George's civil question led to a civil ceremony. And now Gracie is not only Mrs. George Burns, she's the divine dunce of screen and radio and was recently voted one of the best-dressed women in the world. Tonight's play, Dulce, is remarkable not only for its comedy, but because it was the first conspicuous success of George S. Kaufman and Mark Connolly as writers, and Lynn Fontaine as actress, uh, as, as leading lady, Howard Lindsay as a director, and Elliot Nugent as an actor. Today, Mr. Lindsay is one of Paramount's ablest writers, Mr. Nugent a noted Hollywood director. But both of them become actors again as they join Burns and Allen in tonight's performance with two other film personalities who were in the original cast, Norma Lee, now Mrs. Nugent, and Wallace Clark. This evening, Gracie becomes Mrs. Dulcinea Smith, wife of that paragon of patience, jo uh, Gordon Smith, played by George Burns. Mr. Nugent will be heard as William Parker, Mr. Clark as C. Roger Forbes, Norma Lee as Angela Forbes, and Mr. Lindsay as Vincent Leach. And now... We loosen the straitjackets and let the players out of their padded cells as the Lux Radio Theater presents George Burns and Gracie Allen in Dulce, <laughs> featuring Elliot Nugent, Wallace Clark, Norma Lee, and Howard Lindsay. <laughs> uh, it's late afternoon of a midsummer day. On a road leading out of New York City, a small blue roadster weaves quickly through the heavy traffic. At the wheel is Gordon Smith, and beside him his brother-in-law, Bill Halloway. They are bound for Gordon's house in Westchester. As they reach the open road, the car swerves sharply, avoiding an accident by inches. Hey, take it easy, will you, Gordon? Sorry, I guess I'm in too much of a hurry. I'll say you are. What's the big rush? Oh, nothing. Just anxious to get home, that's all. Oh, I had a tough day at the office today. Well, you'll have a tougher one if you pile up in a ditch. That's better. Well, how's the artificial jewelry business, if any? Not so hot, Bill. No? Anything new on the Forbes merger? No, it's coming along. If the deal goes through, I'll get 16 and two-thirds percent of the combine. Oh, do you, do you think that's enough, Gordon, 16 and two-thirds? No, it isn't. But I'm up against it, and I've got to take what he gives me. Forbes is a tough customer. That's hard luck. Of course, I might be able to do something with him over the weekend. He's coming out to the house, too, you know. Your sister invited him. Yeah, so she told me. 
Well, Dulcie always did like guests. Yeah, I know. Uh, Forbes is bringing his wife and uh, daughter, isn't he? I guess so. I didn't know you knew them that well. Well, I don't accept Forbes in a business way. Wasn't my idea until the little woman thought of it. You know how your sister is. Oh, sure. When Dulcie makes up your mind that she wants to do something, you do it. Mm, that's one of the reasons why I want to get home. If they get there ahead of us and Dulcie gets talking to them, well, anything can happen. Uh, and it always happens to me. And if I know Dulcie, it'll be plenty. Step on it, Gordon. Go ahead in, Bill. Yeah, thanks. Gee, it's good to get home. I guess they aren't here yet. I beg pardon, sir. Huh? Who are you? I'm the butler, sir. The butler? I must be in the wrong house. Oh, no, sir. Mrs. Smith engaged me this afternoon, sir. Oh, well, I'm Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. Mrs. Smith described you in some detail, sir. Huh? May I take your hat, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Very good, sir. Can you imagine that? I turn my back and she hires a butler. I guess she had to make an impression on the Forbes. Mm. Oh, hello, Gordon. Imagine me. You here it certainly is a small house. We ha uh, Who's that with you? Your brother. Oh, oh sure. Hello, Willie. Hello, Dulcie. Oh, Gordon, darling, how are you feeling? Well, you are, huh? My, isn't it hot? It certainly is. Mm. Did you have a nice day at the office today? Uh, well, not so bad. Nice and cool in here, though. Maybe that's in the kind of the cold air. But yeah. I always say it's the old breeze that doesn't blow in this room. Mm. Ring for Henry, will you, darling? I want to put these flowers in water. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who is this fellow, Henry? Well, Henry, why, darling, didn't you meet him? He's the butler. I know, I know. He introduced himself at the door, but who is he? Where did you get him? Well, if you promise not to tell, yes. uh, he's a reformed convict. What? A reformed convict? Shh, not so loud. He's very sensitive. Yeah, well, so am I. And I don't like the idea of having a second-story man polishing off the silverware. Oh, he wouldn't steal anything, Gordon. Uh, he's going straight now. He hasn't taken hardly a thing since he got out of prison. When was that? Last week. I see. Well, anyway, we've got to have a butler, darling. But, Dulcie... Uh, <clears throat> we're having guests, Willie. Mm -hmm. Very important guests for the weekend. Guess who's coming? The Forbes. Who told you? You did? Oh, you guessed it. Yes, there'll be uh, Mr. and Mrs. Forbes and his wife. And Angela. Angela's their daughter, you know. And sweet, why, she's just the sweetest thing. Yes, uh, oh, isn't she? Oh, Willie, uh, what do you mean? You don't know her. Of course I do. I've known her for years. Oh. <laughs> well, what's oh. funny about that, Dulcie? Well, he didn't know I never knew he knew. Isn't that funny? <laughs> or is it? Uh, yes, dear, it is. Well, now let me see. The pink room for Angela and the red room for Mr. and Mrs. Forbes. Mm, I'd better have the green room made up for Skylar Van Dyke. Skylar Van Dyke? Yeah, one of the Van Dykes, and he's worth millions. Skylar Van Dyke is coming here. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Oh, he's a marvelous man. You, you'd never think he was a Van Dyke. He's so democratic. When did you meet him? Well, this afternoon. He was at Mrs. Kennedy's. He had a lot of other invitations, but he accepted mine. But, Dulcie, having this man here with Forbes, how do you know they like each other? Oh, they will. Mr. Van Dyke's a businessman, too, darling. He owns all kinds of things. Railroads? Uh, uh, railroads, I think. Well, anyhow, it's something like railroads. Roads, he'll help entertain Mr. Forbes. Isn't that a pleasant surprise? You know, Gordon, one thing Dulcie never learned is the difference between a surprise and a shock. Oh, Willie, you're saying silly things to try to mix me up. Okay, I think I'll go upstairs and wash a little. Yeah, that's right, dear. I want you to look nice and clean for our guests. See you later. Bringing in a Mr. Van Dyke to entertain Mr. Forbes. Dulcie, Forbes isn't the kind of a man who wants to be entertained. All right, dear, then Van Dyke can entertain Mr. Leach. Well, that's better. Mr. Leach? Who was Mr. Leach? Vincent Leach. You know, the big moving picture writer. Oh, yes. Is he coming here? Yes. Isn't that wonderful? I'm not so sure. First you invite Mr. Van Dyke, next you invite Vincent Leach. Ah, there's the secret. Look, Dulcie, let's not make a game of this. I don't... Oh, well, you see, dear, Vincent and Angela like each other. Vincent and Angela? Yes. You mean Forbes' daughter? Yes, isn't it wonderful? So I invited them both here so they'll have the whole weekend together. <laughs> you never can tell what'll happen. That's what I'm afraid of. <clears throat> Dulcie, you don't know Angela so well, and this man, Leach, what do you know about him? I know all about him. He's a big scenario writer, and just the man for Angie. He, he, he's so practical, and she's single. Uh, opposite should marry, you know that, darling. Yes, I know that. But why are you so anxious to match this fellow Leach with Angela? What do you care about well, it? don't you see? Yes, I see. But can't you guess? Yes, I can guess. All right, then I'll tell you. Good. If Angie likes Mr. Leach and marries him, yes. and I fixed it, well, well, that'll make Mr. Forbes so grateful that he'll have to give you more than 16 and two-thirds of the percentage. 
I wish you'd stay out of my business. Well, sure, that's what a wife's for. Now, I figured it all out by myself. But, Dulcie... Oh, Gordon, darling, don't be upset about it. I know they ought to marry. I just know it. It's, it's a woman's intuition. Just as I knew I ought to marry you, dear. It was because I loved you, darling, and wanted to help you, and... and yes, yes, and... yes, and you do help me, but you don't understand, dear. Try and see my position. Well, all I can see is that Mr. Forbes is taking advantage of you, and I'm not going to let him, that's all. But that isn't the point. In the position that I'm in, I have to go ahead with it. Don't you see, dear, if I'm not in that merger, I'll lose everything. Well, only 16 and two-thirds percent is such a funny number, too. I don't see why you couldn't get a nice even number like 25 or 50. Dulcie, 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 you've got to listen to me. Let me talk to Forbes about a higher percentage. Maybe he'll acquiesce. Well, he might try to, but he won't get away with it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Forbes is my name. Yes, sir. Just step right in, please. Come on, Eleanor. Yes, dear. Angela? This way, please. My... What a lovely room, isn't it, Angela? Yes, the whole place is lovely. Hmm. Nobody here. Looks like they came too early. Oh, no, sir. Mrs. Smith asked me to say that she'd be down directly. All right, all right. Not at all, sir. Excuse me, please. Hmm. Well, nice reception. Now, please, Charlie. What do you mean? Oh, don't be a bear, Father. Try to be pleasant for once. Well, why should I? I didn't want to come down here in the first place. I could have done my business with Gordon Smith in New York. I know, dear. But a nice weekend down here in the country would be weekend? very... Weekend? What do I care about a weekend? I'm a businessman, not a playboy. You know how I despise golf and tennis and all that truck. Well, we're here now, Father, and you might as well make the best of it. I didn't care so much about coming myself, if you want to know. Oh, you didn't? No, not particularly. I'd rather have stayed in town. Oh. Where you can see that half-baked moving picture writer, I suppose. My father. Oh, I know all about it. You've been seeing him almost every day, and I don't like it, do you hear? I don't like it at all. Why not? Mr. Leach is a very nice young man. Mr. Leach is a young fool. Well, how can you say that? You've never even met him. No, but I've heard about him. That was enough for me. Charlie, please don't excite yourself. You know it's bad for you. Come over here and... And sit down. Now, sit down right here. I hate those soft chairs. They're bad for my back. Well, look who's here, Mr. and Mrs. Ford. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, Mrs. Ford, I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting. Oh, it's quite all right. Oh, and Mr. Ford. Well, how are you? Oh, all right, I guess. And Angela. How are you, Mrs. Smith? Oh, now, where is Gordon? Gordon! Yes, Dulcie. Oh, how there you are. Oh, hello, Mr. Forbes. Oh, hello, hello, Mrs. Forbes. Well, hello, Mrs. did you have a nice drive out from the city, Mr. Forbes? Awfully pretty, isn't it? Uh, yes, I guess so. Did you all come out together, or did you drive? Why, uh, oh, I, I don't know. Uh, we came through Hops. Oh, there. that's the short way. Now, you should have come the long way. That's quicker. No, no, I think that is the long way, isn't it, Hartsdale? Yes. Well, it really no. doesn't matter. No, no, both ways are awfully pretty. Sit down, Mr. Forbes. Uh, thank you. Oh, no, no, not in that chair. That's the hard chair. Uh, yeah, but I prefer the hard oh, chair. Oh, no, no, don't sit, Mr. Forbes. You sit right down in this nice soft chair. Now, Go please. Ahead, now, there. Now, please. Oh, <laughs> Why, Mr. Forbes? It's his back. He's been having a little trouble with it lately. Are you all right, Mr. Forbes? I hope so. Oh, of course he's all right. Nice and comfy. Oh, Angela, have I a surprise to you, or will you be surprised? What, Mrs. Smith? Oh, you'll see, dear. Don't see, don't see. Please. Well, Mr. Forbes, I'm glad you could get down early. I'd like to talk over something with you. Oh, now, now, Gordon, no business, please. But, Dulcie, that's what Mr. Forbes came down. No, down. no, dear, this is the time for play. You know, Mr. Forbes, the one thing poor Gordon has never learned is how to play. He takes everything so seriously. Now, what I like to do is just cut loose once in a while, just see children again, and I've got the most wonderful day planned for you, Mr. Forbes. We're going to play and play and play. <laughs> 
Me? Uh, well, thank you very much, but you know I... Oh, but you play golf, don't you? Well, to tell you the truth... Oh, Mr. Smith, well, that's I... good, and you love our course. It's wonderful. Uh, yes, yes, but, but I've been having a great deal of trouble with my back oh, lately. Oh, the pro at our club will fix that up. What you need is exercise. Uh, exercise? Yeah, you and what? I'll go out and play 18 holes of golf the first thing in the morning. But, my dear Mrs. Smith... Excuse me, Mrs. Smith. Uh, yes, Henry? Yes, Henry, what is it? Another guest is here, madam. A Mr... Mister... Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Don't tell us his name. Just show him in, Henry. Very good, madam. Oh, Angela. Yes, Miss This is the surprise I was telling you about, Angela. Oh, who is it? Well, you'll see in a moment, darling. In here, sir, please. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, oh, good heavens. Mrs. Smith. Oh, oh, how do you do? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Vincent Leach, the great moving picture writer. What? what? Yes, Mr. Falls, Mr. Vincent Lee. How do you do, Mr. Falls? Uh, how do you do? And this is Mrs. Falls. Well, how do you do? And Mr. Smith, my husband. How do you how do? How do you do? Oh, and of course you know Angela. Angela, this is a surprise. Yes, isn't it, Mr. Leach? <laughs> I didn't know you were going to be here. Well, neither did I. Yeah, what's that, Mr. Falls? Oh, nothing, Mr. Smith, nothing oh, at all. No. Oh, I thought you said something. Uh, Mr. Leach, we're all so glad you could come. He's been so busy, Mr. Forbes, working on his new picture. Tell him about it, Mr. Leach. Well, I'm afraid I can't just now. It's a little long. Perhaps after dinner. Oh, yes, of course. But I may say without exaggeration that it will probably be the most magnificent picture of its type ever produced. Oh, how wonderful. Yes, even better than my last picture, The Sacred Love. I suppose everyone here saw the sacred love. Oh, I thought you no, I I beg your pardon, Mrs. Oh, Smith. Yes, what is it? Mr. Schuyler Van Dyke. Uh, uh, Mr. Van Dyke? Oh, no, 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 Mr. Forbes. This is just our butler. Here comes Mr. Van Dyke. How do you do, Mrs. Smith? Uh, I'm sorry to be late. Oh, don't mention it, Mr. Van Dyke. I had to make several important long-distance calls. <clears throat> Business, you know. Oh, of course, you captains of industry. <laughs> oh, Mr. Forbes, this is Mr. Van Dyke. Me, Mr. Mr. Van Dyke. Well, uh, how do you do? How do you do? Um, I brought him here especially for you, Mr. Ford. Dulcie, Dulcie. Gordon, I told you it isn't polite to whisper in front of company. Oh. Well, now our weekend has started. Gordon, will you introduce Mr. Van Dyke to everyone and everyone to Mr. Van Dyke? <laughs> We're all too good friends to be strangers, you know. Well, this is Mrs. Ford. Yes, how Mr. Ford's wife, you know, and this is Angela Ford's Mr. Ford's daughter, do you, uh, how and this is Mr. Leach, Mr. Ford's uh, uh, son-in-law. Dulcie. Uh -huh. Dinner is served, oh. Mrs. Smith. Yeah, well, one can't do everything at once, can one? Well, come along, everyone. Dinner. <laughs> don't see, don't see. What are you laughing at? <laughs> well, I just want to put everybody in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, let's go back to the others. I tell you, I'll do nothing of the sort. I, this place is going to drive me crazy. Now, Charlie, please don't excite yourself. You know how bad it is for you after eating. Did you hear what that woman said? I've got to get up tomorrow morning and play golf. Golf. If there's one thing I hate more than anything in this world, it's golf. Unless it's bridge. Oh, Charlie. If I could think of a good excuse, I'd go back to town tonight and take Angela and you with me. But, Charlie, you can't do that. Uh, don't you suppose I see that woman's plan to throw Angela and that... Uh, that fool leech together? But I tell you, he's a most charming man. And I tell you, Mrs. Smith, if it weren't for Smith and our business relations, I would go back to town tonight. Oh, here I am. I've been looking all over for you, Mr. Forbes. You know what we're going to do? We're going to play bridge. What? <laughs> Mrs. Smith, I don't think I care to play bridge this oh, evening. Oh, now, now, you businessmen must have some relaxation. <laughs> you remind me so of Gordon, the poor darling. He does nothing but work. I don't suppose he's told you, Mr. Falls, but he's really got a lot of things on hand. Why, uh, what do you mean? Well, you might just as well know. It isn't only the pearl business. He has lots of other interests, too. What's that? It's really asking too much to make him give up all these other things to come into the jewelry merger. That is, unless it were made worth his while. Of course, if he only got 16 and two-thirds percent, he couldn't afford to give up all his time to it. Oh, no, he'd have to look after his other interests, too. And you'd be the loser. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, I thought you would. <laughs> Are you coming, Mrs. Falls? Oh, yes, Mrs. Smith. Well, hurry, dear, then. We're going to start the game. Mm. Oh, hello, mm. Mr. Forbes. All alone? Uh, yes, Mr. Smith. Uh, I'd like to have a word with you. Of course. Uh, Smith. Yes? Your wife has just been telling me something of your other business activities. 
other business activities. Yeah, and it came as something of a revelation to me. I don't understand. Well, as you may have been aware, my agreement to admit you on a 16 and two-thirds percent basis was founded on the expectation that you would give all your time to the new enterprise. Yes, of course, Mr. Forbes. Well, in the circumstances, your business and your services would hardly be worth that amount to me. No, I think we shall have to lower your percentage. But, Mr. Forbes, you, you, you don't understand. I think I do. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go and play bridge. Oh, I'm sunk. I'm sunk. Dulcie. Dulcie, where are you? Yes, Gordon, dear. Well, come here, quick. Oh, Gordon, I've got news for you. Wait a minute, wait a minute, oh, Dulcie. Oh, but I can't wait, dear. I must tell you. Dulcie, Mr. please. Mrs. Forbes just told me that Mr. Forbes never plays bridge. Well, what of it? What of, what of it? Why, Gordon, dear, don't you see? He's out there now, ready to play. That means he likes us. He likes us, Gordon. Everything's going to be wonderful. Oh, I can feel it in my bones. Oh, In a moment, we'll go on with Dulcie. But now, let's listen in on a typical Lux home. Young Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, who have been married just a month, are giving a party in their new home. Oh, well, Betty. Some more. Uh, let's have some of the old-time favorites in this book. Yes. If you don't mind, I, I'd rather not play anymore. Oh, what? please, honey. Oh, oh what's, what's the matter? matter? Oh, Betty. Like that. I can't imagine. Let me go see what the trouble is. So Betty's friend, Ruth, who is a newlywed herself, goes into the bedroom. She finds Betty crying, sits down beside her, and tries to comfort her. What's wrong, Betty? Tell me. Oh, it's nothing, Ruth, only... Only while I was playing the piano, you all seemed to be staring at my horrid old dishpan hand. I hate looking like such a drudge. Oh, you poor little kid. Don't you know your hands needn't look that way? Six months of dishwashing hasn't hurt my hands a bit. How do you do it? Mm, the easiest way in the world. I use Lux Flakes in the dishpan. They're so gentle, it's a regular beauty treatment every time I wash the dishes. Just try Lux, Betty. Your hands will be white and smooth again in no time. Remember, pure, gentle Lux Flakes haven't any harmful alkali. They won't dry up the precious oils of the skin. And Lux is inexpensive, too. Lux Flakes for all your dishes cost less than one cent a day. Mr. DeMille continues. On with our story, Dulce, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. After carefully patching up the damage done by Dulce... Gordon was able to convince Mr. Forbes that his percentage of the merger should not be lowered. But there's more trouble brewing. It's a few hours later, and Dulcie is alone in the living room. The door opens, and Vincent, Vincent Leach and Angela enter excitedly. Oh, Mrs. Smith, we've got to speak to you. Yes, we want you to help us. Why, Mr. Leach, Angela, is there anything wrong? Oh, Mrs. Smith, Vincent and I are... Are in love. In love? In love? Oh, Angela, Angela, Mr. Leach. Oh, if this isn't the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. Why, it's, it's, it's wonderful, that's all I can say. Oh, oh, I'm so happy I could cry. Good news affects me that way. Oh, Vincent, I may call you Vincent now, mayn't I? Of course. Ah, uh, Mrs. Smith. We're going to need your help. Oh, yes, darling, of course. Now, it's a secret, and you must promise that you won't tell anyone. Oh, I know. I wouldn't tell a soul. Well, we're going to elope. E elope? Tonight. T tonight? You mean run away and get married? Yes. Oh, why, well, that's wonderful. Oh, that's just marvelous. Oh, now, remember, you're not to tell us. Oh, I know. I wouldn't tell anybody, no. How soon are you going? Oh, just as soon as we can. Aren't we, Vincent? Yes, if we can get away. Oh, of course, of course. Oh, I'm so excited. I don't know what to do next. Uh oh. Oh, Willie, Vincent, and Angela are going to a love. Uh -oh. Mrs. Smith, you promised you wouldn't tell. Oh, but I won't, and Willie won't tell anybody either, will you, Willie? You're going to elope, Angela, with, uh, with Mr. Leach? Yes. No, I won't tell us all. Oh, there you are, Angela. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Where are you going to elope to? Why, uh, uh, where were we, Vincent? Well, I, I hadn't thought about it just yet. Well, there are lots of places. Oh, sure. 
How about a marriage license? Why, uh, I don't know. Vincent. Well, I, I thought we might find one someplace. Oh, Willie. Willie, you could help in some way, couldn't you? You know where to get a license and everything. Why, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I'll be glad to drive them there. Oh, now, you see, that's just why I told them all. Everything is just working out beautifully. And I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, um, uh, we'll, um, uh, 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 what do we suggest, Willie? Is uh, everything ready? Oh, we just have to get our bags. They just have to get their bags. Vincent, now you go find Mrs. Forbes and tell her, mm -hmm. and then we'll all meet in the garage. Now I'll go up and get Angela's things for her. But well, wait a minute. Oh, hurry, Vincent. The less speed, the more haste is something, <laughs> you know. All right. Uh, I'll see you in the garage in about three minutes. Don't keep me waiting. Oh, we won't. Well, now that's settled. Well, I'll go up and get the things. Oh, I'll go with you. Oh, no, no. I'll bring everything out to the garage. If anybody sees me, they won't suspect. Oh, well, you know I'm so excited excited. It's just, well, it's just like times of old when nights were bold. <laughs> oh. Well, are you all ready for the elopement, Angela? Bill Parker, I think, I think you're just horrid. Speaking to me? You know very well I am. Oh, you don't mean it. I'm really being very good to you, helping you out in this way. Well, well, you don't have to be so happy about it. After all, we, we are old friends. Yeah, that's why I'm glad, uh... You, uh, you're glad, aren't you? That has nothing to do with it. Of course I am. <laughs> oh, you're just impossible. Angela, you told me once that, that I'd never change. Well, you were right. I never have changed, especially about you. I don't care whether you have or not. I think you're positively hopeless. I guess I am. Well, let's get going, shall we? <laughs> Eleanor. Here I am, dear, in the garden. Well, what are you doing out here? Oh, watching the stars. It's a beautiful night, isn't it, Charlie? So calm and peaceful. Hmm, peaceful. You know, that woman is enough to drive a man crazy. Uh, say, is that our car? Where, dear? Well, uh, going out the drive. See it? Oh, it couldn't be ours, darling. No? Well, where's Angela? I don't know... I haven't seen her since dinner. Out gallivanting with that sap all writer, I suppose. Do you mean Mr. Leach? Yes, I mean Mr. Leach. And I want to tell you something. If I find this Leach person actually making love to Angela, I'm going to raise blazes. Now, Charlie. I've had nothing but a series of aggravations and annoyances ever since I came into this house. Eleanor, I can truthfully say that in all my 50... Three years. I have never spent an unhappier evening. Oh, Charlie. Yeah, but I'm not going to spend another. I'm not going to stay here and play golf and break. Well, what are you going to do? I I'm going home. Charlie. I'm going upstairs and pack right now. Charlie. Oh, Mr. Forbes, oh. here you are. Yeah, I won't be for long. You, what did you say? Uh, I said I'm going to my room. Oh, well, that's right. Get a good night's rest so you'll be nice and fresh for tomorrow. Uh, Mrs. Smith. I am not going to play golf tomorrow. Oh, no, none of us are. We've changed our plans, Mr. Forbes. Oh. We're going horseback riding. Ho <laughs> horseback? What? Yes, yes, isn't that a wonderful idea? G good night, Mrs. Uh, Smith. Oh, I knew he'd like it. Oh, Mrs. Forbes. Mrs. Forbes, have you heard the news? Oh, but you couldn't have, could you? It only just happened. <laughs> well, uh, what has just happened? Uh, Vincent and Angela, they've eloped. What? Yes, just a minute ago, they took your car. Eloped. Oh, isn't it wonderful? I knew you'd be thrilled. And it's all my doing, every bit of it. And what makes it more exciting, it's a secret, too. Mrs. Smith, do you know what you've done? Oh, that's all right. You can thank me later. He'll never forgive you. Never. Yeah, who, Vincent? No, my husband. But he didn't elope with your husband. Try to understand, Mrs. Smith. My husband hates Mr. Leach. Well, this is a fine time to say a thing like that. How was I supposed to know? He never said anything. This is the finish, Mrs. Smith. We're leaving here just as soon as our car is returned. Oh, no, but you can't. You mustn't. Mr. Smith hasn't settled anything about the merger yet. No, and I'm afraid he never will. Good night, Mrs. Smith. <laughs> Mr. Van Dyke. You mustn't cry like that, Mrs. Smith. Oh, I can't help it. You don't know what's happened. Yes, I do. I just heard Mr. Forbes oh. storming about it upstairs. You couldn't help but 
hear him. Oh, Mr. Van Dyke, isn't it awful? Isn't it terrible? Nothing is so terrible that it can't be mended. Oh, but the merger, it may be all off. I don't know what Gordon will do. <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, I like your husband very much. Oh, do you? Uh, tell me, uh, would he be willing to get up his own merger? One bigger than Mr. Forbes ever dreamt of? Why, well, 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 I never thought of that, but Mr. Forbes has all the money, and, and Gordy hasn't any. That's it, exactly. Now, I've always wanted to take a little fly on the jewelry business. Uh, suppose I financed Mr. Smith. Suppose he and I set out to beat Mr. Forbes together. Uh, how would that be? 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 Why, it would be the biggest thing that ever happened in this house. Do you really mean it? I certainly do. I'll put up my check the moment your husband says the word. Oh, Mr. Van Dyke, you, well, you've made me the happiest woman in all the world. Oh, you'll let me break the news to him, won't you? Why, why, of course, if you wish it. Oh, and to think I introduced you to him. Oh, now what will he think of me? Wait a minute. Say that again, Mr. Van Dyke. Well, of course. I said that your wife has interested me very much in this proposition, and I've told her that I'm willing to finance a combination to beat Forbes and his crowd with you at the head of it. Oh, he's just waiting for you to say the word, darling. I... Why, well, I... I... I can't believe it. But it's true. It is, dear. Why, it's, it's, it's too good to be true. I could get rid of Forbes and put my business in for what it's worth. Oh, yes, oh, God. I, I really could do big things. I'll be back financially by the Van Dyke interest. Exactly, Mr. Smith. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, oh, come in, Forbes. Oh, we were just talking about you, Mr. Forbes. I'm compelled to make a little announcement. I merely wish to tell you, on top of everything else, that my wife's diamond necklace has disappeared. Disappeared? Huh? In view of the fact that it took place in this house, I thought you might have a sentimental interest. Don't you dare accuse Henry of stealing anything. Don't say, Henry. Who's Henry? Yeah, well, Don't say quiet. No, Gordon, I'm not going to stand here and listen to him make insinuating remarks about my servants. Henry is perfectly honest. His honesty has been proven. He's been paroled seven times. Oh. Well, that's very interesting. Where is this man? Why, boy, well, he's not here. I, he asked me if I, I'd let him take the evening off, and I said yes. Well, thank you, Mrs. Smith. You've been a great help. Mr. Forbes, please, we'll get the necklace back, and if we don't, I'll make good for it. Now, let's sit down and talk it over. There's nothing to talk over. And in the circumstances, I don't see how we can possibly go into business together. I don't like your methods. The merger is definitely off. But, Mr. Forbes... I'm sorry, but that's my decision. Wait, Mr. Forbes. Before you freeze me out, I want to tell you that Mr. Van Dyke here has agreed to back me in an independent merger. A bigger one than yours. What? Yes, what? Mr. Forbes, I have. But you I... See? Now, am I still out? Uh, yes, Mr. Smith, you are. Very well. Then I'm going to line up with Mr. Van Dyke and fight you. Fight you till one of us is forced to the wall. I'll teach you to take advantage of me. Advantage? Who took advantage of you? You did. By offering me less than you know my business was worth. Why, you knew I was in a hole, and now you're going to get just what you deserve. You're going to get a first-rate licking. Oh, Gordy! All right. Make your fine speeches. But when you talk about fighting, don't forget that I can fight, too. And before you win, you're going to know that you've been in a real fight. Remember that. You know, I think he's mad, Gordy. <laughs> Mr. Smith, <laughs> allow me to congratulate you. You told him what was what straight from the shoulder. Thank you, Mr. Van Dyke. And I'm sure we'll get along splendidly. Well, of course we will. And now I'll say good night. Uh, I've had a hard day at my broker's, and uh, I'm very tired. Uh, good night, Mrs. Smith. Oh, good night, and thank you. Uh, not at all, not at all. Oh, oh, Gordon, you were wonderful. I feel like a new man. Oh, you see, I was of some use after all. Use? You were magnificent. The best. The finest little wife in the world. Oh, wasn't it lucky my finding Mr. Van Dyke? Lucky? It was an inspiration. Oh, and I am a real helpmate. I should say you are. Oh, Gordy. Well, now, who could that be? Well, I'll answer it. Good evening, Mr. Smith. Good evening. Um, I'm sorry to intrude like this, but it's rather important. My name is Patterson, Blair Patterson. Oh, the attorney. Yes. Well, come in. Thank you. I was uh, referred to you by Mrs. Kennedy. Oh, across the street? Yes. She said that you had guests. I just wondered if among them there was a Mr. Mr. Morgan. Morgan? Oh, I know. 
Well, is there Mr. Ford? No, no, he's not here either. Mr. Vanderbilt? Mr. Vanderbilt? Oh, no. Mm. Well, uh, let me ask you. Is one of your guests tall, good-looking, interested in various uh, investments? Oh, you mean Skylar Van Dyke. Skylar Van Dyke, yes. I think I do mean Skylar Van Dyke. Mm -hmm. I'm his cousin. I, uh, I've come for him. Come for him? Yes, his real name is Patterson, Horace Patterson. He has an hallucination that he's a millionaire. What? You mean he's crazy? Yes, a little. <laughs> but uh, harmless, I assure you. Dulcie, he's crazy. Skylar Van Dyke is crazy. Well, then the company that he was... I mean, the merger, the merger that he had the money for, the merger that it isn't... I mean, it for It can't fall. Oh, dear. <laughs> We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX, the Columbia Station, Los Angeles. Now, a momentary break in Dulce, while George Burns and Gracie Allen prepare for the next stanza of our play. <clears throat> Here in Hollywood, Miss Hedda Hopper, one of the screen's brighter comedians, is as successful socially as she is professionally. Her charming sophistication and delightful wit make her a popular guest at most screen colony functions. The end of the Lenten season has been the occasion for Hollywood's annual display of spring finery, and I've asked Miss Hopper to report tonight on what she's seen from the reviewing stand of Stardom's Easter Parade. Our guest is appearing in three films now in production, Tapper, Dangerous Holiday, and Vogues of 1938. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Hedda Hopper. Thank you so much, Mr. DeMille. Hollywood's Easter Parade really began Saturday night with the dinner given by Mr. and Mrs. Basil Rathbone to celebrate their 11th wedding anniversary. All the guests came as brides and grooms, and prizes were worn by Freddie March and his wife as Mr. and Mrs. Caveman, wearing a bit of tired leopard skin, and by Loretta Young as the bride of Mephistopheles. Molly Dietrich put on her tails and top hat and tugged, uh, tucked Mrs. Lubitsch under her arm. Myrna Loy and her husband, Arthur Hornblow, came as peasants with headdresses three feet high, while Mr. and Mrs. Misha Auer became, for the evening, Mr. and Mrs. Misha Mouse. It was a typical Rathbone party, which means that about every important star in Hollywood was there. And what's more, had a grand and glorious time. And stayed for breakfast? No, we adjourned for ham and eggs to the home of Adrian, the noted designer. There again were all the stars, this time in their street costumes. And I must say that in their gay prints and tailor-maids, they looked like old-fashioned bouquets. Both uh, Maureen O'Sullivan and Rosalind Russell proved how popular the new large black hats are, with their long, bright-colored ribbons flowing down the back. Maureen wore a black print dress splashed with brilliant colors, and Rosalind's dress resembled a mass of tulips. One of the guests of honor was the Rani of Sarawak, wife of the Raja. But she preferred her traditional East Indian costume with many gold chains, jewels, and bracelets. I've been in Hollywood a good many years now and watched it become universally recognized as a fashion center. The annual studio cost for clothes is staggering. As you know, each has its own designers creating their individual styles, for competition is just as keen in them as in stories and stars. Yet when it comes to protecting this investment, every major studio seems to follow the same procedure. They all use Lux Flakes. All the major wardrobe departments here in Hollywood have the same reason I myself have. It's a very practical one, too. Lux flakes keep clothes new-looking so much longer. Colors emerge as they go in when you use Lux. And now, thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you, Miss Hopper. <laughs> Dulcie, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. <laughs> It's early the next morning, and Blair Patterson, the lawyer who brought the calamitous news of Mr. Van Dyke's hallucinations, is in the living room straightening out his rumpled clothes after spending the night on the sofa. Down the stairs comes the happily demented Mr. Van Dyke, singing cheerfully. Hello, Horace. What? Oh, why, Blair, what in the world are you doing here? Oh, I, uh, 
Just dropped in to say hello. You can't fool me. You've come to make me leave. It's, it's very, very embarrassing, Blair. Well, if it's embarrassing for you, what do you think it is for me? I have a law practice to attend to. I'm getting a little tired of these excursions. Well, I wish you'd leave me alone. At least half a dozen times during the past few years you've interrupted me. In business negotiations that were exceedingly interesting. Mm-hmm. You've been up to something here, Horace? Well, yes. I've been representing my Van Dyke interest. We had all sorts of wonderful things planned. My share alone would have been eight and a half millions. Besides, we were going to play golf and, and go horseback riding. I love horses. Horace, how many times have I told you that I represent the Van Dyke interests? Now you must let me handle it. You come back to town with me and we'll talk it over. But I can't leave now. I'm sorry, Horace, but you know our agreement. Unless you do as I say, I'll never go through with that $200 million airplane company of ours. Oh, oh well, oh, oh, all right, Blair. Mm. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Smith. Oh, how do you feel this morning, Mr. Uh, did, uh, Van Dyke? Uh, very melancholy. I I'm afraid I must go back to town. Oh, well, that's too bad. Still, it's all for the best. Uh, you must have some breakfast first, though. Uh, thank you, thank you. I I'll go and have it right away. It's hard to do high finance uh, on an empty stomach. Yeah, he can't have breakfast, can he, Mr. Patterson? Oh, yes. Well, yes. I had some soft-boiled eggs prepared for him, some soft milk toast, mm -hmm. all very soft, you know. Is that all right? Oh, yes, yes. I think that'll be very nice, Mrs. Smith. Thank you. Oh, don't mention it, Mr. Patterson. I Oh, hello, Gordon, darling. Oh. Good morning, Mr. Patterson. Good morning, Mr. Smith. Have you seen your cousin? Yes, uh, we had quite a talk. Uh, by the way... You haven't mentioned anything to your guests, have you? I mean, uh, it would be rather embarrassing. No, <laughs> nobody knows a thing. So far as they know, he's Skylar Van Dyke himself. Fine, fine, that's fine. Well, thank you very, very much. And now I, uh, I think I'd better go and keep an eye on him. <laughs> you never can tell what big merger he'll attempt next. Yes. Excuse me, Mrs. Smith. Oh, certainly. Don't say. Yes, dear? Don't say, I want to speak to you. Yes, of course. Uh, what about, darling? What about? Do you realize what's happened? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I think... Oh, Gordon, I didn't mean... Wait, I, wait. Yes, darling. Do you know what Forbes is going to say to me when he learns who Van Dyke really is? No. He's going to laugh in my face. I'll never get him to change his mind about the merger now. He thinks he's been made a fool of, and he's right. But... But we haven't really done anything to him just because we we asked for more. Oh, it wasn't our asking for more. Oh, you mean the jewels disappearing. Yes, and his daughter disappearing, too. Oh, it was me again. It was me as usual. Oh, Gordon, how will it all end? If Forb finds out that Van Dyke is crazy, he'll probably force me out of business. I'll have to start all over again without, without a cent. And without me? Don't say I love you. I'll always love you, but you're like a child. You don't stop to think. Oh, I guess I don't, Gordon. I only think I think. Oh, darling, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go if, if you want me to. I'm, oh, I'm just all wrong. I'm a false note. I've always wondered how I was able to make a man like you care for me. It, it, it seems so silly for a man like you ever to love a false note. You'll see, you're not a false note. You're a melody. A whole tune, but, oh, I don't know what to do. Well, maybe I can reform. I doubt it. Oh, Gordon, please let me try. I'll promise that I'll never interfere with your business affairs again. I'll, I'll change completely. I'll revolutionize myself. Uh, uh, Delcy, I don't want you to change. I love you just as you are. I simply want you to let me handle my own affairs in my own way. If you can promise to do that... Oh, yes, uh, yes, Gordy, I promise, and I'll keep it, too. I will. Thank you, Dulcie. I hope I'm not wrong this time. Good morning, Mrs. Smith. Oh, Mr. Forbes, I've been looking for you. Uh, really? Uh, Mrs. Smith, I, I have a slight apology to make. We uh, we found my wife's necklace. Oh, there, you see? Uh, your butler found it and put it away for safekeeping. He returned it to Mrs. Forbes this morning. Oh, I'm so glad. Now, I have an apology, too, Mr. Forbes. I'm, I'm sorry about the elopement, Mr. Forbes. Hmm. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry about the business deal, too, but it's going to come out all right. I should think it would for your husband, backed by the Van Dyke Millions. The Van Dyke Millions? But, Mr. Forbes... Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm inclined to regret my hasty decision of last night. If I had known before that Mr. Van Dyke was interested... Yeah, oh, but that's just it. He isn't interested. I mean, he is, but he can't be. Hmm? Uh, what is all this? Well, you see, uh, Gordon will go in with you after all, because Mr. Van Dyke... Well, Mr. Van Dyke just isn't Mr. Van Dyke. What? What's that? Well, no, he has something wrong in his head. He, he, he only thinks he's a millionaire. Oh, I see. So everything's all right now, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Splendid, yes. Uh, where's your husband now, Mrs. Why, Smith? he's in the library. Would you like to see him? Uh, yes, uh, very much. Well, come along. It's right this way, Mr. Forbes. <laughs> oh, I just knew everything would turn out all right. <laughs> oh, here we are. Uh, oh, Gordon. Gordon, darling. Elsie? Um, I've just fixed it with Mr. Forbes, darling. What? Yeah, everything's fine now. Elsie, what did you say? A great deal, Mr. Smith. She told me about Mr. Van Dyke. She took... Did you, Dulcie? Yeah, of course, dear. I told you I'd straighten everything out. You certainly have. Well, Mr. Forbes, then, of course, you know that Mr. Van Dyke... Yeah, I, I know. But it won't work, Mr. Smith. It won't work. Huh? Oh, I'll admit that Mrs. Smith is a clever woman. A very clever woman. But it won't work. A Van Dyke, not a Van Dyke. Hmm? No, oh, but Mr. Forbes, he really Shut is. Shut up, Dulcie. Oh. oh, yes, dear. I saw through the whole thing at once, Mr. Smith. You began to be sorry you told me about the Van Dyke merger, and you wanted to throw me off the trail. Huh? <laughs> well, you can't do it. I know what's in the wind, and I'm going to hold you to our agreement. Agreement? Well, it was a verbal agreement. Now, as a gentleman, you agreed to come in with me for 16 and two-thirds percent. And you've got to do it. You've got to come in with me. Oh, oh, well, all right, Mr. Forbes. I, I guess you win. Oh, there, Gordon. Didn't I tell you I'd fix it for you? Charlie, Charlie, where are you? Uh, here I am, Eleanor. What do you want? Oh, Charlie, she's here. Who? Who's here? Angela. She's come back. Oh, how nice. Angela, eh? Well, I want to speak to her. Hello, Father. Come here. Where have you been? Oh, Father, <laughs> what a question. Oh, Angela, dear, I, I, are you married? Of course I am. Oh, she's married, she's married. Isn't that wonderful? Hmm. So you did it, eh? Where's your husband? Yes, Angela, where's your husband? Good morning, everybody. Oh, Hello, Belle. Hello, Willie. Where's Vincent? Where's Mr. Leach? Oh, Angela, tell us. I don't know, Mrs. Smith. You don't know? Well, isn't that fine? Well, Willie, for heaven's sake, what's happened to him? Well, it's a long story, Dulcie. Uh, look here, young man. You helped to arrange this wedding, didn't you? Yes, Mr. Forbes. Well, don't you know where the groom is? Sure. I'm the groom. What? Yeah, well, Willie, really? well, we say that again. Certainly. I am the groom. Well, congratulations. Well, congratulations. Now, 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 just a second, young man. Are you a genius? No, sir. Well, are you a writer of any kind, sort, or description? I should say not. Well, he's a broker, Mr. Forbes, and isn't it wonderful? That, that makes everything all right, doesn't it? Well, Oh, but what about Mr. Leach, Willie? Where is he? I don't know. You see, we started from here all right last night, but down the road a piece, I suddenly thought my tail light was out. Well, Mr. Leach was kind enough to investigate for me, and somehow or other, the car started off without him. <laughs> Young fellow, you, you're all right. And darn clever, too. Well, he's my brother. What would you expect? And wasn't it wonderful that I happened to invite him down here for this party? Oh, so this is what you were working for, underneath all that leech business. What? Well, uh, uh yes and no. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid you don't understand women very well, Mr. Forbes. I'm afraid I don't. But isn't it marvelous? Angela, a married woman, and Willie, a married man. Oh, I could almost cry. But, Mr. Forbes, about that merger, you know, 16 and two-thirds percent isn't very much for a relation, a uh, brother-in-law. Well, I... Uh, I wasn't very generous about that deal, or very just either. Uh, Smith. Yes, sir? 
What do you say to coming in with me for 20%? 20? Oh, Mr. Ford. Oh, all right, then. All right. If that's not enough, we'll make it 25. 25? Uh, Dulcie, be quiet. 25 satisfies me. Oh, does it? Well, if it satisfies you, Gordon, then it satisfies me. I didn't mean to interfere, dear, and I never will again. You know the old saying, a burnt child dreads the fire? Well, I've been bitten. I mean, burned. And once bitten, twice cautious. I mean, oh, well, <laughs> you get the idea, don't you, darling? And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings down the curtain on our play, but not on Burns and Allen, who return for an encore a little later. As you have seen, we were concerned tonight with a party that almost turned out all wrong. And now we're going to extend our stage from Hollywood to New York for a little advice from a hostess famous the world over, because our parties always turn out all right, Miss Elsa Maxwell. Miss Maxwell has entertained notables the world over. There's hardly a famous person she doesn't know. Right now, she's finishing preparations to attend the coronation in England. And so, to check up on the ways of a perfect hostess, we take you to New York and Elsa Maxwell. Unexpectedly introduced Noel Coward to Queen Mary of Romania at a party. They certainly were as opposite as the Poles. But they got on so well that Her Majesty, at last turning a reflective eye on the witty author, said, Why couldn't you become my gentleman in waiting? Noel, delighted, replied, I feel that would be no novelty, Your Majesty. I have been waiting all my life. But not in Romania, flashed Her Majesty, and Noel was floored. Don't think it takes a lot of money to run a good party. It's having fun that matters, and fun is the same anywhere, whether you're on Main Street or Park Avenue. A good laugh is worth a million dollars, and you can afford it just as well on $25 a week as on $2,500. After all, the nicest things in life don't cost the most. That goes for Lux Flakes, too. They're used in my house, and there isn't anything finer, yet, yet you can buy them for a few cents. Women who dress on nothing a year or women who spend thousands are all fans for Lux Flakes. Lux keeps dresses and lingerie from looking old and tired. It's a sort of pet bath for your clothes. Pep is a thing that makes parties go. It's more important than money. Now, I've given parties on a shoestring all my life. All you need is an idea which allows people to escape from their everyday selves. You can ask people to come dressed as their opposites or as themselves or their pet hates or anything. A successful party is as simple as that. One of the best times I ever had was when I went to a stag party dressed as Professor Albert Einstein. I talked with a German accent all evening until the party was over. Groucho Marx and Clark Gable, two of my most intimate friends, actually didn't know who I was. The following night, I met the great scientist at Charlie Chaplin's. He frowned at me. Bell, I heard you but me last night. Physically, yes, but not mentally, Herr Doctor, I replied trembling. Perhaps it was better the other way, he thundered. And I felt crushed. Remember, for bigger and better parties, let your guests escape from their troubles. Have a surprise up your sleeve. And don't feel you have to be extravagant. And I'll guarantee the best party in the world. Thank you, and goodbye. From Hollywood, Miss Maxwell, we send our transcontinental thanks. George Burns tells me that Gracie has something very nice to say about our product. So here they are, ladies and gentlemen, George Burns and Gracie Allen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. DeMille. I certainly have something nice to say about Lux Flakes. I think they're delicious. Delicious? Lux Flakes, delicious? Yes, my brother had them for breakfast this morning. I I is he mad? Well, he must be. He was foaming at the mouth. <laughs> Uh, don't pay any attention to her, Mr. DeMille. She's nuts. She's probably the only woman in the world who's living with a cracked brain. Oh, please, George. Mr. DeMille isn't interested in who I married. I say. Mm. Uh, Mr. DeMille, I made up a play. Uh, here it is. Uh, see what it says? Uh, Roten by Gracie Allen. It's going to be... Wrote, a... Roten by Gracie Allen? Yes. Gracie, if it were my play, it wouldn't say rotten. Well, no, neither would the critics. Mm. They'd say, play rotten by George Burke. I say. <laughs> Written, rotten, rotten. 
Uh, Gracie, you don't know English. Oh, Mr. DeMille, you don't know George's plays. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, what's the name of your play? Well, it's a love story called Life Begins at 36. Oh, you, you mean Life Begins at 40? Well, that's what it was originally, Mr. DeMille, but my agent took off 10%. Yes. <laughs> you see, our agent must be on a diet. Well, anywho, yeah. George and I will act it out, and you see if it has any possibilities. Now, George, you and I are lovers, and I start to make love to you. And what character do I play? Well, you play the part of a club man. Oh, you mean a large man? Well, not too large, not too small. I see. Sort of, uh... Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks. Well, anywho, I'm Violet Ray, a movie extra, and George, your Montgomery Ward, my lover. Thanks. And uh, you're jealous of your rival, Sears Roebuck. <laughs> I, I, I suppose uh, he comes driving up in his catalog. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't get it. Well, uh, uh, let's, let's start this silly play. Now, uh, watch it, Mr. DeMille. Yes. All right, George, here's your part. Mm. Act. All right, now for some acting. Do you love me, Vi? Vi, do you love me? Vi, do you love me? Well, why shouldn't I love you? Ah, uh, men are fools to love. Uh, what did you say, Montgomery? I said men are fools to love. Well, I guess you're right, but who else is there for us girls to love? Say. That's, very, that's very good, Gracie, but uh, we did one play tonight. Yeah. Oh, did we? Well, uh, good night, Mr. DeMille. Come on, Gracie. Oh, now I know why George Burns <laughs> Thank you, George Burns and Gracie Allen Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Ruick A most important message concerning next week's program Will be given by Mr. DeMille in just a moment Assisting our stars tonight Were John Davidson as Skylar Van Dyke Victor Rodman as Blair Patterson Joe Franz as Henry, and Leora Thatcher as Mrs. Forbes. Burns and Allen will be seen next in the Paramount picture, Artists and Models. Mr. DeMille also appeared through courtesy of Paramount, and Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new film, Fifty Roads to Town. Now, before Mr. DeMille tells you about next week's presentation of the Lux Radio Theater, we have a brief announcement. Next Monday, April 5th, marks the beginning of a very important week, National Retail Grocers Week. Be sure to go personally to your grocers during that week. You will be well repaid. Splendid values will be featured generally over a wide list of products which you use regularly. Incidentally, you will find in the great majority of stores from coast to coast special values on Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. Once again, our producer... Of the many novels written against a background of the World War, few carry such tremendous appeal as Ernest Hemingway's masterpiece, A Farewell to Arms. It made a remarkable play as adapted by Lawrence Stallings, a sensational motion picture. And next Monday night, from the Lux Radio Theater, we bring you this magnificent love story starring one of the most celebrated personalities the screen has ever known, Mr. Clark Gable. We shall hear Mr. Gable as Lieutenant Henry, and I'm especially happy to announce that we've secured Miss Josephine Hutchinson for the part of Nurse Catherine Barclay and Adolf Manjou for Rinaldi. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolf Manjou in a farewell to arms. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. As Mr. DeMille told you, our stars next Monday night are Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolf Manjou in Ernest Hemingway's brilliant story, A Farewell to Arms. This is your announcer, Mel Roy, bidding you good night on behalf of our sponsors, our stars, and guests. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Stories from the world's great literature of pure excitement. A new series frankly dedicated to your horrification and entertainment. Week by week, from the pick of new material, from the pages of best-selling novels, from the theater of Broadway and London, and the sound stages of Hollywood, will parade the most remarkable figures ever known. CBS gives you suspense. Tonight's presentation is one of the finest of the contemporary stories of mystery and terror. John Dixon Carr's famous novel, The Burning Court. Ah, a glass of sherry by the fireside of a beautiful suburban home. What could be more comforting? You're an admirable host, Mr. Depart, and it's really a shame our first meeting is under such a cloud. It's also a shame I have so little time to tell you which one of your guests here ah, murdered your uncle last week. <laughs> now, let's see now. I believe we're all here. Your wife, your friend, Mr. Stevens, Captain Brennan. Yes, and incidentally, yourself. Just who did you say you were? Well, no wonder you've had so much difficulty with the case, Captain. My name is Cross, Gordon Cross, the writer. As a matter of fact, it's because of my just completed book, Poisoning Throughout the Ages, that I happen to be here now. And Ted Stevens there happens to be a member of the firm which publishes my work. I'd never seen him until tonight, but... I've been told what happened. This afternoon, he began reading my manuscript for the first time on the train. The commuter's train, which every afternoon deposits him safely and soundly here in Crispin. I imagine he was halfway home by the time he finished the first chapter. Then he turned a page. Attached to the following leaf was a picture. And looking at it, the young man stiffened suddenly and all but cried out his shock. It was a picture of a young woman, and under it had been printed Famous Poisoner Marie Dobre, 1676. Ted Stevens was looking at a picture of his own wife. Imagine, imagine his 25-year-old wife in 17th century costume. The face, the features, even a wistfulness of expression were identical. Even the name, Dobre was his wife's maiden name. But no, 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 that was ridiculous. This woman in the picture was, well, one of his wife's ancestors. Yes, that was it, that was it. Simply an amazing family resemblance. Marie would be waiting for him at the station and he'd have to tell her about it. He wondered why, however, she'd never told him about it. Oh, well, but you don't discuss such an ancestor, do you? Ted Stevens glanced down at the chapter to which the picture had been attached. It was entitled, The Affair of the Non-Dead Woman. Hello, Ted. Stevens was almost jolted from his seat. It was Dr. Weldon, professor of English at the college, an old friend of his. Quickly, he thrust the picture beneath the manuscript and moved over. Hi, I didn't see you, Doc. Oh, here, have a, have a seat. Oh, I thought maybe you were giving me the, uh, what do they call it? The brush off? Oh, no, I... Uh, say, as a matter of fact, Doc, you're the one man I do want to see. Yeah? Very flattering. Remember those discussions we used to have about murders? <laughs> Better than bridge any time. Well, I got the idea that you'd made sort of a hobby out of the old cases, the historical ones. Well, I've studied quite a number of them, yes. Ever hear of a woman named 
Marie Dobray. Marie Dobray? Marie Dobray. Oh, yes. Uh, that was her maiden name, of course. One of the finest specialists in arsenic poisoning you could ever hope to find. Oh, uh, we're almost at our station, Ted. Let's get to the door. Yes, a real charmer Marie was. Must have disposed of half a hundred husbands, lovers, suitors, and just plain friends before she was caught. Uh, what happened to her, Doc? She was beheaded and burned. Crispin! Absurd, laughable. Ted Stevens kept saying this to himself, and yet what he knew was a foolish dread followed him straight through the small suburban station and clung to him as he reached the street. And there in the roadster was Marie, leaning toward him a little to hold the door open and smiling at him. Oh, Ted, what on earth are you staring at? That street light shining on your hair, I like that. Oh, you're tight. Come on, get in the car. Then, like a wisp of smoke, it was gone. The whole ridiculous fear, the delusion. When at home, Marie brought the cocktails into the living room. The logs were burning brightly in the fireplace, throwing a soft, dancing glow upon a room that was darkening with dusk. To you, Marie. And to you, dear. As Stevens placed his glass down, he noticed the manuscript of my book. It was there on the table, right where he placed it when he first came in. Deliberately, he turned from it. And then turned back. The manuscript had been moved. Only an inch or so, but it had been moved. Keeping his back to his wife, he thrummed through that early chapter and discovered just as he knew he would, that the photograph was gone. For a long moment, he thought of what to do. Then slowly, he turned around. This book by Cross I brought home. Yes? Uh, there was a story of Poisoner in it. Rather funny. Her name happens to be the same as yours. Oh, your maiden name, that is. Oh, that is odd, isn't it? <laughs> Darling, was she a relative of yours? Why, Ted, you're serious. In a way, yes. Oh, I don't mean it's really important. It's just that, well, when you run across a person who's a dead ringer for your own wife and who lived 300 years ago and was a top-flight poisoner, well, you like to hear about it, that's all. <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? Darling, be honest with me. Didn't you look at this manuscript when I was out of the room? No. You didn't take out a picture of a poisoner named Marie Debray? I most certainly did not. Oh, Ted, what is this all about? What are you getting at? Oh, just this. Somebody took that picture out of that manuscript since I've been home. Now, who's that? Well, I'll take a look. Wait, I don't feel like... Why, it's Mark Depard. Mark? Ted, wait a second. Yes? Ted, whatever it is he wants, promise you won't do it. Promise I won't do I it? I mean, promise you won't get yourself involved. Please, Ted, don't go out tonight. Say, what in the world is... Well, anyway, we can't let him stay outside. Mark, how are you? Come on in. Thanks, Ted. Just thinking about giving you a call later. Oh, let me have your hat. Oh, thanks. I, Marie, I, I hope you'll excuse me for popping in like this, but, well... I wanted to talk to Ted. It, it's rather important. Well, I don't mind at all. Come on, Mark. We'll step into the library. Oh, you mind, dear? Of course not, Ted. I'll be making the sandwiches for her. Oh, grab that chair in the corner, Mark. Well, let's hear it. What's the trouble? Ted, my Uncle Miles was murdered. Murdered? Oh, the talk hasn't reached you yet. But it's already started. Nothing definite, of course. Just that there was something wrong about Uncle Miles' death. But I don't... Mark, are you sure of this? You know he was murdered? I don't know. Of course I don't. I just don't see how it could be any other way. Uncle Miles, you know, had been sick for quite a while. But last Saturday, he seemed so much better that Miss Corbett, uh, that was his nurse, decided to take the day off. And, oh, well, you know all this. You and Marie were over that afternoon. Anyway, Lucy and I went to the club that night, to that masquerade party, and... 
We left the old boy completely alone. I've cursed myself a thousand times since. But what about your housekeeper, Mrs. Uh, what's her name? Henderson. Wasn't she around? Oh, sure. In that little house out in back. We told her to look in now and then, but, well, that wasn't good enough. It was after midnight when Lucy and I got back. Uncle Miles was dying. Ted, it looked exactly like one of his regular attacks. But then later, after he was gone, I happened to glance under the chest of drawers in his room. There was a small silver cup under there, almost drained, and Uncle Miles' cat. The cat was still warm, but quite dead. Oh. I managed to get the cat out of the house and buried without anyone seeing me. Next day, I had the contents of the cup analyzed. It was poison? Yes. Arsenic. Well, what do you want me to do? Help me open the crypt. What? I want to have a private autopsy performed. Help me get Uncle Miles' body out of that vault. Oh, I know it's a tough job. The thing is sealed solid, but we can do it. You mean without the police knowing about it? Without anybody knowing about it. Mrs. Henderson's visiting her sister, and I managed to send Lucy over to the club. You must be crazy. You're playing with dynamite, Mark. This is something you've got to tell the police now. I can't take that chance. But they'll have to know sometime. You're only I've delaying... I've got to know first, I tell you. You don't understand, Ted. There was somebody in Uncle Miles' room that night, handing him something in a silver cup. Mrs. Henderson was on the porch by the window. She saw her. She saw her? Ted. She thinks it was my wife. Oh, Lucy. It doesn't mean anything to Mrs. Henderson yet, because she doesn't suspect anything, but, well... Ted, you've got to see why I've got to be sure. Why I've got to know how Uncle Miles died. Because it wasn't Lucy, Ted. I know it wasn't. Of course not, Mark. She had an alibi. Well, she was with you at the club, wasn't she? Yes. Except for half an hour. I see. You'll help me, won't you, Ted? When do we start? As soon as you can make it. Okay. Come on now. I'll get your hat. You trot on ahead and I'll come over as soon as I can see Marie. But you're not going to tell her about this? Of course not. I'll think of something. Don't you worry about it. No, thanks, Ted. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marie? Come, Tony. Uh, darling, uh, Mark asked me to... Uh... I know, Ted. Here. You better take these sandwiches with you. You'll be hungry. Oh, but you knew I was going out? Yes, I knew. You listened to us? I couldn't help it, Ted. I had an idea what Mark's visit was about. The talk about his uncle's death. There's a lot of gossip about it in the village. That's why I tried to tell you why I didn't want you to get mixed up in it. But it's too late now, isn't it? I mean, you're going. I can tell by the way you look. Ted, wait a second. There's just one thing I want to tell you before you leave. And that is that no matter what happens, no matter what you find or think or believe, I love you. You'll remember that, won't you? I'll remember you said so, Marie. By the light of a dim kerosene lantern, Mark and Ted Stevens pounded their way through the thick shelf of rock that covered the Depar's ancestral tomb. Pried open the great slab of stone which lay across the subterranean door and then at last descended to the dank, ink-black chamber. They found the coffin. They dragged it from its crypt and placed it on the cold stone floor. They unclamped the lid and opened it. Mark! It's empty. What? That's impossible. It can't be. But it is, Mark. You know what this means? That body wasn't in this coffin when it was placed here. I'll swear it was, Ted. From the time that coffin was closed on Uncle Miles, somebody, the undertaker or Lucy or me, somebody was with it until it was buried. And the crypt was sealed right after. Then somebody beat us to it. Somebody's broken in here ahead of us. Broken in? Listen, Ted. Lucy and I have hardly left the house since the funeral. Do you think anybody could break in here? Smash through that stone and cement without our seeing them or without our hearing them? Well, well. What? Well, you might as well. Come on out, then. But who was that? Me, Mr. Depard, up here. My name's Captain Brennan. I'm from the office of the Commissioner of Police. From the... I'd like to talk to you if you don't mind, Mr. Depard. Here, uh, follow my flashlight up. But I don't understand. How did you... 
How did you know about this? By listening, mainly. You mind if we go up to your house, Mr. Depard? Why, no. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, thank you. Oh, Freddy. Uh, look here, Captain. Uh, 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 Freddy, this is Mr. Depard, Lieutenant Gray. Oh, Glad to know you, Mr. Depard. And Mr. Uh, Ted Stevens, isn't it? Well, how did you... How did you know my name? Very simple. I got the names of everybody who was here at the day past the day the old man died. You and your wife were included. Oh, here we are. But I don't... Uh, uh, Captain, who gave you those names? Why, your housekeeper, of course. Mrs. Henderson? You didn't think Mrs. Henderson saw the dead cat, did you, Mr. Depart? But she did. She also saw you bury it. And uh, we've been interested in the case ever since. Well, nice place you have here, Mr. Depard. Now, let's see. According to Mrs. Henderson, your wife was wearing some kind of a masquerade costume that night. What kind of a thing was it? Well, it was... A... Oh, there, you can see it. It was copied from the dress in that old painting over there. Oh, yes. Mm, funny, well, where's the woman's face? It's always been that way, long as I can remember. Somebody must have thrown acid on it or something. <laughs> Can't blame them much. She was a poisoner. A poisoner? Yes. The story goes that one of my ancestors was responsible for her execution. Marie Dobray, her name was. Oh, yes. I have read about her. Learned all the poison tricks from one of her lovers, guy by the name of Godin Saint Croix. Godin Saint. Oh, yes, Mr. Stevens. We cops read now and then. Did, <laughs> did you say Godin Saint Croix? That's French. We call it cross. <laughs> Absolutely no limit to a cop's education, is there? <laughs> but to uh, get back to your wife, Mr. Depard, she was dressed like the famous Marie. Now, when Mrs. Henderson looked through that window... Just a minute, Captain. Mrs. Henderson can't prove she saw a thing, and you know it. Now, what do you mean? I mean you haven't any right to insinuate that my wife was in that room. Well, who's insinuating? I, I'm trying to say that Mrs. Henderson, after thinking it over, realized that she was tricked by the costume. The woman she saw in the funny clothes... Handing the cup of poison to your uncle wasn't your wife at all. What? Because your wife is an unusually tall young woman. And the one Mrs. Henderson saw was fully half a head shorter. More on the order, let's say, of uh, Mr. Stevens' wife. My wife? Captain, Why, this is absolutely ridiculous. Well, I don't know. It... All right, what's the matter, Mr. Stevens? You're trembling like a leaf. Uh, tell me now, uh, just for fun. Where was Mrs. Stevens that night? She was home, with me. The whole evening? Certainly. She retired early? Yes, we both did. You, I suppose, were sound asleep by midnight. Yes, I was. Then how do you know where your wife was? Well, I... Look here, Stevens. She had to have a costume that would match Mrs. Depard's. How did she manage that? Where did she get it? Well, she, she never had one. She never had a dress like that. And what about her motive? Why did she poison him? I don't know. Not for money, certainly. Then what was it? Hate? Did she hate Miles Depard? Oh, yes, yes, she did. Claire, no! Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, I tell you. Brown? Yes, Freddy? I phoned and got hold of Mrs. Depard and the nurse, all right. That Mrs. Stevens couldn't reach her. Her phone won't answer. Okay, have her picked up. I'm going home. Stevens, come back here. I'm going to get my wife. Come in. Stop it, Brenner. My name is Cross. Go down, Cross. Cross? Where's my wife? What have you done to her? <laughs> you fiend, what have you done to my wife? You are nothing at all, young man. Here, 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 sit down. You're lying. Something's happened to her. The police just phoned. There wasn't an answer. <laughs> Why are you here? Why am I here? Well, because your wife, reading my chapter on the Dubrays, realized I knew more about the family than even she did. Because she found my phone number on the front cover of the manuscript. And because I know an exceptional case when I hear one. Does that answer your question? No, and you know it doesn't. Can't you see I've got to... I've got to know whether... Yeah, I see. Whether your wife is that Marie Dobre, who was burnt. Burnt by order of the High Tribunal for all poison cases. The burning court of France. Witchcraft. Black magic. The world across the threshold. You're quite sure, no doubt, also, that I'm Godin Saint Croix, who first wooed her. No, no, my boy. 
<laughs> no, my real name happens to be, of all things, Tom Simpson. Most unsuitable for a distinguished writing career. And Marie Dobre is no more your wife's real name than mine is Gordon Cross. What? Your esteemed wife was an adopted child, Mr. Stevens. Adopted by people in Canada named Dobre. Remote members of the real family of poisoners. I can't believe it. Why? Why didn't she tell me? You, why? Because until I told her half an hour ago, she didn't know it herself. You see, in the course of my research on the family, I found out about it. And in the course of talking with your wife, I found out something else. How for years she was haunted by the fear that she might be a poisoner by inheritance, by blood. And you can see, can't you, why she never talked about it? Her yes. past to you? Yes, yes. And yet, Mr. Stevens, you had all but made her forget that past. You. And that's why she was willing to lie to steal a picture, do anything, in order to hold you to her. Yes, yes, I, I, I see that now. You know, young man, I, I rather think she loves you. But as you will see, though, I, she comes only when I call her. Uh, Mrs. Stevens? You mean she's... Yes, Mr. Cross. Marie, it's you. You're all right? Oh, yes, dear, we're both all right now, and nothing can change it ever. Marie, listen. Don't say Marie, dear. Say Maggie. Maggie? Oh, well, that's my name, my real name. Maggie McTavish, and it's a lovely name, dear. The most beautiful, gorgeous... Darling, ever. darling, please, you don't understand. The police, they think you had something to do with Miles' death. They think I did. So, now, Mr. Stevens, before we go back to the Depars, don't you think you'd better tell me everything that's been said and done up to date? Having just saved your wife's soul from the burning court, now I'll rest her body from the electric chair. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Depar, truly excellent sherry. Don't you think so, Miss Corbett? Yes. Yes, it's very nice. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I happen to be here. So let us consider first that supernatural hocus-pocus in the crypt. That body that walked out of the sealed tomb. That body that never was in the tomb. Never was in the tomb? No, Mr. Depar. The murderer knew that very soon Mrs. Henderson's story would bring about an investigation. He had to get rid of the well-known corpus delicti. Yes, but who could have kept the body out of the tomb? Who, Mr. Depar? Why, you, sir. What? Oh, no, what? Oh, I, I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. You had the opportunity. I believe you said yourself you were alone with the body before the burial. And you had the strength. I dare say you carried it down to the furnace. Where it's now, probably nothing but ashes. Ridiculous. Why would he spend an hour smashing into a crypt for a body he knew wasn't there? Why, Captain? Hmm. To impress Mr. Stevens, his witness. And also, apparently, you. Oh, that's perfectly fantastic. Fantastic? <laughs> oh, no, Lucy. Just comic. And I suppose, Mr. Cross, that I also put on a woman's masquerade costume, went into my uncle's room and handed him a nice cup of arsenic. No, <laughs> no, no. That had to be done by a woman. Your accomplice, as a matter of fact. Oh, now, come, come, come. You mustn't all look at Mrs. Depar, because Mark Depar's one noble act was his frantic effort to prevent his wife from being charged with the crime. A crime which he and nurse Myra Corbett committed. Myra Corbett? Why, you... Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Stevens, this quiet little lady beside but, me. Well, why would I do such a thing? Money, Miss Corbett. A cutout of Mark Depar's inheritance. Payments for but, services rendered. That's an absolute lie, Croft. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Brennan never bothered to check Miss Corbett's whereabouts on the night of the murder. Why even think of the nurse? She was the custodian of the old man's health. Oh, you're crazy. You're crazy. And I yet think. who but a nurse could so naturally offer the old man a cup? A cup he was sure contained medicine. You're making it up. The whole thing, you're just And who it but Miss Corbett, living right here in this house, would know what kind of masquerade dress she must copy, would know when Mrs. Henderson would pass the window that night, pass and see her, and accept her, she hoped, for Lucy Depart. No! Oh, that's not true. Oh, yes, Miss Corbett. Yes, Miss Corbett, that dress was the touch that wrecked you. That was your own idea, wasn't it? Not Mark's. You weren't content with a mere murderer's share of the profits. You wanted a wife share, half of the whole estate. You wanted Lucy Depart convicted and out of the way for good. Mm. Well, I give you a toast, Miss Corbett, with Mr. Depart's excellent sherry to a particularly ruthless poisoner. And yet, you know, on the whole, 
I'm rather partial to female poisoners. Why, only tonight I... I... <coughs> Mr. Cook, what's the matter, Brennan? This man's dead. Dead? And from cyanide, if I know anything. Cyanide from that glass of sherry. Cyanide that a nurse could get quite easily. That glass was right beside you, Miss Corbett, and nobody else was near it. Too bad he didn't drink it as soon as you hoped. A second ago, we had nobody to use against you. But we have now, Miss Corbett. We have now. And I arrest you for the murder of Gordon Cross. <laughs> months ago that the prominent author was murdered, and tonight Myra Corbett pays with her life for that crime. The former nurse, at first protesting oh, her dear. innocence, in recent Yes, cases, I'm in here, dear. Oh, oh. I thought you might... Oh, what did you cut it off for? Huh? What do you mean? The radio. Oh. Oh, yeah, well, I thought you wanted to talk. Oh, Ted, don't you think I know you better than that? What was on the radio? Well, there wasn't any... Okay. It was about Myra Corbett. She goes to the chair tonight. Oh. I didn't think you wanted to be reminded. I don't, really. But making such an effort to hide it only keeps it alive, doesn't it? All right, darling. Know what I came in to ask? If you ordered a cocktail before dinner? The largest one you've got. Fine. I'll get off the ice cube. I know. If I'll fix up the fire. Okay, Maria. A deal. Uh, where are some papers to start it? <laughs> right there by the bookcase. And the name's not Marie. It's Maggie. Because, darling, Marie's dead and gone forever. Oh, no, Marie. We're never dead. Neither of us. It was your hand that touched that glass. I know that now. And I could return the favor. But instead, I shall ask that you dispatch your husband. This one, like all the others, now. Just a little bit of poison in the drink, Marie. Any kind of a drink. What kind, Ted? Hmm? What kind of a cocktail shall we have? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Any kind, darling. Any kind at all. You've just heard The Burning Court from John Dixon Carr's famous novel... The first in Columbia's new series of outstanding classics and chills by world-famous authors. Tonight's play, ladies and gentlemen, has one rather special significance we think you'd like to know about. As you perhaps have heard, every fine comedian is said to cherish a secret desire to do an abrupt about face. He pines for the part of a blackguard. Well, tonight you witness the fulfillment of one such desire. The role of that literary and quite infamous diehard Gordon Cross was portrayed by none other than Hollywood's expert provoker of laughs, Charlie Ruggles, here in New York for the world premiere of his latest screen success, Friendly Enemies. The role of Marie? Well, that was enacted by a young lady who long ago won national acclaim as one of Broadway's most accomplished dramatic actresses, Miss Julie Hayden. Thank you, Charlie Ruggles and Miss Julie Hayden, for your splendid performances. The play tonight, as all plays in this series, was produced and directed by Charles Vander, written by Harold Metford and scored by Bernard Herman. Next week, we bring you an intensely exciting and moving drama, The Life of Nellie James. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Father Brown. And here
here he is, Father Brown, the best-loved detective of them all. Humanity produces optimists only because it has never produced a really happy man. From the masterful and exciting pages of G.K. Chesterton comes that fascinating human being, Father Brown, played by Carl Swenson. Underneath the modest exterior of Father Brown is the rich character of a generous, deeply human man with a sensitive and quick-witted mind. In addition to being a man of God, he is a man of the world, a man of science, and a brilliant amateur detective. And now, the three tools of death. Facing the afterglow of a beautiful summer sunset, Father Brown sits alone in the study of his modest parish house. He is half dozing when Nora, his housekeeper, enters. Father Brown. Hmm. Father Brown. No. <clears throat> yes, Nora. <clears throat> what, what time is it? Time for your tea. Here it is, nice and hot. Ah, thank you. Just set it there, please. Were you asleep? Oh, who's in between, Nora? Just in between. A beautiful state of being, I assure you. Half out of this world and half in. It's a good thing young Father Peter took over your duties for a day. I told him... Oh. There's somebody at the door. Don't worry, I'll take care of that. No. Oh, good evening, Nora. Is Father Brown in? I'm sorry, Flambeau, but he's rested. No, no, Nora. You, you know Flambeau's always welcome. Tell him to come in. Oh, all right. Come in, come in, Flambeau. Have a cup of tea. Uh, no, thanks, Father. I'm all upset. A friend of mine is in trouble. Oh. Will you come with me to Oakville? My car's outside. Here, here. No, not so fast. Get your breath. Sit down. Father, hmm. you've heard of Aaron Armstrong, the philanthropist and lecturer? Oh, Armstrong. The author of those bestsellers on how to be happy, etc. Had that such a tremendous following? Yes, Father. That's the one. Oh, yes. Uh, I've I read his books. And I attended one of his lectures once in which he offered his followers an easy road to happiness. Or heaven, as he called it. That's the guy, Father. Yes. As I remember, he um, apparently based his teachings on one of the Proverbs of Solomon. A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bone. Uh-huh. Yes. He believed in giving up all the physical appetites, smoking, overeating, and drinking. <laughs> yes, and above all, he believed in being cheerful. He, he dealt with a drink problem with an enormous gaiety. Well, he's dead. He, what? His body was discovered early this morning. Well, you don't say. Where? Right near his house, in a ditch on the parkway. What happened? Nobody knows. But according to the police, it looks like murder. Uh, did you say his, clo uh, his house is close to the parkway? Yes, on an embankment just above it. Well, what makes the police think it wasn't an accident, Flambeau? Well, he was wearing only his dressing gown. And another strange thing, Father. A small piece of rope was tied around one of his ankles. Was any weapon found? No, but it was apparent he'd been struck on the head by a huge instrument of some sort. Cuts and bruises on his body showed signs of a struggle. Well, who put you on the case? Oh, no one. The dead man's secretary, Robert Royce, uh -huh. is an old friend of mine. I called him as soon as I heard the news and offered him my services as private investigator. But he, he refused to see me. Well, that's strange. No, yet, yet, no. Not so strange if he were implicated. Who else is there beside Royce in the household? Just Armstrong's daughter. A very attractive girl, I hear, but completely dominated by her father's cheerfulness. Uh -huh. And there's also a gardener, I believe. And uh, your friend Royce, uh, well, what sort of man is he? Oh, he's a huge, genial sort of fellow, a Scotsman. Did he and Armstrong get along well together? Oh, Royce was devoted to him. Ah, uh, yes. Armstrong had many devoted followers. You know, he's always interested me, Flambeau. He, he puzzled me, in fact. Puzzled you? Yes. When, when first I heard him lecture, I, I remember thinking that he had a troublesome road ahead. I believe that somewhere in his life, you'll find the secret of his death. But, Father, according to the papers, he lived as he preached. Oh, yes, I know, I know, Flambeau. The old fellow's optimism was phenomenal. But somehow I don't believe he found that easy road to heaven, as he called it. No? No. Neither have I. There is no shortcut to heaven, my friend. But who would want to kill such a man? 
Well, if, if ever I murdered somebody, I dare say it might well be an optimist of the proportions of Lord Armstrong. His optimism was so out of proportion. I've heard cheerfulness referred to as a virtue. Yeah, well, people like frequent laughter, but a permanent smile, Flambeau. Well, now that, that's something else again. As Shakespeare says, the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Oh, Father, it's six o'clock. We're just in time for the news. Let's turn on the radio. That's a good idea. Perhaps there's something further on the case. Listen. Clear tonight and tomorrow somewhat cooler. Now we bring you a special bulletin just handed me on the Armstrong case. Yeah, turn us up, Flambeau. John Magnus, the gardener, the millionaire philanthropist, has been reported missing. Oh. Also, negotiable bonds for the dead man valued at $100,000. The police received this report only a short while ago and are now conducting a statewide search for the gardener. It is believed... Well... Ah. That seems to be the first real clue. Do you mind if I use the phone, Father? Uh, I'd like yeah. to uh, talk to Royce again. Yeah. The call uh, will cost you a nickel. Tax, two cents. That's seven cents. It, it just drop a dime in the poor box on your way out. All right, Father. Hello, Royce? This is Flambeau. Now, wait a minute. We just heard the news about the gardener's disappearance. Oh, hold on, hold on. You remember the friend I was telling you about? Yes, Father Brown. Well, we'd like to come up. What's that? Oh, I don't get it. Royce. Royce. My father, he's hung up. What did he say? He said if we valued our lives, we wouldn't go near that house. Ah, interesting. Well, well. Flambeau, that's what I call a real invitation. Come on, my friend, let's go. Well, I'm sure there's someone here, Father. Hmm. Ring again, Flambeau. Ah, here's someone now. Yes? What do you want? Oh, good evening, Royce. So it's you, Flambeau. I thought I warned you plain enough over the phone. You did. But look here, Royce. I don't understand... It was plain English I spoke. I know, but you sounded like you were in trouble. Well, I'm not. Oh, come, man. Don't act as though we weren't friends. Oh, this is Father Brown. Uh, I gathered as much. Um, Mr. Royce, I, I, I'm afraid I'm to blame for this visit. Well, it was good to be here to come, Father, but I wish you'd both heeded my warning. Man, what kind of a friend would I have been if I had? I tell you, the police have already investigated. I know, I know. I've talked with them. Uh, perhaps we can help you, Mr. Royce. Help? In what way? Well, uh, maybe we could tell better if you'd ask us in. Very well. You may come in. But you should have let sleeping dogs lie, Flambeau. <laughs> I must confess I can't find anything here in Armstrong's room that tells us very much. And just what did you expect to find? Mr. Rice. Yes? Uh, what do you make of the gardener's disappearance? Magnus is a fool, maybe a thief, but he never killed Mr. Armstrong. I'm sure it was the deed of a madman. Uh, I see. My, my, my. Well, I would never have expected those to be there. Father, what are you looking at? Uh, that pair of socks over there thrown under the bureau. Oh, they shall be in the bureau drawer. Here, I'll put them away. Uh, wait, uh, may I have a look at those bureau drawers, Mr. Rice? What for? Well, I'd just like to look. What are you searching for? Well, I'll take a peep at that closet, too, if you don't mind. Well, now that's funny. What, Father? Everything looked so neat when we came in. Mr. Armstrong was always very particular. Everything is in order on the surface. But underneath, underneath... Things look different. What things? Well, in the closet, his socks are stuffed in the hangers with the suits. And in the bureau drawers, under those beautifully laid-out shirts... Yes? A whole lot of ginger spilled from a box. Why do you have to go on with this? The police went over the room very thoroughly. The room, perhaps. But they seem to have missed this piece of rope. Look here. I found it caught in the vine just below the ledge of the window. Well, it couldn't have been there this morning or the police would have found it. Well, I just saw the wind blow an end of it out from under the vine. Royce, maybe you can tell me how this piece of rope got there. What has that got to do with the case? You know perfectly well a piece of rope was tied around the leg of the dead man. That rope in your hand was left from fixing the windows. Well, now, I'm just wondering. Wondering, wondering what, Father? 
Well, let me take a look out of that window. Why? For a very good reason. The police haven't yet established why the dead man was found on the parkway. No. No, that isn't it. The window isn't high enough for the from the ground for him to have fallen. Or been pushed or to have jumped. Right. And not high enough for his body to have rolled down the embankment to the parkway. Mr. Rice, isn't there another floor to this house? Eh, uh, there's only an attic. Mm. Robert? Robert? That's Miss Armstrong. She's been much upset since her father's death. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You'll have to excuse me for a moment. Certainly. Father, hmm. I don't like the look of things. This rope I found in the vine was cut with a sharp instrument. The rope found on Armstrong's ankle was also cut with a sharp instrument. Mm. And did you notice the cut on Royce's knuckle? Yes, yes, I did, Flambeau. But, uh, you know, I haven't noticed any geniality. He's hardly the person you described to me. Yes, I know, Father. Didn't like him. Nevertheless, it seems to fit his unshaven appearance. It's the first time I've ever seen him that way, either. You're worried about your friend's innocence, aren't you? Well, I know how the mind of a thief works, Father. I was once a thief myself. But murder... Do you think he's capable of murder? Well, the answer to that one is more up your alley, Father. Well, in any event, he's hiding something. But I think there is a secret in this house more important than his. And I'm very anxious to find out what it is. Now, first, look at the stains on the wall. And you felt the dust on the banisters as we came up. Well... Well, but the, 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 the question fairly screams at us, Flambeau. What question? Why are there no servants in this house? Yeah. Well, Armstrong certainly had plenty of money. He could afford them. Mm -hmm. There could only be one reason. If the old man himself had something to hide. Father, you mean you think Armstrong... Well, I... Miss Armstrong's in the drawing room downstairs. She'd like to talk to you, Father Brown. If you will please follow me. Well, I, I hesitate to continue, Miss Armstrong. I, I know how badly you feel. Please go on, Father Brown. I'm quite all right. But that bruise on your forehead, Miss Armstrong. Oh, that's nothing. It doesn't bother me. I bumped it. Your father had a great many followers, didn't he? Oh, yes, he helped so many people. Do you know why your father decided to give up all his servants? Well, great men like my father have their peculiarities. Their ideas are often different from other people's. Yes, very true, Mr. Royce, very true. I was only wondering... Wait. This... What? This... Someone's unlocking the front door. Who could it be? No one has a key besides us. Who's that? Me, Magnus. Magnus? Yes, Miss Armstrong. Magnus. And here is Inspector Vincent. Well, how are you, Inspector? Fine, Father Brown, fine. Uh, hello, Flambeau. I might have known you two would be here. Well, I see you got your man, Inspector. Is this the gardener who walked out of here with $100,000 worth of bonds? Walked out of here and right into my office to place them in my charge. Hello, Royce. Uh, are you feeling better, Miss Armstrong? Yes, thank you, Inspector. Now, Magnus... Perhaps you'd care to tell Miss Armstrong why you took those bonds without consulting her. No one in this household is to be trusted. Not even Miss Armstrong. Now, see here, Magnus. Just a minute, Royce. What I want to know, why did you wait so long before reporting this gardener's absence? We didn't think much of it, Inspector, until I noticed the bonds were gone, too. I was waiting for you to report it. Magnus has been telling me some very interesting things. A new angle on the case, Inspector? Well, it closes the case if Magnus is telling the truth. Inspector, what this man says is not to be taken seriously. He's not been himself. What makes you say that? Magnus used to be my father's personal valet, Inspector. But he was taken off that and put to work in the garden. He's been very upset. He thought it was quite a come down. Hmm. Upset, am I? Well, I like that. I wasn't going to tell the inspector about you two being in love. But now Be I... Be careful what you say, Magnus. You weren't so careful what you said when I heard you two talking in the garden the other night. Magnus. I've stood enough of this. Take it easy, Royce. Inspector, may I make a suggestion? Uh, just I... a minute, Father Brown. Magnus, what are you getting at? About four nights ago it was. I heard them in the garden. He was begging her to marry him. They didn't know I was close by. No... No, Robert, we mustn't. But, Alice, you've no life of your own. Let's face your father now. 
Let's tell him how much we love each other. Oh, but Robert, we must wait. We really ought to. I know how important you are to his work, but what about us? Our life. We can't go on waiting forever. Oh, but Robert, it won't be forever. Oh, darling, you know I love you. You must be sure of that. I am sure, my dearest. Oh, if only I could get my hands on some money. Oh, what do you mean, Robert? I'd make you marry me then, Alice. Oh, Robert. I feel guilty even thinking of it. We mustn't, my darling. Not now. So long as he's alive. I'll find some way out of this. Shh. I thought I heard someone. We better not talk here. Come. Yes. Come, my dear. Well, that's all I could hear. But I suspected them what they were up to, and now I know. You know what? That they would be off with the money. Mr. Armstrong's money. The money he had wanted to be used for his work. Inspector, this talk is ridiculous. You don't Mr. think... Mr. Royce, do you use an old-fashioned razor? I? You didn't use it today. Why? Why, I... I mislaid it. When? I don't know. Since, since I last shaved, I guess. That was yesterday. You can tell by his beard. Magnus brought your razor into the precinct with him with the bonds. I'm holding it as evidence. Why? Because it had a smear of blood on it. Oh, well, I must have cut myself shaving and forgot to wipe it. Oh, Inspector, is this all the evidence you have of Royce's guilt? Who said anything about Royce's guilt? Now, Magnus, tell them what you told me just now in the office. I was sleeping in my room over the garage, and about four this morning I heard shots. Followed by loud outcries, which seemed to come from the attic. An instant later, I I saw Mr. Armstrong's body pitch from the window and roll down the embankment. When I made sure he was dead, I rushed up to the attic and found his daughter unconscious on the floor with a razor in her hand. You mean Miss Armstrong killed her father? It's a lie! Surely, Father Brown, you for one will take Miss Armstrong's word against his gardeners. But is Miss Armstrong's word against him? So far, she has said nothing. Miss Armstrong... Can't you speak? Magnus told the truth. There, you see? I'll get you for this. I'll get you. Here now. You'll not say things like that. I will and I do. Royce, go on. Let go. None of that, Royce. Or I'll arrest you for assault. No. You'll arrest me for murder. Robert. But, man, you've been Armstrong's best friend. What possessed you? I was drunk. Sure. Didn't I find those empty bottles hidden in the garden? Piling up week after week. Sure. I knew what was going on here. Now, now, Magnus, you've told your story. Let Royce tell his. Maybe he was too drunk to remember. Miss Armstrong did not pick up the razor to attack, but to defend her father from me. In the scuffle, she hit her head against the eaves of the attic. I hurried down to get something to revive her, and it must have been then that Magnus came in and found her. Oh, Robert. Robert. All right, Royce. Come along. Uh, wait, Inspector, before you arrest Royce. What is it now, Father Brown? Well, so far we've had opinions and confessions. But we haven't had facts. And we need facts. And where do you think we'll find them? In the attic. In the attic? Uh, yes, Inspector. Perhaps by climbing a few steps nearer heaven, we can come closer to this evil. <laughs> Father, I can't figure out what you expect to find in this attic. Uh, you you sleep here, don't you, Mr. Royce? Aye. And Mr. Armstrong slept in the room immediately below this. Aye, but why all these questions? Well, now, in the first place, Mr. Royce, uh, why did you bring your victim up here at the crack of dawn in order to kill him? Why didn't you go to his room? Well? I confess. Isn't that enough? Well, confession is good for the soil, it's granted, but, uh, Inspector... You, you remember Magnus telling us he was awakened by shots? Yes. What about those shots, Inspector? Were any bullets found in Armstrong's body? Well, we investigated and didn't find a one. Wait, wait. Here is my pistol. I fired those shots. You can see the holes in the carpet. Well, why should anybody fire at the carpet? A drunken man will let fly at anything. Uh, he doesn't pick a quarrel with his feet. And there's the rope. It was from my window here that Armstrong was thrown. And the piece of rope I found fell to the vines below. What about the blow on the head? According to our report, he was struck by a massive weapon. A massive weapon indeed, Inspector. Sure, the good green earth was the weapon. Okay, so the good green earth was the weapon. But look, this room was the beginning of the murder. Even I can see from the disorder. Come on, Royce. 
Let's go. But the disorder here is all on the surface. The very opposite of Armstrong's room. No, no. It doesn't fit. Too many inconsistencies. Father Brown. Royce has given himself up. No, 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 no. Really, this won't do at all. What won't do? Well, first the police said no weapon was found at all. Now we're finding too many. Too many? Now, there's the razor to cut a person, the rope to strangle, the pistol to shoot, and after all this... Armstrong broke his skull falling out of a window. No, 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 no. It won't do. It's not economical. Alice, they won't believe me. You tell them. Inspector. Yes, young lady. May I speak to Father Brown alone for a moment? If you must, but be quick. We can't wait around here all night. And now what is it, my child? What is it that you wish to say? You're trying to save Robert. But it's no use. I should have realized before this his case is hopeless. Before he came to us, he was a prisoner of war. He had some shocking experiences. Well, you think that was the reason for his drinking? Yes, he wasn't himself at times. Mm. We thought he was getting over it, but... Father, I saw Robert commit the crime myself. Mm. I heard the shots. I ran up just in time to see him leap at my father. Where was your father standing? He was clinging to the windowsill in terror. But uh, the rope... Robert tried to strangle him with it. Father fought back and the rope slipped from his shoulders to his feet, tightening around the leg. Robert was like a maniac. I snatched the razor from the floor and managed to cut the rope before he pushed me against uh, the eaves. Miss ease. Armstrong, what we see with our eyes is sometimes farthest from the truth. Now, you thought that you saw a man about to commit murder. What you actually saw was two men struggling, and then you lost consciousness. But, Father Brown... I want you to go downstairs, my dear. I don't understand. Go on now, please. Do as I say. Very well. Thank you, my dear. Well, Father Brown, I've seen and heard enough to convince me. Unless you know something pretty startling, I'm taking Royce down and booking him. If you don't mind, Inspector, I'd like to talk to Royce a bit before you do. What about, Father? Oh, where's Alice? She's out of earshot, Mr. Royce. So why don't you tell us about it now? Tell you about what? I see. Well, then I'll tell you, Inspector. Those three tools of death were not used to kill Armstrong, but to save him. Save him? Father, I don't get this. Save him from what? From himself. At the time old Armstrong died, he was a suicidal maniac. No, Royce, you weren't drinking. No? No, and you were the only one who knew what lurked behind old Armstrong's laughter. No, no. Yes, you knew what, uh, that behind that merry mask was the mind of an atheist. No. A man who knew nothing of God. He didn't realize until it was too late that human beings need something to worship greater than themselves. I warn Flambeau not to bring you here, Father. I was afraid it might come to this. Well, man, what harm is there in the truth now? Alice must never know. Why? Why shouldn't she be told that you weren't the enemy her father feared? Shall I name the enemy, Royce? All right, Father Brown, you win. This morning, Armstrong was determined to do away with himself. He knew I kept my service pistol in my dresser. And when he heard me go down to the kitchen early at dawn, he left his room and came up here. And you came in and accidentally surprised him. I, I got the pistol out of his hand, but in the struggle I had no time to unload, so I fired at the carpet. Then he found my razor and tried to slash himself. Mm. I snatched it from him and flung it to the floor. I ran after him with a rope to tie him up. And it was then that the unlucky girl ran in and misunderstanding the struggle. She tried to cut her father free with a razor. She cut the rope, slashing my knuckle just as I pushed her, and he went crashing into eternity out of that window. But, Father Brown, you spoke of an, of an enemy, old man Armstrong, feared. I did, yes. You mean the enemy was in this room with him at the same time as Royce? Yes. Who was it? The sin. The very thing Armstrong was so vehement against. You mean alcohol? It was his worst enemy. The moment I saw the ginger in one of the bureau drawers downstairs, I suspected it was the futile effort of a man who was trying to give up drinking. Isn't that right, Rice? Yes, Father Brown. Armstrong was living a lie, and it preyed on his mind. And he feared his public might find him out. Aye. The more despondent he got, the darker visions he had of failing his followers. The people who looked to him for guidance. So fearful was he of anyone praying into his secret that 
He hid from his friends and got rid of all his servants. And you were the only one he could confide in. I. He didn't understand your loyalty, did he? No, but it was for her sake, you see. And so you kept the knowledge of his spells to yourself, letting his daughter believe it was you, the result of the war. I. Well, Royce, I can't imagine why you didn't speak up before. Don't you see? It was because she must never know. Never know what? Why, that she killed her own father. I see. By trying to free him. My son, I think she should know. After all, it was only an accident. And accidents, no matter how tragic, do not poison life like sins. I think you should both be happier now. Surely, two private lives are worth more than the public reputation of Aaron Armstrong. Well, Father, at last you're back. Yes, we were worried. Uh, hello, Nora. Hello, Peter. Have you had dinner? I, uh... No, no, I don't think I have. Oh, that's a shame. I'd better go fix you something right away. Ah, oh, my. It's nice to sit down again. Oh, Peter, you missed your story tonight. I'm sorry. Father, I heard tonight's story. Many versions of it. You did? How? From the news commentators over the radio. Oh. They've been reading bulletins on it every half hour or so. I see. Tell me, Father, what made you suspect Royce wasn't guilty? Well, looking into the hidden places of his attic room convinced me of Royce's innate neatness, Peter. I don't quite see. Well, I, I knew that no one as orderly as Royce could commit such a murder. The whole thing was too sloppy. I mean, the three tools of death. But how did you discover that Armstrong was a suicide? Well, the same method, but in reverse. I'm afraid my methods are not orthodox, Peter. I'm no real detective. To, to me, a man's inner nature must be revealed first. Armstrong's habits revealed his nature just as Royce's did. They justified certain suspicions I had when Flambeau told me of his death. What do you mean? Well, Armstrong's erratic character was uh, clear to me when I looked into his bureau drawers. See, there, there I saw the compartments of his mind. The neatness mixed with the disorder which his friend Royce had tried to cover up. The litter reflecting the mind of the depressed. Surely you had something more than that to prove he was a suicide? Well, uh, yes, Peter, I had myself. Yourself? Yes. I dare say that... I would feel as Armstrong did if I had ever preached an easy road to happiness and then had slipped into a ditch by the side of the road. Yes, Father, I see. Yes. Well, now, uh, good night, Father Peter. Good night, Father Brown. <laughs> been listening to The Adventures of Father Brown with Carl Swenson as Father Brown. Father Brown's adventure tonight was called The Three Tools of Death. The character of Father Brown was created by G.K. Chesterton in the detective novels called The Adventures of Father Brown. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.
adventures in time and space. Transcribed in future tense. Dimension. Can you predict what will come in 100 years, or in 10, or in the next minute? Some people think they can. Nuclear science, mathematicians, astronomers, biologists. They'll predict the shape of the future because they make the future. Because they see beyond the known dimensions of time and space into the unknown dimension X. We go ahead now in time to 1965. We're on a vast concrete runway set in the desert of the southwest. A giant metal ship stands before us, prow pointed for the stars. And in five minutes, the signal will flash, and it will tear up through the atmosphere to the outer limit. Five minutes, Steve. All right. Warm her up, Charlie. Hello, I want to go over procedure again, Steve. Don't worry, I got it straight. You just make sure. Okay. I take her up on jets to 50,000, then I cut in the rocket. No lower, or your tail blast will burn out three counties. I climb four minutes on rockets, then start maneuver test. Remember that. No more than four minutes. Right. This ship isn't like those strata rockets you've been testing. She's the first one built for outer space. If she works, she can go clear to the moon. But I know that, I'd have brought my toothbrush. Well, not this trip. Now, get this, Steve. You've got power there to clear the Earth's gravitational field. But remember, after you cut in the rockets, you've only got ten minutes fuel. If you go beyond the outer limit and don't save fuel for the return... I know, I won't get down again. That's right, Steve. You'll drift off into space. Get that now. Ten minutes fuel. Gotcha. As far as I'm concerned, this project is a lot more important than that cosmic ray bomb they're testing out in the Pacific tonight. Well, Security Commission Brass doesn't think so. I don't see any undersecretaries under anything. Don't worry. In the long run, our ship will make the CR bomb back page stuff. But in the meantime, it's just as dangerous. Remember, half the principles in this ship are pure theory, Steve. Slide rule stuff. If anything goes wrong, we may have to scrape you off the landscape with a soup spoon. You have a charming sense of humor. And here's what I'm getting at. We're risking your neck in this test. If anything blows, we don't want to have the next man pull the same boner. I know, Hank. So keep your mic open and keep talking. If anything goes wrong, we want to know exactly why. And we won't be able to ask you. Let us know before you pull every switch. Before you do anything. You got that? Yeah. Even if you only have to blow your nose. All right, get those fuel lines away. Okay, Mr. Brogan. Well, I guess that's about all, Steve. Yeah, that reminds me. Look, if Mary calls, I'm just up on a milk run. I didn't tell her today was it. How is she? She's okay, but she's due about now, and I don't want her to be nervous. Hey, I didn't know the baby was that close. Yeah. Steve, I, I really ought to be sending a single man on this job. What, cut me out of a soft paycheck? Forget it, Hank. You know, you can't get anybody else who can take 15 G's acceleration when those rockets cut in. Yeah, I know. It's time, Steve. Yeah. Well, see you later. Don't worry, Hank. I'll sweat for both of us. Button her up, Charlie. So long, Hank. So long. We'll give you the light from control. Okay, Steve. Got you on the speaker. I'm ready to go. Mr. Hanson. Ready on radar, Sergeant? Yes. Mr. Hanson, you better see this. What is it, Elsa? Message center for Steve. Mrs. Weston just left for the hospital. What? Hello, Steve. Yeah. Stand by a minute. Shall we hold the takeoff, Mr. Hanson? What? Oh, yes. Uh, no, wait, wait just a minute. It's uh, it's too late now. You going to tell him? Maybe he's got enough to worry about. Hey, what's holding us up, Hank? Something in your mind? No, no, it's, uh, it's nothing, Steve. I just wanted to say good luck. Clear for takeoff, Charlie? Right. Okay, give him the light. All right, Steve, I'm reading you clear. I'm at 20,000. Airspeed 600. She's running fine. Soundproofing works. There's a third degree waiver in the AGY pressure. Got that, Charlie? Check. Uh, dead center on radar, Mr. Hanson. 50,000 now. Cutting out the port jet. Now the starboard. Off jets. Airspeed dropping. Opening the rocket sweats. Sweat sticks a little, Charlie. Knock the alcohol. Pressure is 350. All right, now I'm advancing the ignition key. Here goes rocket one. Steve, you all right? Yeah. 
4,400. Still climbing. Altitude, 297 miles. All right, you're at the outer limit. Level off for maneuver test. You've got exactly six minutes fuel left. Okay. Starting a three-degree left bank. It's a little sluggish. That's all right now. There's a low vibration someplace. Maybe the cockpit has. Now I'm straightening out. Five minutes fuel left. Now I'm starting a three-degree... Ru- hey! What's the matter? What's wrong? There's something up here. Something shining. What are you talking about? There's something above me, Hank. I'm going to chase it. Steve! Steve, you're at the outer limit now. I can see it plain now. Steve, don't go any higher. You've only got four minutes left. You've only got... It's static. I can't hear you, Hank. It's dead ahead now. I'm going to make a pass at it. Get a good look. Hey, it's swerving to meet me. It's dead ahead now. Squadron to alert their search planes. Right. Nine and a half minutes gone. Hello. Hello, Steve. What's happened? What the devil is it? Hello. Come in, Steve. We need a search squadron. Come in. No, Mr. Hanson's busy. Hello. Hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. Ten minutes, Mr. Hanson. At the end of the fuel. Been now. Ten hours, Mr. Hanson. Nothing more on radar, Sergeant? Screen's blank. Colonel Corelli called in. Search planes are back. They didn't find anything. Should be some trace. He couldn't have bailed out, could he? You don't hit the silk at 4,400 miles an hour. He even went past the outer limit, ran out of fuel. Something blew, and we'll find the pieces scattered from here to the coast. Why does it have to be the best man? Always the best man. I'll get it. Charlie. Charlie, yeah, we, you know, we've got to That's figure out what was wrong. Yeah. All right, I'll tell you. Something, something right. must have blown. Yeah. There's a message from Northside Hospital for, for Steve. And what is it? Mrs. Weston's fine. It's a boy. Thank you, Elsie. It's a boy, Charlie. Oh, fine, fine. It's a boy. He didn't even know she went to the hospital. How am I going to tell Mary that? It wasn't your fault, Mr. Hanson? ship had to be tested. Yeah, yeah, we'll build another one, and some other flying fool will shoot past the outer limit into space. Oh, I'm getting old, Charlie. You can remember when I used to take him up myself. Now I've got to send other men. It's a job, Mr. Hanson. Now I'm afraid. Every time I hear a jet go off, I jump. Every time I have to send someone up in a new model, I start to sweat. Mr. Hanson. Yeah? I think there's something on the radar. No flights scheduled in, are there, Elsie? We have a whole day cleared. It's coming in behind us. Sure, it comes over the building. What crazy jockey is buzzing the field like that? Is that an army plane, Charlie? I can't see. It's turning. Charlie, alert the field. I know that engine. Steve! That's impossible. That's his ship. It can't be. Well, there's no other model like that. It's Steve, all right. It's coming in. Thank God. Gone. All right, sit down, Steve. The quicker we get this done, the quicker you get over to see Mary and the baby. Hank. Elsie, give the order to check and refuel the rockets. I don't want anybody in here till I get Steve's reports. Bury any calls. All right, let's have it. What the devil happened to you? Hank, does that cosmic ray bomb still go off tonight? What are you talking about? Straighten out, Steve. Where you been for the last ten hours? Listen, Hank. There's something more. I'm come on, come on. I've got to get a report on the screen to Washington. So let's have it. I've got to know how you stretch ten minutes fuel to keep you in the air for ten hours. Now, one thing before I talk. Look, Steve. Have the Geiger men run over the ship before they refuel. What'd you run into? So help me, Hank. I don't know. We better check and make sure it isn't radioactive. Elsie, add a Geiger report on the standard check. Steve, maybe we better have the doc look you over too. No, no. I'll be all right. They said I'd be all right. They? Look, son, I know you've had a tough time, but we've had this field on the alert for ten hours. 
One of the army boys cracked up looking for you, and he's hurt bad. So let's have the story. Let's have it straight. I don't know how to tell you. Hank, I saw something up there. At 300 miles? I chased something up there, Hank, and I caught it. Now, don't hand me that. Listen to you. I was cruising along, just starting the right bank, when I spotted something. It must have been going about half my speed. It was egg-shaped and smooth. I made a pass at it, and I was coming back for another, and then there was a humming sound. Humming? A sort of vibration. And I blacked out. I was headed straight for it at 4,400 miles an hour. I thought it was going to be the biggest smash since Hiroshima, and... I guess I was drinking that bottle. Never mind that, Steve. What happened? I came to inside their ship. Uh Uh-huh. Steve, this whole thing has been a devil of a strain on you. I'm going to call Major Donaldson from the Army base. Ask him to sit in. The psychiatrist? Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Let him run his tests. He'll tell you I'm not kidding. Because, Hank, unless I miss my guess, I've just been tipped off to the way the world ends. All right, Mr. Weston, suppose you continue your story. Yes, let's have it, Steve. You woke up inside the ship? Yes, and uh, the place was jammed with machinery. Hmm. Dials, blinkers. I couldn't recognize anything. And you were surrounded by these men from Mars? I didn't say anything about men from Mars. I didn't even say they were men. I couldn't see them clearly. They were just there. Where did they come from, then? Another galaxy. Millions of miles outside of our solar system. That's all I know. You figure out where they came from. And they came all that distance to find the Earth? Yes. Did they tell you that? Yes. You mean they spoke English to you? No, no, they didn't. It's funny. I hadn't thought. They didn't really speak to me at all. They just planted the thoughts in my mind. You mean thought transference, telepathy? Yes, that's right. Well, Steve, what brought them here? We did, Hank. We rang their bell. We brought them in. Uh Uh-huh. With our atomic explosions. Hank, that's why you've got to stop that bomb test tonight. Uh, I'll give up. Look, you've got to believe me, Hank. Oh, how can I make you understand? Maybe I can help, Mr. West. Would you submit to narco-psychometry? What's that? Under proper drugs, I can put you back in this, uh, ship. By suggestion. Then we can get a playback record of your memory pattern on the audio circuit. How long will that take? Half an hour. We'll have to go over to the lab. Will you believe me if it checks? It will give us an accurate memory picture of what your mind reports. All right, let's go. Hank, you got to believe me. We haven't got much time. You should be getting drowsy now. Count backwards from ten. Ten. Nine. Eight. He's under. Now we attach the head plate electrode. The cortical pickup. Look out for that wire, Mr. Henson. Rio setting. 31.3. Now throw that switch, Mr. Henson. I have to start him off by suggestion. All right, Steve. You're in your ship now. You're in the rocket. Rocket. You're in the rocket. You're in the rocket. And you've just sighted something strange. Now I'm starting a three degree right. What's that? Hey, there's something up here. Something shining. His memory pattern. We're picking it up electronically. There's something above me, Hank. I'm going to chase it. It's piped through the audio circuits. I'm getting static. I can't hear you, Hank. This is where we lost contact with him. I'm going to make a pass at it. And... Hey, it's swerving to meet me. It's not ahead now. It's not ahead. No one. This is where he blacked out. There's no telling how long, minutes or hours. What's that noise? I don't know, quiet. Where? How did I get in here? What? Who are you? Is he seeing things? Intergalactic patrol. What's that? What are they saying, Steve? What are they saying? It's about nuclear fission. They know about it. 
They know the danger of it. Long ago, they had wars that almost destroyed them. But finally, they learned. Now they've outlawed war. Go on, Steve. They patrol space. When their detector picks up an atomic explosion, they send a patrol. What are they going to do? They've quarantined us. Quarantined? They've isolated the Earth. Because we don't know how to control ourselves yet. Until we learn, we'll be a menace to the whole universe. What is this nonsense? How are they going to do it, Steve? They've spread a layer out here of... I don't know how to call it. All around the Earth. It's miles deep. When there's an atomic explosion on Earth, the radioactive particles will drift up to this layer and set off a chain reaction. It'll go around the world in microseconds. And that's the end. The end? What's he doing? Wait, wait. Yes. Yes. I understand. I've got to bring back the warning. You're going to put me back in my ship to bring the warning. Now what? Blacked out again. I guess that's all. What does all that mean? It's what he remembers. You don't think that really happened? No, no. Narcos psychometry circuits produce what he remembers. It just means that Steve believes this happened. I don't uh, like to see this. Uh, I've seen too many top uh, pilots uh, snap. Steve is the best I've known. <laughs> How bad do you think he is? Frankly, outside of the presence of this well-organized this hallucination, there's no sign of unbalance. May not be too serious. If you had a more plausible story, I'd be inclined to believe Warning. him. Warning. Hank. It's all right, boy. Did you hear it, Hank? You understand? Sure, sure. We've, we've been quarantined. Now let me give you something to make you sleep, Steve. Don't you understand? They fixed it so that if we set off one more nuclear explosion, that'll be it. Of course. Don't roll your sleeve down. You don't believe me. Now, take it easy, Steve. If it pests tonight, they're setting off the CR bomb. Hank, what time is it? 11.20. Well, it's scheduled for midnight. Hank, we've got to stop that bomb. Steve, let Donaldson give you the hypo. Hank, you've got to believe me. I saw them. I got the warning. If we touch off that bomb tonight, it'll be the biggest galactic 4th of July of all time. The whole Earth will go up like a Roman candle. April 10th, 1965, the end. Now, look, Steve, you better calm down. Don't you want to see Mary and the baby? You've got a new son, remember? Yeah, that's just it. I, I want to see my son. I want him to live. If that bomb goes off... Hank, we've got to stop them. Mr. Hanson, I think we'd better get over to the base hospital. Hank, you've got to believe yeah, me. Yeah, sure, sure, Steve. Maybe there is something to it. Look, it's out of your hands. I'll put it in a report and shove it into Washington in the morning. In the morning? There isn't going to be any morning, Hank. Don't you understand? You've got to call Washington now. Get the head of the security commission and postpone that test. Now, you know I can't do that, Steve. My neck would be out a mile. Besides, this is 1965, not 45. Twenty countries have atomic bombs now. What's the use of stopping just this one? The rest will keep right on popping them. Well, we'll have to call an international conference. Can't you understand, Hank? The first one that goes off finishes us at the end. They've given us the quarantine warning. Steve, I think you'd better go with us to the base hospital. Look, Steve. We can call up for a detail if we have to. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll go with you. You don't need a straight jacket. That's the way, Steve. You'll probably feel better by morning. Let's go. Well, Steve, tomorrow I'll drive you over to the hospital to see Mary and the kid. Sure. Look at the ship under the floodlights. Pretty, huh? You'll be flying her again soon, don't you worry. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, what you doing out in the line? The, uh, refueler? Yeah, we've got Clausewitz coming in tomorrow from Denver for another test. I figure we give you a day off. That's good. That's fine. Steve! Steve, come back! Come on, Donaldson. Steve! Steve, wait! He's heading for the rocket. Look, there he goes up. That crazy fool. We can't get at him now. That covers armor glass. He's waving. Now towards control. It's the radio. He needs the radio. Come on. I should have gotten help. Uh, well, the radio's still hooked up here. Hello. Hello, Steve. Listen to me, Hank. You gotta call Washington now. Come out of that rocket, Steve. I'll call my men. Don't try anything, Hank. They refueled the rocket for tomorrow. Take it easy, Steve. Listen, you know what'll happen when I fire the rocket tubes down here? Steve, don't. It'll burn out every building for five miles. All of us in one big blast. Steve, what do you want? You've got to stop that bomb. You've got to call Washington right now. They won't believe me. You make that call or I cut in the rocket. Now, I mean it, Hank. I hope my speed.
speed of yours in parallel. I want to see exactly what you're doing. All right, all right. Just don't fire those rockets. Get going, Hank. You've got 12 minutes to make that call and stop that bomb. All right, I'm making the parallel hookup right now. Donaldson, you think he'll really blast? I don't know. Up to now, I'd almost say he was normal. But now he's liable to do anything, Hanson. Steve. Steve, there. You're getting it on your screen? Yeah. Now, put that call through. All right. Operator. Visit screen to Washington. The visit screen circuits are busy, sir. If you'll try again in half an hour. This is Security Commission priority. Break in. Get me a line. Yes, sir. Just a moment, please. Ten minutes, Hank. Listen, Steve, I'm trying. We're ready to take your call, sir. Uh, Washington. Security Commission 3. This is urgent. I want Undersecretary Herbert Ames. Washington, three. One moment, please. Hurry, will you? One moment, please. What time is it, Donaldson? 11.51. Do you think he'll fire those rockets? He might. Washington? Visit screen three. Mr. Herbert Ames, please. That is a coded exchange. I cannot accept your call without clearance. Get it through, Hank. Listen, Washington, put it through. This is Mr. Hansen at San Marco Air Base. This is a priority call. I'm coded. One moment, please. I will check your code number. Get that through, Hank, and that bomb goes off at 12. Will you be reasonable, Steve? Your call has cleared, San Marco. Washington, visit screen three. Herbert Ames, please. Security Commission Ames. Listen, Ames. Oh, hello, Ames. Ames, you've got to get me to the chief. Are you kidding? Is it the test control room? Yes, I know, but get him for me. What's up? You look lousy. Or is it a bad circuit? There's no time. I've got to get him before the test. It's about the CR bomb. I can't take that responsibility. Get that through, Hank. Right plan. Hey, what's going on there? Ames, my project has a high enough rating. This is a priority A call. What? Well, okay, it's your neck. I'll try to get him for you. He's in the control room, so you'll have to switch off your screen and speaker and go on earphones. Too much going on in there. Rolling. You hear that, Steve? I've got, I've got to cut the incoming screen. All right. Don't try anything. Eight minutes, Hank. Hello. Hello. What? You got him, Hank? Yes. This, this is Hanson in San Marco. No, sir. Priority A request to cancel the bomb test. No, no. I'm serious. This is deadly serious. We sent the X2 JTR up today to the outer limit. We uncovered evidence. Yes, on the automatic instruments. What's that? No possible chain reaction. No, I, I can't tell you the whole story. There isn't time here. Yes, yes, I, I'll bring the readings into Washington in the morning. You've got to postpone the test till you see them. Look, I've worked on contracts with the commission for ten years. Yes, yes, I have complete confidence in my information. You can record that. All right, I, I'll call you back immediately. Bye. Hank? Hank? He's agreed to cancel, Steve. The bomb won't go off. All right, boy. You can come down out of that ship. He's opening up. Here he comes. All right, Steve. Come on down. Sure, Hank. Just a second. Hank, I was scared. I was plain scared. Easy now. It's all over. The bomb won't go off. Thank God. Look, uh, I want to see Mary and the baby. Can you get me transportation now? Well, wait a minute. It's almost 12. They won't let you in the hospital now. I want to see the baby. Sure you do, but you've been under the strain. I've got a shot for you here, Steve. Give you a good night's sleep. All right. Roll up your sleeve. Yeah, here. Sergeant will find you a bed. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Weston. Okay. Good night, Hank. I'm kind of beat. It's been a tough night. It sure has. I thought for a minute he was going to blast those rockets and send us all to kingdom come. Yeah. Quite a stunt getting the ray bomb test called off. It isn't called off. But the chief said... Ames couldn't get the chief. I was talking to a dead circuit. Bomb goes off in a couple of minutes. Oh. Poor Steve. He was one of the best. He was the best. One in ten million. Some story of this poor guy. For a while, he almost had me believing that quarantine. That's a very common illusion. End of the world. Yeah. I suppose so. Ah, it's a nice night. Never saw the stars so bright. We better be getting in. That wind is cold. Well, the bomb goes off in 30 seconds. Poor Steve. You know, Hanson, there's just one thing. Yeah? It's 
outside my field, but I'm curious. How did he keep that ship in the air for ten hours with only ten minutes fuel? You have just heard another adventure in time, space, and the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension... Next week, a star of the future appearing on the program of the future, Dimension X. Next week, Miss Nancy Olson, the talented young actress whose performance in Sunset Boulevard marks her as one of Hollywood's most promising young actresses, becomes the first of a group of rising young artists of stage and screen who have been invited to make an appearance in this series. So listen then for Hello Tomorrow, starring Nancy Olson on Dimension X. Tonight, Dimension X has transcribed The Outer Limits, written by Graham Dorr and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Hanson, Joseph Julian as Steve, and Joe DeSantis as Donaldson. Your host was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its files to bring you the unvarnished, true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. This is an accurate record, authentic from start to finish, of the most famous criminal investigation organization in the world, compiled from the files of Scotland Yard by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, written and directed for radio by Willis Cooper. New Scotland Yard, the London headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, is situated near the embankment on Whitehall. Here also are the headquarters of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, the body of men whose exploits for more than a hundred years have made the name Scotland Yard synonymous with the brilliant detection of crime, the unrelenting pursuit of the criminal, and the presentation of the painstakingly acquired evidence that assures his eventual punishment. Police officials of every nation in the world are constant visitors to Scotland Yard. Some of them come as observers of Scotland Yard methods, others on official police business, and many remain as students of Scotland Yard's crime... It was raining in London the second day of my visit to Scotland Yard. It practically always rains in London. I got out of my taxi and walked through the gates of Scotland Yard shivering, and the red-faced young constable at the steps of the building was very polite. But he was also very firm with me. I said, good afternoon, constable. Good afternoon, sir. Commander Rawlings is expecting you. Uh, you're the American gentleman, aren't you, sir? That's right. From Minnesota, sir? From where? Minnesota, sir. Minnesota? Oh, thank you, sir. Commander Rawlings will be in the Black Museum, sir. Where is that? It's inside, sir. You take the stairway down to your left. Third door on the right, sir. Right, oh, Constable. Right, sir. I'd been there the day before. Up the stone steps, through the heavy doors, into the big, bare outer corridor with a musty old smell that every copper in the world can recognize with his eyes shut. Look in through, sir. Deputy Commander Rawlings, Sergeant. Oh, you're the American gentleman, sir. Down the stairway, third door on the right, sir. Down the stairway, third door on the right, sir. Sir, polite cops. Well, third door on the right. One, two, three. 
Come in, please. Ah, good afternoon. Afternoon, Mr. Rawlings. Do come in, old boy. Glad to see you, Mr. Rawlings. Mind if I smoke a cigar? Uh, Not at all. Welcome to our little chamber of horrors. Quite a place. Who's that? That? Oh, uh, death mask of Heinrich Himmler. You know, Hitler's... I remember, yeah. The the SS man, Butcher. Some of the chaps took him in, you know. But he was a, a trifle too quick with the poison. What's this? Gunny sacks. Oh, yes. Uh, a bloke named Manton wrapped his ex-wife up in it. 1943. A place called Luton. What happened to him? Took the 8 o'clock walk. Huh? Execution time was always 8 o'clock. Bloody early. Oh, Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Lost property, eh? What is it? Looks like a burnt chicken bone that somebody busted. That is Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. It was a gang of navvies that found the skeleton. Navvy? Uh, Laborers, you know, pick and shovel workmen. Ah. All over London at the time, uh, that was in July 1942, workmen were tidying up uh, the bombed-out wreckage. The Blitz, you know, uh, they did quite a good job. Uh, this gang was working on a Baptist chapel in Kensington, piling up bricks and mortar, uh, digging into the ruins for buried victims and whatnot. They uncovered a good many, incidentally. Well, uh, they called a nearby police constable and reported it uh, as they were required to do. The constable took the routine notes as the navvy gave him the facts. I prized up this here stone slab, and there he was, just like he is. Lord Stone the Crows, I says, like, he looks a natural down there. And I looks again, and I says to Sammy, yeah, Sammy, I says, what's a skinnington doing all burned up like this? And down in the basement of a Baptist chapel, I says. That sword Hitler, I says. What do you think, Constable? Well, not knowing, I can't say. All right, then, I'll call the yard and have him pick him up. What's the poor Skellington done, Scotland Yard wants him? Identify the poor fellow Cuthbert like we always do. So we can see if he's to be charged to Hitler's account or was murdered or something. In a Baptist chapel, Constable? And don't muck him about, neither, before the yard men get here. He's burnt and broke up enough as it is. The laboratory will have a time not off with him finding out who he was. Mine now. Who does he think he is? A bloody Prime Minister? Muck a bad with a skeleton, indeed. I wouldn't even brush the plaster dust off the poor thing. Yeah, that ain't plaster dust, mate. It ain't? What is it? Well, I was a master mason before the Blitz, mate. I know quicklime when I see it. Quicklime won't destroy a body, Rowling. That's a myth, a superstition. You know that. But murderers don't usually know it, old boy. I see what you mean. Keith Simpson, the home office pathologist, walked into my room up the stairs the next day. Skeleton was a lady, Commander. Oh? Yes. About five feet tall, I should say. Between 40 and 50 years of age. Probably wore an upper dental plate with seven teeth. Four other teeth had fillings. Oh, found two or three strands of grey hair also. Well, pass it on to Edward. She's got to be identified. It's quite a job, I should say. Has to be done. Is that all? Uh, you said something about quicklime. Yes. No trace of quicklime in any other part of the rubble of this chapel except near the skeleton. Uh, suspicious of murder. Uh-huh. Yeah, have a look at this. Yeah. What is it? The thing the skeleton talked with. Talked? When she was alive. The trachea, voice box. Look here. Mm -hmm. See these things? These little wing affairs? Uh Very fragile. Now, the upper horn of this wing... Yes, it's been broken. This, my dear Commander Rollins, is one of the most significant fractures in the whole field of forensic medicine. Assume that I've asked a question. It is almost always caused by one means... Manual pressure. Oh? Strangulation. Checking the missing person's register occupied several weeks, and the yard men found 281 names of missing women between the ages of 40 and 50, around five feet tall and with gray hair. I think they were. 
Then we were faced with a problem of finding which one of these women wore an upper dental plate of seven teeth and also had four other teeth which had been filled. And on the 85th personal call, Detective Constable Charles Barry reported that a woman in Bayswater, whose missing sister's name was on our list, had told him this sister had worn false teeth and an upper dental plate. The woman who had disappeared on uh, Good Friday, 1941, uh, 16 months previous, had been married, but living apart from her husband. Her name was uh, Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Uh-huh. Something clicked in my mind. I, I had seen that name and that date before somewhere. Uh, that was uh, at the time of the Great Easter Blitz of 41, when the Luftwaffe really poured it on us. Sure, sure, sure. I, I sent uh, the files for a copy of the Police Gazette of April 11, 1941. The Police Gazette? The Yard's Daily Police newspaper. Oh. We got a Police Gazette in the States, too, but... Uh... It's kind of different. Yes, I dare say. Well, I, I found the item I wanted, a very brief one under lost and found articles. A woman's purse had been found in the post office at Guildford and Surrey by the postmistress when the office was closed on the evening of Good Friday, 1941. Well? It was Mrs. Rachel Dopkin's purse. I don't get it. Well, <laughs> neither did we. I assigned Detective Inspector Lewis Hatton to work with me. We agreed it was most baffling. Most baffling? No question that this was her purse. Ration card, in the name of Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Identity card, same name. Ten shilling note, elevenpence and coin, a lipstick, comb, mirror. Two tram tickets? Hers, all right. Curious. Curious there's no return ticket to London. Perhaps she was running away. Yeah, she'd not get far in England without her ration and her identity card. No inquiries were ever made for the purse. Hmm. And uh, we find her skeleton in Kensington 15 months later. Sure it was hers? No doubt at all. We found a dentist almost at once. He positively identified the jaw and the fillings and the teeth. Charts? They showed the sergeant his charts made at the time he did the work. They checked. Um, when was that um, chapel place destroyed? The day before Easter, Saturday. It wasn't a bomb hit, knocked down by concussion, no hit. But she was reported missing the day before, Good Friday. Aye. No fire either. But the skeleton was burned, charred. Baffling. Where are you going, Hatton? Oh, I thought I'd take a run up to Kensington again. I'd like to see the Kensington Fire Brigade as a current book. And there wasn't any fire? No, not on the night of the raids, uh, Saturday, but we don't know about the other days, do we? What? Telephone me if you find anything. A hunch. A hunch, uh, that's right. Uh, sometimes they, uh, what is it you Americans say, uh, pay off? Pay off, that's right. Sometimes they pay off. Hatton didn't telephone me. He came bursting unceremoniously into my room upstairs two hours later. Eh? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. There was a fire. Really? I saw the occurrence book at the Kensington Fire Brigade. The fire was on Tuesday the 15th at 11.31. That was when the Kensington police station telephoned it in. What? One of the constables had discovered it. Police constable? That's in the police occurrence book, too. But didn't the ARP fire watchers no, have... No, no, the fire watchers didn't report it at all. Well, maybe there wasn't a fire watcher there. Oh, yes, there was one, sir. Don't you want to know his name, Commander Rawlings? What? The name of the fire watcher who didn't report the fire in the chapel where the skeleton was found is... Harry Dobkin. I called for a meeting of all those who were concerned in the case. Keith Simpson, the Home Office pathologist. Good evening, Detective sir. Inspector Hatton. Sorry to be late, sir. Uh, Station Sergeant Andrew C. McLeod of Kensington. Yes, sir. And myself. McLeod was there to tell us what he knew. The others to lend me a hand in taking stock and determining what should be done next. First, I asked Hatton, uh, have you uh, discovered Harry Dobkin? Unfortunately, not yet, sir. Why? 
Well, it is true, sir, that he was employed as a fire watcher by the firm of manufacturing chemists whose buildings adjoined the chapel in Kensington, but they informed me that his services were unsatisfactory and he was sacked on 14th September last year. He wasn't an enrolled ARP member then? No, sir. He was employed as a private fire watcher. We've checked the address he'd given. The place was destroyed by enemy action on the night of... Uh, night of... 21-22 February this year. There uh, has been no trace of him since. Due inquiry is being made, however. Oh, naturally, sir. And it is certain that he was on duty the night of the fire on Tuesday 15 April uh, 1941. Yes, sir. It's a matter of record in Station Sergeant McLeod's occurrence book. <clears throat> yes, sir. According to the occurrence book, P.C. Ivor Lamb of Kensington Police Station saw him recognized him and spoke with him after the fire was extinguished by the fire brigade. Uh, I've brought with me the page in question, sir. Uh, third entry from the top, sir. Uh, thank you. Nothing much we can do until we see Dobkin. We'll find him, sir. Unless he's gone for a Burton. Unless he's dead, yes, sir. Now, um, let's see what we have. Keith Simpson says the woman was murdered. Yes, I am strongly of that opinion, Commander Rollins. You believe that she was murdered by her husband, Harry Dupkin? I have no opinions whatever on that subject, Commander. That is a detective matter, not a medical one. However, I believe that you'll find that she was murdered. <clears throat> uh, one moment, Sergeant McLeod. Simpson, you are convinced the skeleton was that of Mrs. Rachel Dupkin? I would testify to that effect. There is the matter of the deduced description tallying with that of Mrs. Dobkin. The teeth have been positively identified as hers, and I have here what I consider highly important corroborative evidence. Now, this is a film copy of a full-face photograph of Rachel Dobkin. Oh, where do you see it? And this is an X-ray photograph to the same scale of the skull of the victim. Now, I superimpose them, and you observe that there are at least five points of coincidence. Mm -hmm. Observe, size, yeah. height, and width of the eye sockets, mm -hmm. height and width of the nose space. Mm -hmm. I, I, I say, I, I should say there is no doubt that the victim was Rachel Dupkin. As I stated, I suspect murder. Well, as the uncalled for purse in the post office at Guildford, for one thing. If the woman were alive, she'd certainly make inquiries about a lost purse. She couldn't live without her identity card and her ration look. Yes, and that broken bone in the voice box of the skeleton is almost unmistakable evidence of strangulation. Manual strangulation. <clears throat> Sir. Oh, yes, uh, Sergeant McLeod. Sir, this man, Dobkin, uh, was living apart from his wife. Uh, it was uh, a legal separation. Yes, we know that. Something you don't know, sir. Begging your pardon. Dobkin had been contributing to his wife's support for several years. What? Aye, but he was very irregular about it. You know, she had him in court for it. So? Yes, sir. Well, now, up to the end of the second week in April, he had been quite dilatory about paying in his weekly 20 shillings. How do you know? He had to make the payments at the Kensington police station, sir. Either to me or my assistant. Oh. And he hadn't paid anything in since, uh, the 18th September 1940. Well, that may... Yes? Excuse me, sir. There's an urgent telephone call for Station Sergeant McLeod. Kensington police station calling. Uh, will you excuse me, sir? Oh, you can take it right right here, Sergeant. Uh, there's a telephone over there, uh, top of the bookcase. Oh, aye. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, very good, Constable. Yes, sir. Interesting, at least, sir. It might have something to do with the motive, uh, though. Yes, of course. Well, it's good to have a record of it, anyway. Your friend Dobkin hasn't been blown to bits. Yes, and if you have enough evidence to charge her with murder. Good thorough chap, this Kensington man. Sergeant McLeod, oh, the best an old guardsman. Oh, so? CSM, 4th Battalion, Scots Guards in the First War. Military medal with bar, DCM. Uh, good man. <laughs> you thought that moustache spelled Sergeant Major, didn't they? <laughs> Sir, that was Detective Constable Sanderson from our house. Yes? He's uh, spoken to the parson of that church. Parson tells him nothing inflammable was oh. ever stored in that cellar where the skeleton was found. Mm. Ah, but when he went to view the damage after the fire, on the morning after, that was on Wednesday, 16th of April, 1941, he found a half-burned straw polyacin there. 
It had been torn open and set on fire. I see. Oh. It obviously did not belong there. Didn't the parson see the skeleton at the time? It was under that rock slab, sir. Ah, yes. Well, very interesting. Oh, uh, you didn't finish telling us about Dobkin and the money he wasn't paying to his wife at your station. Oh, I sir, that. Well, it, it's quite curious. You know, on the morning of the 16th of April, he showed up in Bigger's life and paid in his 20 shillings. Really? Uh, did he? Aye, sir. And he showed up on the dot every Wednesday after that with payment until the date when he was sacked by his employers there in Kensington. And Mrs. Dobkin never appeared at your station to collect it. How could she, sir? She was dead. That was the way it all ended, then. Or did you find the murderer after all? Or was it murder after all? That bit of the late rather unlamented Mrs. Dobkin there would hardly be here in the Black Museum of Scotland Yard if it wasn't murder, old boy. Yes. You know, that broken bone there is real good evidence of strangulation, isn't it? It was good enough. Well, go on, go on. What did you do when you found out Harry Dobkin was dead, too? Give up the idea well, that he... didn't he... find out that he was dead. But the bomb that... Merely found out that he had disappeared. Oh. It would be rather a coincidence, wouldn't it? A woman apparently murdered under circumstances that involved her husband so deeply, and then the suspected husband popped off so conveniently before he was even suspected. Well... A little too much to swallow. A little too simple. Yeah. If I'd been in your Harry Dobkin spot, I'd be tickled silly if people thought I'd get pumped off. And if the opportunity offered, you'd be glad to walk away and say nothing to anyone. Let people think so. And that was one of the several mistakes Dopkin made. If he could have taken another name... Didn't he? There's the matter of identity cards. Ah. Oh. In a country at war, it's a little difficult to walk in and say, I'll have an identity card and a ration book in the name of uh, Sam Small or Bonerges Bl Blitzen Jr., uh, they ask embarrassing questions, you know. Spies, huh? It, spies they'd be thinking of. Right. And a few questions will discover the fact that your name is Harry Dobkin and there are more embarrassing questions and first thing, you know... Uh, I get it. So we reasoned if Harry Dobkin was still alive, he'd be alive somewhere as Harry Dobkin. And all we had to do was to find him. Uh-huh. Oh. And did you? Detective Inspector Hatton had the idea. Uh, on the first day of September, he walked into an establishment on Edgware Road, a, a shop that sold men's cheap clothing. It was the 39th place he had visited, and other yard men had made similar inquiries in about 400 other similar shops all over London. He asked for the proprietor and was ushered into the man's little cubicle of an office. He identified himself. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Detective Inspector Hatton of Scotland Yard. Here are my credentials. What's the matter? There's nothing... I mean... It... I, I merely wish to see your records, sir. Records? Well, there's nothing... I'm with... looking for a name, sir. A purchaser of clothing of any sort between the 21st day of February and the present date. Well, uh, I, I don't... Uh, you know, uh, you are required by law to take the name of any purchaser of clothing who presents the proper ration coupons for the articles purchased. Well, or I can't uh, spend it Or perhaps you sell articles without the proper coupons. An actionable offence. Oh, no. Uh, no, 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 Inspector. Uh, uh, may, uh, may I see your books? Uh, but of course, of course. I have them right here. Right here. Here. All up to date and correct. Thank you. Mm hmm. Tate, Henry, <laughs> Meredith, Oliver B, Barbassio and James, <laughs> Arthur Thomas, Dobkin, Harry, and the address. Did you find him? I thought he'd have to buy new clothing eventually. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon. Yes? Come in. Oh, Hatton. I found Dobkin, sir. Well, that's very good work, Detective Inspector. Thank you, sir. Where is he? Outside, sir. Well, uh, shall we have the gentleman in? By all means, sir. 
Come in, Mr. Dobkin. This is Mr. Harry Dobkin, Deputy Commander Rawlings. Come in, Mr. Dobkin. Have a chair. Thank you. Be seated, gentlemen. Might I ask what... Uh, why Scotland Yard is interested in me, Commander? Mr. Dobkin, you were a fire watcher near the chapel in Kensington where a fire occurred on the night of Tuesday, 15 April 1941. I was. Why did you not report that fire? Well, it's rather a story, sir. We should like to hear it, Mr. Dobkin. Well, uh, I was supposed to report to the fire warden at Neville Place. And did you do so? Well, no, sir, I didn't. Why, if you please? Oh, he wasn't there. Hmm. Where was he? Oh, I don't know, sir. I suppose he nipped around a corner or somewhere for a smoke or a mug-up or something. And Well, you understand, sir? I knew him quite well. What was his name? <laughs> Do you know, his, his name slipped my mind completely. Gord Gordon? Uh, Gresh? No, no. No, I'm, I'm afraid I've completely forgotten it. I did report it to post number seven, though. After the fire brigade had come and gone? Yes. I didn't want to leave the premises. You, you see... Why are you so interested in this after all this time, may I ask? Certain things happened that night. Oh, they must have happened whilst I was gone to report to post seven, sir. You saw nothing suspicious at all? No, sir, no, nothing at all. What happened? At any time that night? No, sir. The skeleton of a woman was found destroyed by fire in that cellar. There has been no fire in that place either before or since the 15th of April last year. Oh, dear, how dreadful. The woman was your former wife. I'm very sorry to hear that. I did hear that she had disappeared. I'm sorry, I, I dislike the woman intensely. You are surprised to hear of that? Well, naturally. But we'd been separated for some time. Uh, I'm afraid I've no tears for her. She was so... Well, never mind. So that's what became of her. And you have no knowledge whatever of the circumstances? No, none whatever, sir. Very well, Mr. Dobkin. Thank you. We may perhaps call on you later. Is that... All then, sir? Quite. Thank you for coming in. I'm terribly shocked, gentlemen. You have our sympathy, Mr. Dobkin. Good afternoon, sir. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Well? He's a liar. Yes? Excuse me, gentlemen, uh, was there anything else found in that, that place? What sort of thing? Oh, why, uh, a pelleus, uh, a straw mattress. Why, the... why do you ask, Dobkin? Why, uh, why, you see, I had an old straw mattress on the roof of the building where I was fire watching, and, you know, it disappeared that same night. I thought perhaps someone could have stolen it and uh, used it to start the fire. Why, uh, I'm sure I don't know. Well, uh, I was I was just thinking back. Well, if I can be of help in any way. Thank I'll... you, Mr. Dobkin. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Dobkin. Asking for it, eh? We watched him quite closely for a week. Dobkin was puzzled, we discovered, and by the simple-mindedness of the yard people who had accepted his explanation so readily. Think he would be. But then he decided, apparently, that our ready acceptance was much too suspicious. Not smart, eh? Not so awfully smart. He called on me again. Hatton was with me. We were so genial and guileless, we listened so politely. I just thought I'd stop by and inquire what progress you're making. Oh? I remember that fire warden's name... Ah, Greenbaum, his name was. Greenbaum. He told us his name was Gregory. Uh, did he tell you I reported to him? Oh, yes, yes. 
Although he said his post was only two minutes away from the chapel, and if all the things that occurred, uh, placing your wife's body in the vault, doing all the other things, were done in the four minutes you were absent, well... I told you, I don't know anything about my wife's murder. Why, Mr. Dupkin, nobody has said anything about murder. Well, I, I don't know anything about it. I, I tell you, I didn't strangle her. I didn't. I didn't. Go I didn't. Ahead, I, Harry Dobkin, I, I arrest you on the charge of willful murder. No, I, I didn't. I, I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence against you. And what happened? He was brought to trial, and with the evidence that Scotland Yard was able to supply, the Crown found no difficulty whatever in convincing a jury of his guilt. There were out 25 minutes. The verdict was guilty, and he was sentenced to be hanged. On the evening of Thursday 10, September 1942, he made a final and complete confession. The following morning, Friday, 11 September, at 8 o'clock... <laughs> The story you have just heard was transcribed from the files of the Metropolitan Police, New Scotland Yard. Dates, names, and places are real. The story is true. The information came from Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, and the true story was written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs> You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished author, Mr. Aldous Huxley. Brave New World is a fantastic parable about the dehumanization of human beings. In the negative utopia described in my story, man has been subordinated to his own inventions. Science, technology, social organization... These things have ceased to serve man. They have become his masters. A quarter of a century has passed since the book was published. In that time, our world has taken so many steps in the wrong direction that if I were writing today, I would date my story not 600 years in the future, but at the most 200. The price of liberty and even of common humanity is eternal vigilance. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations, present the premier broadcast of the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, part one of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels, Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. We are proud to have Mr. Huxley as narrator for these broadcasts. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. This is Aldous Huxley, and these are the sounds of the brave new world, of test tube and decanter, of hissing injectors and gurgling blood substitute. 
The year is AF 632, 632 years after Ford. We are inside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, and this is the fertilising room, an enormous laboratory where the temperature is never allowed to fall below 98.6. And here comes the Director of Hatcheries and Conditioning in person, bringing with him a group Tomorrow, of young students. Tomorrow you will be settling down to serious work. Today I just want to give you a general idea of things. Uh, these are the incubators, and here is the week's supply of ova, kept at blood heat. Uh, come along, boys. Now here, we immerse the eggs into a warm bouillon containing free-swimming spermatozoa. Immersion continues until the eggs are all fertilised. Ah, and over here, here is where we bottle the alphas and betas. In short, gentlemen, the perfect process for manufacturing healthy babies. Are there any questions? Uh, sir, uh, will you explain the uh, Bakanovsky process? I'm glad you asked that. Uh, students, take this down. Bakanovsky's process. Where in olden times, one egg made one embryo which made one baby. Today, we've improved on all that. Now the egg will bud, will divide, from eight to 96 buds, and every bud will grow into a perfectly formed embryo, and every embryo into a mature baby, making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before. Progress. But uh, what advantage is it, sir? Uh, I mean... Uh... Oh, my good boy, can't you see? Where in olden times nature allowed us only to have twins or perhaps triplets or so, today we can create scores, yes, scores of identical individuals. We can manufacture men and women in uniform batches. Think of it. An entire factory staffed with the product of one single egg. 96 identical individuals working 96 identical machines. At last, society really knows where it stands. Remember, it was our Ford who gave us the concept of the assembly line when he was on Earth many centuries ago. And now, boys... We will go up to the bottling room where we shall see how we create each class of society. Alphas, betas, deltas, etc. Come with me. Where, Lenina? Oh, director. Oh, charming, charming. Ah, what are you injecting into our embryos today, my dear? Typhoid antitoxins? Yes, sir. Are you uh, busy this afternoon? Oh, not after five, sir. Good. Suppose we get together then on the roof. That would be fine. I've admired you for some time, then, Nina. I'm looking forward to a closer acquaintance. Thank you, sir. And now, boys, we're off to the bottling room. You are a lucky girl. The director of hatcheries and conditioning. Oh, hello, Fanny. Oh, you can trust the director to be the perfect gentleman. I saw him pat you. He wants me. You see? That shows what he stands for. The strictest conventionality. And it's about time you started belonging to someone else, my dear. But I like Henry Foster. We've only been with each other four months. Four months? Well, what would the district world controller say? You know how he disapproves anything intense or long-drawn. And it isn't as though there were anything painful or disagreeable about being with one or two other men besides Henry. After all, everyone belongs to everyone else. You're quite right, Fanny, as usual. Good girl. Uh, Fanny, do you know Bernard Marx? <gasps> Bernard Marx? Well, why not? Bernard's an alpha plus. Besides, he asked me to go to New Mexico, to the Savage Reservation with him. But his reputation. They say he doesn't like obstacle golf. Oh, they say, they say. And that he spends most of his time by himself alone. They say somebody made a mistake when he was still in the bottle. Thought he was a gamma and put alcohol into his blood substitute. That's why he's so stunted. Oh, what nonsense. Oh, very well, Lenina. It's your life, my dear. But I think you're heading for trouble. And here we have the bottling room. Little embryos carefully bottled being rocked gently to and fro as they did in olden days when carried by their mothers. <gasps> now, boys, you must learn to distinguish between smut and science. I am going to use that word again. As scientists of tomorrow, you must learn to cope with it. Mother. Oh. <coughs> there, that's better. As a matter of fact, there is an area in our world where humans are still viviparous, still give birth to their children. 
the Savage Reservation in New Mexico. I uh, visited there once myself many years ago. Dreadful, filthy place. Naturally, civilization has improved on all that. Ah, it is here we control the embryo's growth. Each batch carefully regulated to produce the exact class of citizen we desire. And here is our Mr. Henry Foster in charge of bottling. Oh, Henry. Uh, yes, sir. Please explain the process to the students. Oh, delighted, sir. By the way, Henry, before you begin, I made a date with Lenina Crown this afternoon. Oh, really? I'm delighted, sir. I'm sure you'll enjoy belonging to her. Good. Very pneumatic girl. Now, please proceed. This way, gentlemen. <clears throat> Here, we advance the process. One by one, the eggs are transferred from their test tubes into these larger decanters and moved along to the labelers. Carefully labeled as to heredity, date of fertilization, sex, name, serial number. Gentlemen, there are 88 cubic feet of card index in this room. Now, here is where we actually predestine and condition. Nothing is so unstabilizing to society as unhappy people. We avoid all that by preconditioning our embryos. And now we are entering the heat conditioning room. Hot tunnels alternating with cool tunnels. Exposure to cold is accompanied by exposure to x-rays. By the time these babies are decanted, they have a perfect horror of cold. Thus, they are perfectly prepared to emigrate to the tropics to be miners and acetate silk spinners and steel workers. And that, that is the secret of happiness and virtue, liking what you have got to do. All conditioning aims at that, making people like their unescapable social destiny. Oh, ten to three, boys. Time to visit the nurseries. And so the director continued on his tour. Meanwhile, in his rooms high above the city, Bernard Marx nervously paced the floor. I'm taking Lenina Crown in New Mexico with me, Helmholtz, to the Savage Reservation. Well, it's about time. What do you mean by that? I'll be frank, Bernard. There's been a lot of talk about your behavior at the College of Emotional Engineering. Of course, I've been defending you. And I'm but... supposed to be grateful? Because you're a successful feelies writer, because you're tall, well-built, have all the girls you want? Oh, Bernard. Now, you know how I feel. I want to write. I mean, seriously, not slogans or feelies. I, I want to write something important. Mm -hmm. now, lately, I've been cutting out my committees and my girls. The director called me in just the other day. Are you in trouble, too? There's a poem I wrote, too emotional, he said. Mm. He gave me the lecture about being an alpha plus, about remembering to behave even as a little infant. I know. I tried to explain to Lenina, but she doesn't understand, or won't understand. All those other men she belongs to, Henry Foster, Benito Hoover, they treat her like, like a side of beef. It's disgusting. It's socially proper. We share and we share alike, remember? But I want her for myself, alone. Bernard... You're my closest friend. Now, you listen to me. You can't win this way. Follow the rules. Play the game. Be happy. The nursery was on the fifth floor. The sign over the door said, Neo-Pavlovian Conditioning Room. It was a large, bare room, very bright and sunny. Half a dozen nurses, trousered and jacketed in the regulation white viscose linen uniform, were engaged in setting out bowls of roses in a long row across the floor. The nurses stiffened to attention as the director of hatcheries and conditioning came in, followed by his students. Set out the books. In silence, the nurses obeyed his command. Between the rose bowls, the books were duly set out. Now bring in the children. They hurried out of the room and returned in a moment, each pushing a kind of tall, dumb waiter, laden on all its four wire-netted shelves with eight-month-old babies, all exactly alike, a Bokhanovsky group, and all, since their caste was Delta, dressed in khaki diapers. Put them down on the floor. Now turn them so they can see the flowers and books. 
turned, the babies at once fell silent, then began to crawl towards those clusters of sleek colours, those shapes so gay and brilliant. From the ranks of the babies came little squeals of excitement, gurgles and twitterings of pleasure. The swiftest crawlers were already at their goal. Small hands reached out uncertainly, touched, grasped, unpetaling the roses, crumpling the illuminated pages of the books. Watch carefully, students. All right, nurses, pull the lever. <laughs> and now we proceed to rub in the lesson with a mild electric shock. That's enough. All right, take them away, nurses. Observe. Henceforth, books and flowers will be associated in their minds with loud, unpleasant noises and electric shock. And after 200 repetitions of the same or a similar lesson, will be wedded forever. What man has joined, nature is powerless to put asunder. They'll be safe from books and botany all their lives. But, sir, since these are lower caste children anyway and will never read, why bother to condition them against flowers? Simple economics. If gammas, deltas, or even epsilons like flowers in nature, soon you'd see them wasting their time visiting the countryside. And of what economic use is that? A love of nature keeps no factories busy. <laughs> it was decided to abolish it, at least among the lower classes. Uh, any further questions? Uh, sir, uh, would you tell us about sleep teaching? I'm glad you asked that. The most ingenious development of all, sleep teaching, is given to all our children as they grow to maturity. A little voice murmurs slogans in their ear all the night long while they sleep. Of course, it's useless for teaching, but as a method for giving post-hypnotic suggestions, it is invaluable. It's what conditions our minds to love our future role in life. Now, boys, uh, tell me some of the lessons we've all learned through sleep teaching. A gram is better than a dam. A good example. We have learned to take a gram of soma whenever we feel out of sorts. Euphoric, narcotic, pleasantly hallucinant. It transports our minds into a beautiful sleep filled with wonderful images. It gives a, a soma holiday, thus preventing unnecessary impulses such as anger, jealousy, envy, anxiety. Um, next. Uh, ending is better than mending. Good. Right. It's better to throw away something than to repair it. New clothing, new possessions keep our factories humming and make us happier. Next. I'm glad I'm not a gamma. Uh -huh. Ah, yes. We're all taught in our sleep to enjoy our own cast, whatever it may be. Gammas are taught to think I'm glad I'm not an epsilon. Betas learn to be glad they're not deltas or gammas. And glad they're not alphas, because we alphas sometimes have to use our minds, and that's very painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good, very good indeed. Well, students, I think our tour is over for today. I'm sure most of you have dates with pneumatic young ladies. Some, of course, will be wanting to get in a game of obstacle golf. But uh, before we finish, I'd like to add a few footnotes to the things you've seen today. Today, we have a controlled society, a happy society. We have stability. Ah, there was a time when these things did not exist. Uh, didn't people grow old and feeble in those days, sir? Indeed, they did. Old men in the bad old days used to renounce, retire, take to religion, spend their time reading, thinking, thinking. Oh. Now such is progress. At 60, we have the taste and the powers of a 17-year-old. The old men have no time, no leisure from pleasure. Not a moment to sit down and think. They're much too busy scampering from feely to feely, from girl to pneumatic girl. Fortunate boys, no pains have been spared to make your lives emotionally easy, to preserve you as far as possible from having emotions at all. Ford's in his flivver, all's well with the world. Ford's in his flivver, all's well with the world. And solemnly and devoutly, they made the sign of the tea and hurried off to join their fellow citizens at play. <laughs> Thank you. 
In spite of Fanny's dire warnings, Lenina Crown made a date that evening with the eccentric Mr. Marks, partly to show Fanny her courage and partly because she was curious. When they were safely in their helicopter and climbing above the city, she turned to him. Shall we play escalator squash or go to the Feelies? Escalator squash is a waste of time. But what else is time for? All right, then, let's go to the Feelies. You know, they're showing love on a bearskin rug, and everyone says it's terribly exciting. You can Lenina, actually please, feel... couldn't we just go for a walk and be alone together? But, Bernard, we'll be alone all night. Well, I... I, I meant alone for talking. Talking? Well, what about... Oh, you're beginning to feel nasty, I can tell. Take a soma, Bernard. I'd rather be myself, myself and nasty, not somebody else, however jolly. A gammon nine saves nine. Oh, for Ford's sake, be quiet. Bernard. Lenina, don't you ever want to be just you? Not enslaved by your own conditioning to be free? But I am free. I'm free to have the most wonderful time. Everybody's happy nowadays. But wouldn't you like to be free to be happy in your own way and not somebody else's? I simply don't understand you. Bernard, do you really like me? Everyone says I'm awfully pneumatic. Eventually, Bernard took Lenina to the Westminster Abbey Cabaret, where Calvin Stopes and his 16 saxophonists were playing. Also featured was London's finest scent and colour organ and all the latest synthetic music. With the aid of four Soma tablets, Bernard managed to spend a successful evening with the girl, and the next morning he agreed to apply at once for a permit to visit the Savage Reservation. He was quite nervous as he stood before the large desk of the director of hatcheries and conditioning. Oh, going to take Lenina Crown, I see. Yes, sir. Very pneumatic. Uh, uh, yes, sir. New Mexico Reservation. How long ago was it? Let me see. Twenty, twenty-five years? Hmm. I must have been your age then. Uh, sir? I had the same idea as you. Wanted to have a look at the savages. Got a permit for New Mexico and went there for my summer holiday. With my girl at the moment. She was a beta minus, I think. Oh, yes. She had yellow hair and was especially pneumatic. Well, it was terrible. We rode about on horses and all that, and, and the last day of our stay, she got lost. Somewhere in those horrid mountains. Lost. We never did find her, poor girl. Must have fallen in some crevice. Yes, we searched for days, but no luck. Ugh. Miserable trip. Oh, you must have had a terrible shock. Oh, don't imagine there was anything unethical about it. Nothing emotional or long-drawn. It was all perfectly healthy and normal. I'm sure it was, sir. What's that? Oh. Mr. Marx, I should like to take this opportunity of saying I'm not at all pleased with the reports I receive of your behavior outside working hours. Alphas are so conditioned that they do not have to be infantile in their emotional behavior, but that is all the more reason for their making a special effort to conform. And so, Mr. Marks, I give you fair warning. Uh, yes, sir. If ever I again hear of any lapse from a proper standard of infantile decorum, I shall ask for your transference to a sub-centre, preferably to Iceland. Good morning. The journey was quite uneventful. The Blue Pacific rocket lost four minutes in a tornado over Texas but was able to land at Santa Fe less than 40 seconds behind schedule. Lenina and Bernard slept that night at Santa Fe, and Lenina was very happy. Imagine 60 escalator squash racket courts in the hotel and obstacle and electromagnetic golf, too. Oh, Bernard, it's simply too lovely. Uh, there will be no scent organs, television, or even hot water once we get out on the reservation. I can stand it. You'll see. Only... Progress is lovely, isn't it? They took a rocket ship into the interior, and from there they traveled on horseback. And all Bernard could think about was Iceland, and how cold and barren it would be. The director's warning had made him even quieter and more sullen than usual. And then, that evening, they reached their destination. 
Before them was the village of Malpais, situated on a mesa. Adobe hovels growing out of the stony ground, dust and squalor and the smell of wood smoke. What an awful place. I don't like it. Who's that man coming toward us? He used to be our guide. I I'm frightened, Bernard. Quiet. We shouldn't have come. Oh, good morrow. You're civilized, aren't you? You come from outside, from the other place? My name is Bernard Marx. This is Lenina Crown. Hmm. My name is John. Come with me. He speaks English. That's strange. Probably trained as a guide. Where is he leading us? To that hut, I believe. Uh, there seems to be some sort of activity over there. Orgy! Orgy! Why, it's like our lower caste community sing. Only look, now they're beating themselves with whips. Oh, no, Bernard! It's got something to do with their religion. What a wonderful intensity of feeling it must generate. I often think one may have missed something in not having passions like that. Nonsense! Bernard, what's wrong with that man? Where? Oh, he's just old, that's all. Old? But but we don't look like that when we're old. He's so wrinkled, so... Oh, it's horrible. That's because we age all at once. We stay 17 until we're 60 or so, and, and then... And then we die, and they burn our bodies and recover the phosphorus for the good of the world state, just as it should be. But this... <gasps> what is it? That... That woman! Oh, Bernard, no! Take me away! Take me away! She's only nursing her baby, Lenina. That's her child. She's the mother. Bernard, how can you be so vulgar? Oh, I think I'll be sick. Please, Bernard, anywhere. Anywhere. Is something wrong? I think we'd better take Lenina inside. Uh, Over here. Follow me. My Soma. I'm out of Soma. Bernard. I'm sorry, Lenina. I didn't bring him. Oh. Here. Inside. This is my home. This is my home. You are welcome to remain here. John? John? Yes, Mother. Mother? These are people from the outside, Mother. They have come to see the reservation. From the other place? You're from the other place. Don't come near me. But don't you see, I'm from there, too. I'm civilized. I don't belong here. It's, it's all a terrible mistake. This is my mother, Linda. Uh, were you born here? No. No, I tell you, I was decanted like normal people. Oh, thank Ford, someone has come. At last, thank Ford. Bernard, Bernard, please keep her away. Could you tell us about yourself, please? Well, I came here 25 years ago with a man. His name was Thomas. We went riding together on, on horses. There was a terrible storm. I got lost, lost in this horrible place. It was the last day of our stay. He left me here, alone. Lenina? <laughs> yes? Uh, you will be interested to know that our director of hatcheries and conditioning is named Thomas, and that he came here 25 no. years ago. Oh, no, no. And it, that... It can't be. But it is. He told me so himself. <laughs> what a discovery. This boy, this boy is our director's son. <laughs> Our director is a father. Oh, it's too horrible. <laughs> Mother, what is he saying? <laughs> Iceland. Iceland, indeed. Bernard, stop it. Well, we'll see who tells who where to go now. Uh, John. Yes, sir? How would you and your mother like to return to civilization? Do you mean it? Oh, please, do you? Listen, they're crazy here. I was a beta minus. I always worked in the fertilizing room. I was a good worker. But how can I tell them? They don't understand. They mend things. They don't know what a helicopter is or, or, or Soma. They have babies, like dogs. Oh, it's too revolting. Oh, thank Ford. If it hadn't been for my son, for John, what a comfort he has been to me. Your son? How can you? You were beta minus. I know, I know, but he's been a comfort to me just the same. If only I'd had Soma... Oh, do you mean it? Will you take us back to civilization? <laughs> of course. Uh, we'll leave tomorrow. <laughs> you and your son. Back to civilization. <laughs>
and Bernard was as good as his word. That very night, he and John and his mother and Lenina took the Blue Pacific rocket to London. For Lenina, it was a happy trip since she had taken four somers the minute they got back to the hotel. For John, it was a voyage of discovery. Poor Linda, his mother, could only weep for joy. But for Bernard, it was a moment of triumph. Triumph such as he had never known before. Brave New World, Part One, by Aldous Huxley. A startling, shocking account of what can happen to our civilization 600 years in the future. And more importantly, a warning to all of us against the destruction of moral standards, family life, and the soul of man. Join us next week when we will continue with Part Two of Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future of what could become the Brave New World. Presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed by William Frug. Brave New World was adapted for radio by Mr. Frug. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Bill Idelson, Gloria Henry, Charlotte Lawrence, Byron Kane, Sam Edwards, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, and Lorreen Tuttle. Original music composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished author, Mr. Aldous Huxley. Brave New World is a study of the future as it may be, unless we are extremely careful. It depicts a society in which man has replaced nature by science, morality by drugs, individuality by total conformity. It is a hideous prospect, yet we seem determined to follow this path of self-destruction. But Brave New World need not be our future. The choice, after all, is always in our own hands. <laughs> CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight... Part two of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels. Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. And we are proud to once again have Mr. Huxley as our narrator. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. This is Aldous Huxley. In the garden outside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, it was playtime. Naked in the warm June sunshine, six or seven hundred little boys and girls were running with shrill yells over the lawns, or playing games, or squatting silently in twos and threes among the flowering shrubs. And strolling across the smooth turf came the director of hatcheries and conditioning, followed eagerly by a group of new students. And here we have playtime for our little tots. Notice the games, all carefully constructed to use as many mechanical devices as possible. In olden times, children used to play simple games using only a ball and a bat. <laughs> Madness. Nothing was added to increase consumption. Then came our Ford. 
He taught us the principle of mass production in the assembly line many centuries ago and changed all that. Good morning, Director. Sir, what an unexpected pleasure. Boys, this is the resident controller for Western Europe. This is his Ford ship, Master for Marmed. Boys? Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. I was just showing the students the children, sir. Lovely children. Busy as bees at their unrestricted play. Controller, if you have the time, I wonder if you might tell the students something about the bad old days. I might. Where are you taking them? To the Hatchery and Conditioning Center to see the manufacturing of the babies. Very well, I'll walk along with you. Ah. Yes, in the old days, children lived in a place called home. A rabbit hole with suffocating intimacies. Maniacally, the mother... Uh, please don't be shocked at that word. The mother brooded over her children. Her children. Our Ford, or our Freud, as for some inscrutable reason he chose to call himself whenever he spoke of psychological matters, our Freud was the first to reveal the appalling dangers of family life. Unpleasant as they may seem, students... These are facts. People used to be viviparous, gave birth to their children. What were the consequences? A world dominated by mothers and fathers was a world full of every kind of perversion, from sadism to chastity. There were also husbands, wives, and lovers. Now everyone belongs to everyone else. Thank Ford for progress. Yes, thank thank Ford. Ford. Actually, we still preserve a few outmoded ethics of pre-stable societies in our savage reservations. Did you ever visit a reservation, Director? Yes, I once went to look at the savages in New Mexico. Well, that must have been 25 years ago. Mother's, father's marriage. Oh, very repulsive. <laughs> yes. Well, here we are. I'll say goodbye. Goodbye, Controller, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. And now, boys, if you'll follow me inside the hatchery. And here we are, a hive of activity. Alpha superintending, betas doing the skilled work, gammas in green, busy at routine jobs, and deltas in khaki, incapable of doing anything except sweeping the floor. Every member of society perfectly content to belong to his predestined caste except for a few criminal exceptions, which reminds me, one of those criminal exceptions is meeting us here at 11, an Alpha Plus, no less, Mr. Bernard Marx. What has he done, sir? What has he done? He refuses to participate in mechanical sports. He is lax. He... Ah, oh, here he comes now. Good morning, Director. Mr. Marx. You and Alina Crown returned from the Savage Reservation last night, I understand. Yes, sir. Uh, we visited some of the places you told me about last week, Director. In fact, uh, we science. met... Science! Hmm? Your attention, please. Everyone step this way. If I have interrupted your labors, it is because a painful duty constrains me. This man who stands before you, this Alpha Plus, the highest level of society, has grossly betrayed the trust imposed in him by his heretical views on sports and soma, by his scandalous refusal to be promiscuous, he has proved himself an enemy of society, a subverter, ladies and gentlemen, of all order and stability, a conspirator against civilization itself. For this reason, I am ordering his immediate transference to a sub-center of the lowest order. In Iceland, he will have small opportunity to lead others astray by his unfordly example. Bernard Marx... Can you show any reason why I should not now execute the judgment passed upon you? Yes, I can. What did you say? You told me you visited the Savage Reservation 25 years ago, Director, with a young Beta Minus, I believe. Uh, you told me she was lost during a storm and that you returned without her. I thought perhaps you'd like to see her again. Linda! Thomas! Thomas! Oh, Thomas, it's me. Don't you remember? You're Linda. Oh, I knew I'd recognize you, Thomas. You look just the same. No one ages here. Thomas, look at me. I'm Linda. Remember? Hug me. Hold me. What is the meaning of this? Who is this hag? Thomas. Oh, Thomas, it's Linda. Linda, you're beta minus. John, look, it's him. It's your father. 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 Oh. What's the meaning of this disgusting joke? 
Who is this savage and this dreadful woman? Take them away! It isn't a joke. It's absolutely true. I'm his mother and you're the father. Father, it's me, John. I'm your son. <laughs> and now, now who is guilty of antisocial behavior, Director? Oh, no, 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 no! A father as director of hatcheries. It was out of the question. The controller asked for his resignation. And all upper caste London was wild to see the savage and his mother. Bernard Marx became a hero, and even Lenina Crown had her share of reflected glory. Good morning, Lenina. Oh, good morning, Fanny. Well, you certainly seem pleased with yourself. Yes, I am pleased. Bernard called up half an hour ago. He has to go to a party at the controller's, and he asked me if I'd take the savage to the feelies this evening. Oh, lucky girl. What's he like, Lenina? I've heard he's terribly good-looking. Oh, he is, but so very odd. In what way? Well, the day Bernard and I left the reservation, the savage came into my room. I'd taken a soma, so I didn't notice him, until suddenly I awakened, and there he was bending over me. What happened? Well, naturally, I assumed something was going to happen, but instead of that, he just ran out of the room. Well, how odd. What a terribly ungentlemanly thing to do. Doesn't he like you? Oh, I'm sure he does, so I can't make it out. And, oh, please don't tell this to anyone, Fanny. It upsets me, because I like him. I mean, I really like him. <gasps> Lenina! I know it's immoral, but I just can't help myself. I do like him. The days passed. Success went fizzily to Bernard's head. His diffidence turned to bumptiousness. His non-conformity was forgotten and he became completely orthodox. The resident world controller appointed him official escort for the savage and asked him to make regular reports on the young man's reactions to civilization. This Bernard did assiduously. <laughs> Today I sent the savage to the Feelys with Lenina Crown. The feature was three weeks in a helicopter. Instead of holding the knobs on the chair arms, thus enabling him to experience the sensations of the lovers on the screen, the savage refused to participate. Lenina tells me he called the film vulgar and indecent. The savage refuses to take Soma and seems most distressed because the woman, Linda, his uh, M-O-T-H-E-R, uh, remains permanently on Soma holiday. Uh, in spite of her senility and the extreme repulsiveness of her appearance, uh, the savage frequently goes to see her and appears much attached to her. <laughs> Do you mean you refuse to come down to dinner? Bernard, I'm sick. I've eaten civilization and I'm sick. Do you realize that I've invited the most important people in London tonight? The four chief justices here. The arch community song of Canterbury has flown in just to meet you. You've changed, Bernard. You used to feel the way I do about things. I talked to Helmholtz Watson. He says you've changed, too. I haven't. Listen, if you don't come downstairs for my dinner party, I'll be the laughing stock of London. I'll come. Just let me read this to you first. Hmm? One day, many years ago, I found this book in my mother's room. One of the Indians had found it in a cave. It must be hundreds of years old. Hmm. It's called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare. Oh, I've heard of him. We don't allow it. Smut. But... He says all the things I feel about Lenina. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. Is there no pity sitting in the clouds that sees into the bottom of my grief? Oh, sweet my mother, cast me not away. Delay this marriage for a month, a week. <laughs> marriage? <laughs> oh, no. Bernard. <laughs> oh, marriage, that's too good, really. <laughs> Bernard, stop it. And, and mother. <laughs> oh, sweet my mother. 
Oh, he's positively vulgar. You stop oh, wait it. till I tell Helmholtz about this. Stop it or I'll hit you. <laughs> oh, come now, where's your sense of humor? Bernard. Can't you see how funny it is? Get out! I said leave me alone. No, I, I'm, I'm leaving, John. I'm leaving. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. The next morning, a pneumatic young girl, crisply clad in a beta minus viscose linen suit, stood outside the door of the savage's apartment and somewhat nervously rang the buzzer. What? Lanina. You don't seem very glad to see me, John. Not glad? Oh, if you only knew. May I come in, then? May I kiss your hand, Lanina? My hand? Admired, Lanina. Indeed, the top of admiration, worth what's dearest in the world... I wanted to do something first to show I was worthy of you. What are you talking about? Lanina, tell me something. I'll do anything you tell me, anything at all. I'd sweep the floor if you wanted. But we've got vacuum cleaners here. It isn't necessary. No, of course it isn't necessary. But some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone. I, I'd like to undergo something noble just to show you how much I love you, Lanina. Do you mean it, John? Yes, but I hadn't meant to say it, not until I... Listen, Lenina, on the reservation, people get married. Get what? For always. They make a promise to live together for always. What a disgusting idea. Answer me this question, John. Do you really like me or don't you? I love you more than anything in the world. Well, then, why on earth didn't you say so? Come here to me, John. Hug me. Oh, but, Lenina... Hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. Lenina, what are you doing? No, no, get away from me. Don't come near me. Hug me, honey. You, you strumpet. A dram is better than a dad. Get out. But don't you want get me? Get out of my sight. Oh, John! Or I kill you. Oh, he's mad. He's gone mad. Oh, thou weed, who art so lovely fair and smellst so sweet that the sense aches at thee. Impudent strumpet, impudent strumpet, impudent strumpet. <laughs> Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Savage. Who's ill? Linda. My mother dying. Yes, yes, I'll come at once. Welcome to the Park Lane Hospital for the dying. You've come to see someone in the galloping senility ward? Yes. My mother. Oh, how vulgar. You know who I mean. Linda. Oh, oh, yes. Room 43, bed 16. She'll be dying any minute now. This way, please. Is there any hope? Well, of course not. Or else she wouldn't have been sent here. Through these doors. What are these children doing here? Death conditioning, of course. It starts at 18 months. Every tot spends two mornings a week in a hospital for the dying. All the best toys are kept here, and they get chocolate ice cream on death days. They learn to take dying as a matter of course. This way. Oh, here we are. Well, I must go. I've got my batch of children coming. Time for their chocolate ice cream. Linda? Linda, it's John. Your eyes are open, but you don't know me, do you? It's John, your son. Linda? 
Linda, don't you know me? Hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. <gasps> Linda. Linda. Oh. Mother. <laughs> The menial staff of the Park Lane Hospital for the Dying consisted of 162 deltas, 84 red-headed female twins, and 78 identical mongoloid male twins. At six, when their working day was over, the two groups assembled in the vestibule of the hospital and were served their daily soma ration. It was into this crowd that the savage walked, so overcome with his grief and his remorse that he did not realize he was shouldering his way into the gathering throng. All right, here it is, soma distribution. In good order, please. Oh, hurry up there, stand in line for your soma. Linda. Linda died because of this. Oh, now don't grab, there's enough for everybody. One gram for an evening's delight, two for a trip to the gorgeous east, and four for a weekend in paradise. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Stop! Stop! Ford is a savage. Listen, I beg you, lend me your ears. Don't take that horrible stuff. It's poison. Mr. Savage, please, the people are waiting. You're slaves, all of you. Don't you want to be men? Don't you want freedom? Freedom? Ford Almighty, call them, please. <laughs> From somewhere behind the milling, angry crowd, Bernard Marx saw the savage. He and his friend, Helmholtz Watson, had been searching for John. Now they hurried forward. Helmholtz, he's mad. They'll lynch him. Oh, Ford, help us. Ford, help those who help themselves, Bernard. Come on. Where are you going? Come back. It's a fight, a real fight. I've been waiting all my life for this. Man at last. I'll make you free whether you want to be or not. Give me those soma boxes. Sir, Mr. Savage, no! Stop it! Helmholtz! Join me! Yes! Stop Throw it. the poison pills away! By all means, throw them away! Stop it! Freedom! Be men and be free! Over here, officers, this Freedom. way! Give them the Throw them away! Freedom! Stand up as men! Win your soma. freedom! Soma spray! Win... John, good. You're done. Free. Take him to the Where? resident controller's office. All right. All right, it's all over. We're all happy now. We're so happy. We all love each other, don't we? Oh, yes, we all love each other. Line up for your Soma. So you don't much like civilization, Mr. Savage. No, I don't. John, you're talking to the resident controller. We don't need your comments, Mr. Marx. I think civilization is horrible. And yet people are happy. They get what they want, and they never want what they can't get. They're well off. They're safe. They're never ill. They're not afraid of death. They're blissfully ignorant of passion and old age. They're plagued with no mother or father. They've got no wives or children to feel strongly about. They're so conditioned that they practically can't help behaving as they ought to behave. <laughs> and you ask them to chuck this all away for liberty? My good boy. All the same, it seems quite horrible to me. Of course it does. Actual happiness always looks pretty squalid in comparison with the overcompensations for misery. And being contented has none of the glamour of a good fight against misfortune. Happiness is never grand. They call this happiness working at an embryo assembly line manufacturing babies? Science, my boy. Besides, they like it. Well, Mr. Marx, the time has come. You are being sent to an island. To, to an island? Oh, please, sir. Don't send me to Iceland. I, I promise... I'll do what I should. I'll conform to the rules. One would think he was going to have his throat cut, whereas if he had the smallest sense, he'd understand his punishment is really a reward. 
He'll be sent to an island where he'll meet the most interesting set of men and women in the world. All the people who weren't satisfied with orthodoxy. Everyone in the world who's anyone. Then why didn't you go to an island yourself? Because, finally, I preferred this. Sometimes I regret it. Happiness is a hard master, particularly other people's happiness. Well, gentlemen... There are many islands available. Which climate do you choose, Mr. Watson? Well, I should like a thoroughly bad climate. I think I'd write better if I had to contend with difficulties. How about the Falkland Islands? That would be fine. Good. You may leave now. You too, Mr. Marks. Uh, goodbye, Helmholtz. Goodbye, Bernard. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, John. One more question. Of course. Where is God in this scheme of yours? It's a subject that has always had a great interest for me. You've never read this, of course, the Holy Bible, New and Old Testaments. I've got quite a few revolting old books like that here. But if you know about God, why don't you tell the people? This book is old. It's about God hundreds of years ago, not God now. But God doesn't change. Men do, though. No, my friend. Call it the fault of civilization. God isn't compatible with machinery and scientific medicine and universal happiness. But when you're alone, it's natural to believe in God. When you're quite alone in the night, thinking about death... But people are never alone now. We make them hate solitude, and we arrange their lives so that it's almost impossible for them ever to have it. No solitude... No God. Is that why there's no self-denial here? No God? No reason for it? Of course. Industry and prosperity are only possible when there is no self-denial. If there were, the wheels would stop turning. But God's the reason for everything noble and fine and heroic. My dear young friend, civilization has absolutely no need for nobility or heroism. You're conditioned so that you can't help doing what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is, on the whole, so pleasant. So many of the natural impulses are allowed free play that there really aren't any temptations to resist. Anybody can be virtuous now. No temptations, no inconveniences. But I like the inconveniences. We don't. We prefer to do things comfortably. But I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. In fact, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right. I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. Not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent. The right to have cancer. The right to have too little to eat. The right to live in Constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. I claim them all. You're welcome. Bernard and Helmholtz left for their islands but the savage was not allowed to go with them. The controller wished to continue the experiment. Three weeks later, the savage ran away. After some days of wandering, he took refuge in an abandoned lighthouse. But his desire for solitude was not to be fulfilled. His hiding place was discovered. There were articles in the papers. Sightseers came by the thousands. One Sunday, Lenina Crown came for a picnic with three of her latest boyfriends. The day after her visit, two young reporters came to call, hoping for an exclusive interview. The door of the lighthouse was ajar. They pushed it open and walked into a shuttered twilight. Through an archway on the further side of the room, they could see the bottom of the staircase that led up to the higher floors. Just under the crown of the arch dangled a pair of feet. They called, 
no one answered. They saw him. At last the savage had found solitude. He was alone, quite alone. Thus concludes Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. We wish to thank Mr. Huxley for appearing on these broadcasts as our narrator. And uh, we would also like to thank you, our listeners, for your enthusiastic response to this new series. This is William Conrad inviting you to join us again next week when we present George Stewart's dramatic account of one of nature's most terrifying phenomena, Storm. The following week, listen as Dr. Frank C. Baxter interviews William Shakespeare. Presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed by William Froog. Brave New World was adapted for radio by Mr. Froog. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield, Bill Idelson, Gloria Henry, Charlotte Lawrence, Parley Bear, Dora Singleton, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, and Lorene Tuttle. Original music composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com.
Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Broadcasting Company presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for today is called If I Should Wake Before I Die. I am a practical man. I want you to understand that I am practical, utterly practical. That I believe nothing that cannot be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. I know that men live because the lives of many of them impinge on me, who also live. I believe that they die because I've seen them die. Beyond that, there is nothing of life or death that can be proved to my satisfaction. And speculation does not interest me. Whether men die or do not die is a small concern to me. My abiding interest is knowledge, pure knowledge. I've devoted most of my 47 years to its pursuit. The application of the knowledge I gain is of small moment to me. I may say that it's of no moment whatever. The experiment, the deduction and proof of new natural laws is the be all and the end all, as I believe the poets put it. And their application is not my province. Don here does not share my opinion. Don's interest is in the applications of the laws that I and others have discovered and proved. You don't care, Dr. Anderson, whether a million men and women die as the result of the application of your discoveries? It is a matter of no interest whatever to me, Don. I wonder if you really mean that. I mean it. Implicitly. You know what the world is doing with your discoveries? Obviously, I know something of what they're doing. Well, I assure you, it does not interest me. It doesn't interest you that three men are circling this earth in a satellite rocket as a result of your research? I am interested only in the data they may bring back from outer space. Data on which I may base further research. It doesn't interest you that those data may become the basis for the building of fortresses out there in space from which the earth can be bombarded by some of the new weapons that have derived from your studies? I didn't invent the weapons, Don. Other men did, using your technical data. Yeah, that's their concern. But does it interest you that those three men may never come back to Earth, that they may be facing a horrible death out there 700 miles away from this Earth, alone out there in the dark? I have no time to contemplate their troubles, Don. You sent them there? I did not. They wouldn't be there if it hadn't been for your formulas and your work. I tell you again, that is their concern, not mine. Do you know who they are? Don, I'm very busy. Would you please go back to your office and let me finish my work? Ernst Macy and Dan Seymour. Please go away. And your brother. My brother. Your kid brother, Edward. Will you hand me that slide rule, please? Will you listen to me? Uh, uh, the other one, please. Dr. Anderson, I tell you that... I'll answer. Yes. Oh, this is Don, Major. When? You sure? Yes, he's here. No, I don't think so. I'll tell him. Dr. Anderson. Well, that was Major Hilton over at the center. They had another message from the satellite rocket at 1455. From your brother, Edward. What did you say? From 700 miles out in space. From a rocket that's been circling the Earth for three months now, alone out there in the cold void such a little hope of ever coming back to warmth and light and friends from the dark and the cold. What are you talking about? Your brother Edward. He's dead. Somewhere out there in space, he's dead. Do you hear me? He sent you a message. 
He died before he finished it. Tell my brother, he said. Tell my brother if I should wake before I die. And he died before he finished it. Do you know what that means? Do you hear me? Your brother! Just hand me that notebook there, will you? Uh, no, the one with the brown cover. Yeah, thanks. Knowledge is all. The application of the knowledge is unimportant, unless it leads to further knowledge. I have no theories of life or death or of creation. Explanation or the attempt at explanation is futile and unnecessary. There are no secrets of life or death. They're chemical processes peculiar to man. They exist, and that's all. Perhaps someday I or one of my colleagues will discover the principles of this living and dying. But there's a long, long apprenticeship ahead of us before we can turn to that face of science. Then, in the meantime, there are problems to be solved, answers to be proved. And it's of no importance what temporary use is made of the results of our researches. The space rocket would have been useful, no doubt, in charting the effects of cosmic radiation. But it's gone. We must dismiss it as an expedient that fails. Knowledge. Knowledge is the goal. All else is unimportant. Never forget that. It's worth any price. Doesn't it depend just a little, Dr. Anderson, on who pays the price? What? The ones who die in the search? Well, as long as the important ones don't die, the price is reasonable. Who is to decide which are the unimportant ones? I am important. Yes, to yourself. To the world. The others are important to the world, too. Nonsense. There wouldn't be any world without them, Doctor. Well, in that sense... People I... like your brother. He was dispensable to science. To you, personally? Are you implying that I didn't love my brother? Am I? I did. I wonder. Now, please don't try to involve me in an emotional experience, Don. I have work to do. It might do you some good, Dr. Anderson, if you did get involved in an emotional experience. It might wake you up. I'm awake, thank you. No, you're not. Kind of explain what you mean by that? No. I don't think I will, Doctor. I don't think I will. Well, I don't know what you mean. You know what you're doing. I do. You know that the application of your research and experiment is producing the most frightful weapons the world has ever seen. That's not my fault. That's application again. Well, they wouldn't exist without what you know, what you've proved. In that case, I am only helping my country. That's what the others say. What others? The other scientists in other countries... They're helping their countries, too. Well, that's their privilege. You realize that you and the others are distilling destruction for the whole world, don't you? That's the fault of you young military men who are converting pure research into weapons for war. I grant that. But you are the ones that gave us that research. It's your dreams, not ours. I wish you'd stop talking of dreams. Well, I wish... You wish what? I remember... What your brother sent to you from way out there in space, dying in a rocket ship, a spaceship that grew out of your dreams. Yeah, I've forgotten it. Why, Dr. Anderson, you must remember it. No. It's like that little prayer that kids say at bedtime. Only your brother changed it around a little. He knew what he was talking about. You remember it? Something sentimental. I remember I used to say it when we were children at night. I know it. Now I lay me down to sleep. Uh, if I should die before I wake... That isn't what your brother said. Dying out there in the cold and the dark. I don't... I'd try to remember it if I were you, Doctor. Your brother said, If I should wake before I die... It doesn't make sense. Oh, yes, it does, Doctor. He was telling you to wake up before you die. Wake up, Doctor, before you die and the world dies with you.
There is nothing I can do. I have committed myself to this, and I've gone too far. The others, Marshoff and Beveridge and Delaplane, they have gone too far, too. We cannot stop. It's no dream, no dream at all. It is pure science. What if they have perverted our dreams? Not dreams. What if they have perverted our studies, our, our equations, our living thoughts to weapons of destruction? It was not our fault. I was not my brother's keeper. But he died far, far out there in the illimitable reaches of immeasurable cold. Out where the cosmic dust lies in great cold clouds. There is no power. The alchemists tried for thousands of years to transmute base metals into precious ones. I only carried out their fumbling task. But you succeeded. You and the others. I didn't pollute the waters of Bikini. No. You sat in a snug office 8,000 miles away. And the reports of the awful upheaval of the sea came to you. And you read them and smiled. You leaned back in your chair and smiled. They've proved what we knew could be proved, you said. You smiled. It was not my fault. You dreamed that destruction leaked from the floor of the sea and the waters were charged with death and you smiled in your dream. It was no dream. And your brother and two other men shook hands with you and stepped into the rocket shell that was to be their tomb and that tomb was the reality of your dream. No. And you dream now of more wonders upon the earth, upon this earth that one day you will destroy, you with your own hands. No, I say. Your dream grows brighter and greater until the whole universe is blotted out and you stretch out your hands for reality. And there's only black. Attention, please. Attention, please. In 30 seconds, Project Phaeton will be activated. In 30 seconds, Project Phaeton will be activated. 30 seconds. Wait. I tell you, they don't. No, not now. Come over here to the window. No, I you must. Bring your... No, no, take those binoculars from the desk. Quick, come on. Is this the end, then? This is Project Phaeton. What is it? Over here. Where you can see the moon. Hurry. 23 seconds. Oh, what is it? Seconds. We're going to reach the moon. Seconds. What? Here. Seconds. Watch the radar. Seconds. No, the binoculars won't do you any good. Seconds. Here. Watch. Seconds. This is the project I heard about. Him. Where did you hear about it? There's been talk. You know, get somebody's head for that. Watch. Watch. Is seconds. this just another radar contact? Seven We're going seconds. to reach it. We kept it a secret for ten so long. Seconds. Only ten seconds. Nine what are you going to do? The beam is on. Eight what are you going to do? Seconds. Going to reach the moon seven with a projectile. Seconds. Atomic vision projectile. Six seconds. Watch. Five seconds. Watch. Oh, Four Dr. Anderson. Seconds. No. Three seconds. Two seconds. If we do this. One second. I did hear the wait. possible to conduct all one's experiments personally, the margin of error would naturally be reduced to the minimum. But when a large number of other individuals enter into the operation, error and the possibility of error is naturally multiplied. 
Now, that's an interesting thought. I must make a note of it. In what ratio does probable error increase with the addition of new minds to a particular project? I must deduce a formula. At the moment, I do not know exactly what went wrong. It's within the realm of possibility that I might have made a slight miscalculation myself. Although, naturally, I doubt that. It's possible that fissionable material reacts with greater celerity where atmosphere, as we know it, is lacking. It is possible that there were on the moon certain elements unknown to us, elements that do not show up in spectrometric analyses, elements particularly amenable to chain reaction of unprecedented violence. It's mildly shocking to realize the extent of the damage done by Project Phaeton. However, I'm reminded of the theory of the philosopher Berkeley that one must doubt everything outside the circle of one's own consciousness. Certainly, I have the evidence of my own consciousness. The image of the moon instantaneously disappeared on the radar screen at the precise second when my calculations showed that the projectile had reached the moon's surface. And although this is the time of the full moon, for three nights now in succession, it has not appeared in its customary place in the firmament. Therefore, I am led to an ineluctable conclusion, which is corroborated by other hearsay evidence. It is a fact, and I state it positively, that the moon has been utterly destroyed as a result of Project Phaeton. Never again, the sweet moonlight of the lovers Nevermore the harvest moon rising above the hills on an October night. But science is vindicated. Science has done it. Pure science went into the calculations the great thinking machines ground and chattered and the data poured out. The data that I alone knew would come. Equations no human mind could imagine. Beautiful, pure, mathematical thoughts far beyond the conception. Far beyond the conception of the ones who die. Calculations of mass and energy and the cosmic movements of all the planets. Allowances for the gravitation of stars 40 light years away. Corrections for the rotation of the Earth. The absolute cold of 240,000 miles of space. Pinpointed on the great crater of Copernicus. That man has gazed on and pondered since the world began... But no man shall ever see it. The hand of man has reached out into space and found a target. Pure, pure thought that sought out the farthest reaches of a mind that devised the weapon. And in every harbor of the world, the tides rushed out, and the very floor of the sea was plain to human eyes for one last look. And far out on the breast of the ocean, great tidal waves that overtook and destroyed everything that floated. Man has at last conquered space. And thousands dead for miles inland from the shore when the waters returned. And the moon... I did not know we would destroy the moon, I tell you. I thought there would be a small explosion that we could see. And man has destroyed what God hath wrought. <laughs> You've dreamed well, my doctor, my scientist, my brother. It was an experiment. And well done. Well completed. Added to the price of progress. So they are. So they are. There will be no more wars, Don. Don't you understand that? We have proved that modern war is so destructive that no nation can afford to fight them. That's no dream. Yes, yes, you have proved that. You have destroyed one world. Very pretty demonstration. It was no world. It was the moon, the dead moon. Dead, yes. Gone, yes. But perhaps it was a world, Dr. Anderson. Nonsense. Vegetation on the moon, you knew that. Radar proved it long ago. Way back in 1948. Well... Why could there not have been people? It couldn't be proved. It will never be proved now. There's only... dust. And our own world. Can you think of what has happened on our own world and, and look any man in the eye? I didn't intend that. But you accomplished it. I know it, but... You have other experiments in mind, I assume? Well, not immediately, of course. Of course. And not for years. Of course not. We have to go on. Do you? You know the end of it all. We can't. 
can't stop now. We started this thing, and there's no turning back. The point of no return. Exactly. We have accomplished a thing that human minds could never imagine. We have, you have dreamed, and you go on dreaming of destruction. Oh, no. We'll take care next time. You will. Of course we will. This is a, an unfortunate accident. Ten million people killed on this continent alone. Cities destroyed that can never be rebuilt. The very moon, the ageless satellite of the Earth, blown to dust. Haven't you dreamed enough? It is not a dream. You will not wait before you die, before we die? What can I do? You can stop it. Don, it can't be stopped. It must be stopped. Man wasn't put on earth to die by his own hand, to be murdered by his fellow men. But what can I do? Stop. We can't stop. We've started a chain reaction among people. You know what chain reactions are. You know what follows. You know that a simple fuse lit by a tiny match can set off an explosion. That, that will destroy the world. There's nothing to be done. Nothing? Marshoff and Beveridge and Delaplane and I, I say it in all humility. We know all there is to know about these cosmic forces. We know more than any other four men in the world. We do you four know how to stop this, this progress? I know. I think they know. But you won't stop how? Well, if you four could agree to put aside all this. We can't. There is no hope. We must go on to destruction? We must go on. How do you know you must go on? I know. How do you know? I have been told. By the others? Yes. They'll go on if you give up? They will. I know. What if they died... They are the directing brains of all the research in their countries. And? If they died, their programs will be set back so far. They won't die. They have died. What did you say? I said they have died. It's impossible. They did. How do you know they died? When? They died on a ship in the Atlantic Ocean. When? When everybody else died on the Atlantic Ocean. In the tidal wave. Yes. You disposed of them very neatly. I didn't. You killed them just as you killed all those others. They're dead. It's my business to know about that, Dr. Anderson. Marshal. Bentley. You have no rivals now, Dr. Anderson. Why, that's right. We're in front of the world. What's left of it? There's nobody to carry on their work. Are you sure? Why, I know. But now, yes, now. What were they coming here for? I didn't say they were coming here. They were, though. I know they were. But what? Why were they coming here? Don't you know, Dr. Anderson? To kill me. To murder me. Why, of course, they knew me. They heard about Project Theater. They knew if they murdered me, that would stop all our developments here. And they would ally themselves against us. And without the weapons that I could devise, they would... Why, they'd win the war. What war, Dr. Anderson? What, what war... Why, they'd declare war on us. No, they wouldn't declare war on us. They'd just... Why, they'd just destroy us overnight. No. What? No. They weren't coming here to kill you. I know they were. No. What then? They were coming here to make a deal with you. A deal? Yes. They were afraid. Of what? Of the thing that killed them. Tied away. But that, they didn't know what it was to be, but they... Well, maybe they were afraid of it. Maybe they were afraid.
afraid of what you'd do next. Well, they'd better be afraid. Oh, they're not anymore. They're dead. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, remember what your brother said? My... Yes, I remember. But what? Why, they awoke before they died, Dr. Anderson. It didn't do them any good. No, it didn't, did it? No, it certainly didn't. Because you didn't awake, I... Now you're the only one left. You know all the secrets. You know more than any other man in the whole world. I do. Don't I? It's in your power now to go ahead and do things that the others can't duplicate. That they can't even come near. That's my patriotic duty. Is it? I've got to. Why, Don, if I could tell you some of the things I've, I've already planned. Some of the most amazing things. What? I tell you, your mind couldn't even begin to comprehend what I can do. And not worry about competition. And that's right. But there may not be any place left for you to do these wonderful things, Dr. King. Why not? Why, there might not be any world left. Don't you see? But I can't just sit here. No, of course I not. I can't stagnate. I agree. Well, I've spent my whole life studying, learning, thinking, and studying again. I've gone farther into nuclear fission than any other man in history. I know more than even they knew. Do you mean that I should give this all up and just sit here? Not at all, Doctor. Listen to me. I'll show you. There's one little thing. One simple little operation. One... Why, it's as simple as turning a switch the wrong way. Yes. It would neutralize every single atom of fissionable material in the world today. Really? I mean it. It would neutralize every stockpile in the world, and it would be a hundred years before anybody could prepare even one little bomb. Do you realize that? There's only one catch in it. What? You. If you were still around, you and only you in all the world could, well, shall I say, unneutralize it. That's right. Yes. And you want me to give it all up? Yes. I can't do it, Don. I've explained that to you. There's, there's nobody left to carry on but me. Nobody but you. That's right. Dr. Anderson, do you want to die? What? I say, do you want to die? Die? Why, I... I've never particularly thought about dying, Don. Do you know that? Not personally, you mean. Yeah, that's right. That's curious. But you don't mind bringing death to a great many other people, do you? Do you? I... To our brother, Edward. I didn't. I'm your brother, too, Sam. I'll die, too, and everybody else will die, and you'll die by your hand if you don't give it up. I'll die. But I can't do it, I tell you. You're still dreaming, Sam. I tell you, I'm not dreaming. It isn't too late to wake up, Sam. I'm not dreaming. Yes, you are, Sam, and it's time to wake up. I tell you. The title of today's Quiet, Please story is If I Should Wake Before I Die. Written and directed by Willis Cooper, the man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And my brother Don was played by Don Briggs. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Now, for a word about next week, if you can get through the door, here is our writer-producer, Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet Please. Next week, I have a story for you about the man who knew everything. And so until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Around Dodge City, and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun 
Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Clay Richards. Clay Richards. Age 31. 31. Height 6 feet. Eyes brown. Hair red. Eyes brown, hair red. Hey, how'd you like me to print his picture on these notices? I got a woodcut. Well, let me show you. Ernie! Yeah? That's your marshal a copy of that front page. Interviewing Clay's wife yesterday, I noticed a tintype on the mantle, their wedding photograph. So, first thing you know, I snitched it. That's very thoughtful. Yeah. Oh, I'll take it, Ernie. Yeah, here. And then I propped it up in front of me and carved me this woodcut. Ain't she prime? Ain't she just elegant? Real elegant. Good likeness, don't you think? Of course, he was seven or eight years younger with the tintype. Yeah, it's a good likeness. Cuts his hair short. And Doesn't now. show what uh, makes a law-abiding uh, man like him try to rob a bank. Sort of Doesn't look like a man who it, murdered an no, old cashier and a Chinese remember. cook who just happened to sure be there. It over it, though. But, but it's, it's a good likeness. Yes, sir, it is. A picture like this sure dresses up the front page, don't it? Yeah, it's a little masterpiece, Mr. Hightower. A notable contribution to the culture of Dodge City. Well, thank you, Marshal. Does fetch the eye, don't it? I'm printing an extra 500 copies of the weekly, and I bet I sell them all. Too bad the cashier's shot went wild. If he'd managed to kill Clay or even wing him, why, I bet I could sell a thousand extra copies. We must be thankful for the blessings we do receive, Mr. Hightower. Oh, I am, Marshal, I am. Why, just before it happened yesterday afternoon, I didn't know what I was going to fill my columns with. And then, like manna from heaven, two murders and a bank robbery. Attempted bank robbery, Mr. Hightower. He turned and ran for he got his hands on so much as a dollar. Yes. Still, as you say, like manna. Dylan, I... I I'm talking I... business. What is it, Chester? Well, it can wait, I guess, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, print Clay's picture on those notices, Mr. Hightower. Oh, where were we? Uh, eyes brown, hair red. Oh, yes. Also known as Red, Bricktop, and Sorrel. He uh, didn't answer to no other nicknames, did he? No, that's what they call him. All right, then in big letters, $400 reward. Dead or alive. And at the bottom, apply Matt Dillon, Marshal, Dodge City. Mm -hmm. uh, print 200 copies. How soon can I send Chester over for him? This afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Hightower. Chester. Think those posters will do any good? Richards is probably over the line into Oklahoma or Colorado by now. That strawberry roan of his is the fastest in the county. He has no money. He panicked and ran out of the bank before he got a penny. I think he'll try to get help from his wife or brother or a friend the first chance he has. Maybe tonight. I say he's around here somewhere. I, uh... I'm sorry I turned on you like that, Chester. Why, that's all right, Mr. Dillon. Out all night with a posse, no sweet man's bound to get touchy. No, it's not that. It's, it's the, the way... It's the way people use a thing like this. The men riding posse last night, they enjoyed it as though they were hunting fox or possum. High tower back there, he acts like it was a birthday treat, specially gotten up for him. Everybody finds a way to use it. What was it you wanted to tell me? Hmm? Oh, I, I got a kid, a, a little boy, locked up in the cell. He uh -huh. run away from home, back in Cottonwood. Ed Slade turned him over to me when he come through on the stagecoach just now. Kid about 12 years old. Who's is he? Widow woman, Miss Bonnie. She runs the boarding house in Cottonwood. Ed says the kid's always running away a little while, I guess. He flagged Ed for a ride on the road halfway between there and here. Soon as Ed seen him stand there with his bundle on his shoulder, he knowed what he was up to. So he told the kid he'd help him and then turn him over to us when he got here. All right, we'll send a telegram to the mother to come fetch him. Well, come on in, Chester, and shut the door. Mr. Dillon? You're letting in every horse fly in Kansas. Mr. Dillon, I think you better cancel the order for them notices. What? The Dutchman's coming up the street, and he's leading a strawberry roan, and Clay Richards is draped across his back. 
like a sack of wheat across the saddle. Last time I saw him, two days ago, he was standing at the bar laughing his head off. A sack of wheat across the saddle. And followed by half the saloon bums and loafers in town. All right, Chester, make him keep back. All right, now stand back, you fellas. Come on now, back. Stand back. Ziegler. How'd it happen, Ziegler? My goat, my old billy goat, he pushes open the fence last night and runs away. Forget your goat. What about Clay? Yeah, I, I tell you. This morning, I go to look for the goat. I walk here, there, near the river. I see Clay. He sits there. I say, hello, Clay. The gate. You I'm dirty here. Dutchman. You know the dog? Clay was your best friend. He helped you buy your farm, so you kill him for your All right, all of you. Keep back, everybody. Clay? Me? No, no. My brother, he was like... We was in the war together. Peter, listen. You killed him for the war. Not so. I killed nobody. Not, not since Gettysburg. Clay is dead already when I find him. I don't even own a pistol. Ziegler, inside, quick. Yeah, yeah. Chester, give me a hand with Clay. All right, all of you. Listen up. Shut up! I will not tolerate a disturbance. You know me. I got him, Chester. Take his leg. All right, kick the door shut. Marshal, I don't kill Clay. On this table, Chester. What'd you do with Clay's gun? His holster's empty. Gun? Clay's? I ain't got it. I don't even own one. Chester, see if it slipped out. For His holster was empty coming up the street. First thing I noticed. Maybe it's yeah. over on the... Another customer? Well, that's three in less than a day. Oh, bountiful harvest. My fees this month will keep me in luxury. In luxury? Doc, I uh, want to have an inquest as soon as possible. Well, as soon as I finish the autopsy. Shouldn't take long with the practice I've had this week. Huh? <laughs> no. Uh, late afternoon all right with you? I'll take him up to my office right now. Uh, no, thank you, Chester. I can carry him all by myself here. You just open the door there like a good fella. And... Uh-oh. 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 Marshal, tell the city fathers... I'd like to make a deal when the corpses are as famous as this one. <laughs> Back in 53 in San Francisco, a fellow I knew earned a fortune, exhibiting the head of Joaquin Marietta. Tell him if they let me keep the remains, I'll do the autopsies for nothing. Shut the door, Chester. Ziegler, where is it you met Clay on the river? By the fort. This side, by the fort. Right out there, Chester, and see if you can find Clay's gun. Maybe he dropped it when he was shot. I did not shoot, Clay. Sure. I did not. I had no reason to. I did not. I did not. Now, you listen to me. Maybe you think Dodge has got so big, I don't know about everything that goes on here. Well, if you do, you're wrong. If you think I don't know about the bank having an overdue mortgage on your farm, you're wrong. $400 is reason enough for a struggling farmer like you. No. I could not do such a thing. I am a human being. To a peace officer, Ziegler, that's enough grounds for suspicion. But whether you did it or not, we'll be decided it's your trial. In the meantime, you just stop yammering about it. Trial? Me? Even when I shoot somebody, I stand trial. If they find it's justifiable homicide, and they probably will, Clay being a wanted man, then he'll let you off. And if not... Please, I am permitted to go now. Go? Are you crazy? I found this stock. I, I must look after it. You sit right down. You want to be lynched? You're trying to get yourself murdered? Have you forgotten about Clay's brother, Adam? Adam would not believe I shot him. What difference does it make whether he believes it or not? His brother's been killed. Everybody's looking to him to do something about it, and he knows it. You want me to guess where he is right this minute? He's in one of them saloons, lapping up courage to come in here and ask me to give you to him for a present. You want to know who's with him? Ever loafer, ever bum, ever slob in town. Slapping him on the back and telling him what a shame it is. Taking him on to kill you so that they can have some excitement and some fun. Well, maybe you deserve killing, but it's my job to uphold the law and I'm not letting you out of here. What? I tell you, you might that... spend your time trying to think up a better story. That is, if you intend to stay in this town. All right, now think back. Didn't Clay go for his gun before you shot him? I'll 
say you I didn't. If I'm not under arrest, you have no right to keep me here. I got to look after my farm. I go. All right, Chester, lock him up. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Come on now, Ziegler. Step out, Sonny. This cage is bespoke. Who's in there, Chester? Yeah, that little old runaway from Cottonwood. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Come over here, son. Come over here to me. I know who you are. <laughs> you do, do you? You bet. You're Matt Dillon. <laughs> Guilty. I know you right off. He just pointed out to me one day back home. Filler says you was the fastest gun thrower in Kansas. <laughs> Wyatt Earp wouldn't be awful interested to hear that, I'm afraid. Filler says you was faster than older. Faster than Wild Bill Hickok and Hay City and Fat and Masterson or any of them. How many fellas have you killed? You don't keep score, son. It's something you try to forget. Not me. Someday I'll be famous like you, and for every filler I kill, I'll, I'll put a notch on my gun. People will see those notches, and they'll know they better not try Why'd you run away from home, bub? Don't you know your mother's likely to worry about oh, you? Oh, she won't worry. She's too busy working. You ain't gonna make me go back, are you? You wouldn't do that, would you? Well... Because it wouldn't stop me for long. I'd only run away again. Oh, where are you off to in such a sweat? Oh, Texas, California, Mexico... Fella can accomplish things there, not like living in old cottonwood. If you let me go, someday when I'm famous, you can tell people you helped get me started. Well, well that's, that's a pretty strong inducement. Um, I'll have to think about it for a while. And uh, look, uh, while I'm making up my mind, I, I want you to give me your word. Word of a man who'll be famous someday that uh, he won't try to run away from me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to have... Just to lock you up again. Oh, I'll shake on that. Good, good. Now, Chester, I want you to go look for Clay's gun. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. And uh, on the way, stop off and send that uh, telegram. You know? Hmm? Oh, that telegram. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I'll Where's get that right. It's all right, Chester. Go ahead. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Where's that murdering dog? Oh, there you are, you... Not a single step further, Adam. I want him, Dylan. He murdered Clay, shot him down without giving him a chance. How do you know? Because Clay wouldn't have let anyone catch him off guard except a friend. A friend. And that Dylan give me that Dutchman. Try to take him. It's like that? It's like that. And it's true what the fellas say. You made a deal with the Dutchman to give him the reward and protect him if he'd kill Clay for you. That was the deal, was it? Yeah. The fellas say why I'd make such a deal? Dylan, it ain't no longer a secret around town that you and Francie want each other. But Clay was in the way. You had him killed so you could get his wife. Do you deny it? No. No. It'll serve as well as any other crazy story to work you up. You think you're safe behind that star, don't you? Well, Clay had friends, lots of them. I'm coming back with them friends, and we'll get the Dutchman and you and anyone else who tries to stop us. All right, Adam. I'll be waiting. Yeah. You wait. I almost seen something pretty just then, didn't I, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, almost. About another... Pint of whiskey ought to do it. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment, but first, many radio shows win high popularity with the prizes and cash they give away, but there's one show that's tops because the head man gives away as little as possible. What other radio program could it be but... The Jack Benny Show, so be listening. Here's the second act of Gunsmoke. Son? You say something, Mr. Dillon? Uh, yeah, open my drawer in front of you there. You'll find a small bottle of oil in there. No, no, the one to the right. Yeah, that's it. Now, bring a little brush, too, huh? Here it is. Thanks, bud. 
It's a right nice gun you have. Yeah, it's not bad, but a little stiff. Just a little stiff. Don't it have a trigger? I never seen no gun without a trigger before. Oh, you remove a trigger or uh, tie it back against a guard. And all you have to do is uh, thumb a hammer. Hey, like that. It's faster. <laughs> yeah, that's better now. Remove the trigger. I remember that. What in the world for? Well, I remember everything you told me. About the Texas holster and the spring holster and the double roll and filing off the site. It's just me, Mr. Dillon. Oh, any luck, Chester? No, sir, not any. I went to the store first and asked Mr. Denton what kind of ammunition Clay Richard used to buy, and he told me Clay had a double-action forty-four. I scarred that riverbank a half mile each way from the ford and not a sign of it. I got that telegram off. You know who ought to be here pretty soon. It's only seven, eight miles from... Is that fire in town? Funeral services for Mr. Grinnell, the cashier. So soon? It's awful hot weather. Yeah. Um, any of your guns need oiling? Just I to... don't think so. You sure? When Adam left, he said he'd be coming back with some friends. I know. I stopped at the Olive Organza just now to rinse out my mouth. Adam was there talking mighty ugly and mighty big. He's got a size we'll fall on. Uh, when do you think? Any minute now, Mr. Dillon. It want me to take Bob out of here to one of the hotels, maybe? I want to see No, him. I think you'll be safer here, Chester, behind stone walls and dodging about the streets rubbernecking. You keep your head down, sonny. You hear? There's a... Matt! Matt, i got to talk to you. She ought to be in mourning. If she cared for Clay at all anymore, she ought to be in black. Matt! Oh, Lord, I find her more beautiful all the time. Matt! Have you heard what they're saying? What are they saying, Francie? That you and me... That... That you made Pete Ziegler kill him because of... I'm sorry that got back to you, Francie. It's all over Dodge. Adam almost strangled me before they dragged him off. Francie, I didn't shoot Clay. Francie, I beg you, believe me. Now was the... Shut up, Ziegler. Please, Shut up, or I'll put you to death. Francie is just one of those crazy stories. They needed one and they made one up. But, Matt, everyone believes it. On my way down here, people were pointing, whispering... Old women clucking their tongues at me. They believe it. They'll forget it as soon as this is over. They'll remember that even if we once did go with each other, it was finished and done with even before the war ended, before you even met Clay. No, they won't forget it. For the rest of my life, as long as I stay Clay, here, I'll... Hold it a minute, Francie. Yeah, Doc, what is it? Oh, uh, am I interrupting? What is it, Doc? Uh, our topsy's finished. I examined his liver and lights as... This story. is Mrs. Richards, Doc. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. I'm sure I make no disrespect for the departed. Well? Well, Clay was shot all right, but from the nature of the wound and the coagulation of the blood, I'd say it happened sometime yesterday. I'd say the cashier's bullet didn't go wild after all. How could a dead man gallop away? Well, the wound wasn't what killed Clay. The ball hit the rib case and it bounced off. Twenty-two caliber it was. And what did kill him was the stab in the back. Right through the spine. Inflicted sometime this morning. Now, near as I can judge by a small blade, oh, two or three inches long. It could have been a Barlow knife. Thanks, Doc. Yeah, please accept my condolences, Mr. Richard. You call the inquest any time you're ready, Marshal. Chester, close the door. You see? You see, I didn't do it. I didn't shoot him. All I right, then you stabbed I... him, maybe. You said you never carried a gun. Look, Francie, go home and... Give matters a chance to simmer Matt, down. Matt, I'm going to ask you for something. Yeah? Turn Pete Ziegler out into the street. What? Francie, they're itching to get their hands on him. Let him have him. It'll prove that story's a lie, that you didn't make a deal with him. Please, Matt, I have to live here. Tell me, I have to live here. Matt? Matt, don't look at me like that. Go home, Francie. Go home or leave town or hang yourself or anything you like. Just go away. Matt. Away, right now. I bought me a bottle at the Alifagans, Mr. Dillon. Would you care for a drink? No. Oh, I guess the funeral's over. There'll be others. Funny. Now I miss that bell. Awful quiet, ain't it? 
It's just what? Just about on schedule. Are you ready, Chester? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I'd use a shotgun if I were you. It's more effective when there's a mob to be dealt with. Oh, yes, sir, I aim to. Ziegler, and you too, son. If trouble starts, lie down flat on the floor and keep your head down all the time. Don't gawk to see what's happening. You understand me? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. All right. Dillon! Dillon! Come out, Dillon! Chester, I want you to stand here in the doorway after I go out, where you can cover the back door and me at the same time. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. Open the door. It's my duty to warn all of you that you're in the breach of the peace. Uh, I've sworn to uphold the law. I've killed men in order to do it, and I'm prepared to do so again. Give us a Dutchman, Dylan. I ask you to be sensible and to leave quietly. But if you refuse to listen to reason, if you insist upon being fools, if you've already decided to act like wolves instead of humans... And there's nothing I can say to make you change your minds. All right, you want Peter Ziegler? Well, he's not more than 20 feet behind me, so come on and get him, any of you. One at a time or all at once. Come on. Which one of you wants to die first? You? You? You, Adam? Well, what do you say, Adam? You let him here. Don't let this star on my coat stop you. Come on. There, I'm not wearing it now. Well, come on, draw, Adam, draw! You all right, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Get his gun. Man, alive, I couldn't even see your hand move. Uh, uh, Marshal, oh, don't tell me. Don't tell Doc, me. Doc, you make one single funny remark and I'll knock you down. You just take him to your office and get to work. Well, I, I never do mean to offend, Marshal. In my line of work, well, bodies, they're just so much lumber. Make all the jokes about him you please, but not to me and not in my hearing. In my line of work, there's nothing humorous about death. Give him a hand, Chester. No, 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 I can handle the marshal. Thank you. Thank you. Just the same. Can you direct me to the marshal's office? Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. I'm Marshal Dillon. Well, I left Cottonwood as soon as I got your telegram. I'm Miss Bonnie. Where's my boy? Oh, we have him, ma'am, safe and sound. Here, let me help you down. Thank you. It's that horse, Chester. Right this way, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry you put you to all that trouble, Marshal. The truth of the matter is he is a wild one and no mistake. Takes after his father, one scrape after another. Uh, he was no trouble at all. I enjoy children. I like to have them around. Bob? Bob, your ma's here. Son? Chester, where's the boy? Did you let him slip past you? No, sir, Mr. Dillon. He never got past me. Look, the back door's open. He seen me and he hightailed it, the devil. <laughs> we'll round him up for you, ma'am. Don't worry. Oh, I don't know why I bother hauling him back. If he's run away once, he's run away a thousand times. This time he ran because I wouldn't buy him a gun. He wanted a real one. That boy's just gun crazy, I swear. I got him a nice ball of knife instead. Barlow knife. I reckon it didn't signify and off he runs. Barlow knife? That kid. Just to find that kid. Marshal, has he done something bad with it? Told him to use it careful. He promised he'd use Boy, it careful. No, no, never mind, Chester. He's got Clay's strawberry ruin. We'd never catch up to him. Oh, I try to bring him up right. I tell him to be good, but he don't listen. He just don't listen. Now, calm yourself, ma'am. Just calm yourself. Here's your little bundle, Mr. Dillon. What? Yeah, give it to me. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> Here, you're better at knots than I am. Open it, will you? For the moment he was born, he'd been nothing but tribulation to me. Now, please, ma'am. <laughs> What's he got in it, Chester? A shirt, stockings, a piece of sausage, and this. Forty-four double action. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. That's Clay's gun. Sonny didn't manage to keep it long, did he? Well, if he wants a gun that bad, he's bound to get hold of another one somewhere, somehow. 
Chester, call Mr. Hightower over. Hey! Hey, Mr. Hightower! Oh. Come on over. Mr. Dillon wants you. Marshal, could I have please a drink of water? What? Oh, Ziegler, I forgot all about you. Uh, uh, Chester, where are the keys? Yeah, right there on the desk. Oh. Uh, there we are. It'll be safe for you to go home now. I, I can go back by the farm. Yeah, that's right. I'll send for you for the trial. Oh, Duncan should. Duncan should. Watch where you're going, you dumb. Wait, excuse me. Wait, uh, wait. Yes, Marshal. Mr. Hightower, it appears that we can do business after all. Get some paper and a pencil. I want some notices printed. Fire away. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Uh, what's the boy's name? Bonnie. William Bonney. William Bonney. William Bonney. Age 12. Height about five feet. Five feet. Hair light, eyes blue. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose he's known by any other name. I know. Everybody just called him Billy. Or the kid. Also known as Billy. The kid. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Walter Newman, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Don Diamond, Parley Bear, Harry Bartell, and Howard McNear, with Richard Beals, Paul Dubov, Georgia Ellis, and Mary Lansing. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West. In Gun Smoke. Those longtime favorites, Amos and Andy, are rising to new heights in their CBS radio series on Sunday nights. Heard on most of these same stations, Amos and Andy find trouble as constantly as ever and make it just as funny and as human as they have for more than 20 years. Be sure to hear Amos and Andy this Sunday, won't you? Right after the Jack Benny Show. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, there's fast, funny quizzing on the Bob Hawk Show every Monday evening. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>